Sergeant, will you begin your recordings? PC has started. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Polite, will you begin with your opening statement? Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the remote executive budget hearing jointly with the Committee on Education, Capital Budget, Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions, and Public Housing. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant Polite, and thank you to all of the Sergeant at Arms. Thank you to Carl Dalvo as well. I appreciate all the work that you've done to make these hearings so successful. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's sixth day of hearing from the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Education, chaired by my colleague, Mark Traeger. We are also joined by the following council members. Council Member Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Brooks Powers, Dharma Diaz, Dinowitz, Grodenchik, Kalos, Koslowitz, Lewis, Riley, and Minority Leader Matteo. Today, we will examine the Department of Education's fiscal 2022 executive budget, which totals $31.4 billion. The executive budget is $3.9 billion larger than its fiscal 2021 adopted budget and is $2.3 billion larger than its current fiscal 2021 budget. The DOE executive budget represents 31% of the city's total budget. Since the preliminary, preliminary budget, DOE has experienced a major shift in funding sources, largely due to the federal funding received by the administration, totaling approximately $7.39 billion across the executive financial plan. And unlike prior years, in this year's executive budget, DOE is adding only one new baseline need of $1.4 million for East Side Coastal Resiliency beginning in fiscal 2022, and $377.5 million for the 3K expansion in fiscal 2025. With additional funding received, DOE has been able to make key investments in several new initiatives and programs to address the learning loss experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. DOE plans to expand 3K for all, provide additional funding to support mental health services, fund community schools expansion, expand restorative justice practices, and the public schools athletic league. Additionally, the executive budget restored $336.4 million in cuts that were baselined in the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. The council applauds the significant investments made by the administration to support our students. Several of these proposals were called for in the council's budget response. However, more still needs to be done before we can reach adoption in addressing the existing budget concerns. First, there are concerns about being able to sustain new initiatives and programs in fiscal 2025 and onwards. No funding has been allocated to these programs in the out years, jeopardizing their sustainability. Second, the administration has yet to announce its plan on how to spend $720 million added to fiscal 22 executive budget for academic recovery and instructional support. This plan is key as it will ensure that our education dollars are being spent efficiently and effectively. And also, and lastly, several of the education priorities recommended in the council's budget response continue to go unfunded. Of particular importance to the council is the $250 million need specifically targeted to class size reduction. Thank you to Chelsea, Latimer, Masi Sarkissian, and Doheny Sampora from the Finance Division for the preparations for today's hearings. I'll now turn it over to Chair Traeger 
for his opening remarks. Chair Traeger. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum, and thank you for your leadership. Um, as this is our um, uh, final exec budget hearing, um, and I truly have appreciated you and your mentorship um, every step of the way. I just want to begin by saying that. Um, good morning. I'm Councilmember Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us remotely today to the fiscal 2022 executive budget hearing on the DOE, co-chaired by my colleague, uh, Councilmember uh, Daniel Drum, our Finance Committee Chair. Uh, DOE's uh, fiscal 22 budget totals $31.4 billion and recognizes a total of $6.9 billion in CRRSA and ARP revenue. The executive budget uses this funding to make significant investments to programs that, that combat learning uh, loss incurred by students as a result of the pandemic, including a $220 million investment for instructional supports and a $500 million investment for academic recovery. In addition, the executive budget allocates $236 million to provide compensatory services for students with special needs. It includes $242 million over four years to expand special education pre-K seats. The executive budget also uses this federal revenue to support the expansion of several programs, including $300 million over four years to expand social emotional supports for students, $49 million over four years to expand restorative justice in middle and high schools, $138 million over four years to support the creation of 100 new community schools, and $23 million over four years to expand PSAL. The executive budget also uses CRRSA and ARP funding to restore $336.4 million in cuts for essential school programs such as expanded arts instruction, community schools, college access for all, learning to work, affinity schools, health ed works, and single shepherd. Finally, in a historic win for New York City, the executive budget recognizes a $1.1 billion increase over three years in foundation aid that will ensure every school gets 100% of the fair student funding allocation they are entitled to by 2024. While the council commends the administration for using this funding to restore essential school programs for students and to support the expansion of new and existing initiatives, we are concerned that several key proposals that were called for in the council's budget response are not funded in the executive plan. This includes parity for state approved private and special education pre-K uh, pre, uh, teachers or known as 4410s, investments that support a citywide literacy and curriculum program, a nurse, social worker and guidance counselor, counselor in every school, not just building, a social worker, counselor, nurse in every school, investments for small group tutoring, and a plan to address targeted class size reduction as mentioned by my colleague, Chair Drum. Furthermore, the administration allocates $720 million to DOE's fiscal 2022 budget for academic and instructional supports without any indication or plan as to how these dollars will be spent. This funding held in holding codes does not provide transparency into how DOE plans on spending billions of dollars of funding. I'd like to remind council members that the chancellor and CFO are here to testify on the expense budget. Please save your capital questions for Deputy Chancellor Boldmark and President Kubota. Before I conclude, I want to thank the extraordinary staff, uh, Chelsea Betamore, Missy Sarkissian, uh, Dahini Sempura, uh, Malcolm Buterhorn, Jen Atwell, uh, uh, Leah Reynolds, uh, who, is our, who is our new great policy analyst. I uh, also want to just give a big shout out and thanks to Kalima Johnson, who has been a tremendous help to our committee. Uh, Frank Perez, uh, I want to thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, Maria Henderson, and Janine Caracchetti. And now I'll turn it back over to Chair Trump. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. Next, we will hear testimony from the DOE. We are joined today by Chancellor Misha Porter. Congratulations, Chancellor, and I wish you good luck in your tenure as our new chancellor here in the, in the New York City Department of Education. It's the first hearing that I've chaired that you've been at and um, I just wanna be sure that I welcome you. Before the DOE uh, begins testimony, 
I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Thank you, Jordan. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I'm counsel to the New York City's Council's Committee on Files. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you'll need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be called on to speak. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witness, witness and including those individuals that are available for Q&A. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Chancellor Porter. I do. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Robinson. I do. Thank you. Deputy Chancellor Wallach. I do. Thank you. Deputy Chancellor Austin. I do. Thank you. Miss Linda Chen. I do. Thank you. Miss Lawrence Asaliano. I do. I do. Thank you. Kevin Moran. I do. Sorry about that. Uh, this Stephanie got bounced off the Zoom. Uh, chairs, this is Malcolm, counsel for the Education Committee, backup host for, uh, for Stephanie. So bear with us just one moment and we will finish the swearing in. My apologies, I lost connection over Zoom. Oh. Okay. I can continue with the... Um... Um, going down the list with Ms. Mraz Sanchez Medina. I do. Thank you. And Ms. Sarah Jonas. I do. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor Porter, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Drum, Chair Traeger, and all of the members of the Finance and Education Committees here today. I'm Misha Porter, and I have the privilege of serving as New York City Schools <laughs> Chancellor. Joining me today is Chief Financial Officer Lindsay Oates, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin, Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach, Chief Academic Officer Linda Chen, Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano, Chief School Operations Officer Kevin Moran, and other members of my leadership team. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Mayor de Blasio's fiscal year 2022 executive budget as it relates to the Department of Education. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge Chairs Drum and Traeger, as well as the entire city council. During my brief time in this role, not only have the leaders on this council welcomed me in a spirit of true collaboration, but I continue to be struck by your thoughtful advocacy on behalf of our students and families. I'm truly thankful for your partnership and leadership, especially during these challenging times. 
Just over a year ago, a global pandemic began that completely transformed our city and our schools. Despite the countless challenges this crisis has presented, our commitment to our students, families, and staff across the city has remained steadfast. We have worked tirelessly to understand and address the needs of our students and families from the most basic to the most complex. Since the city first shut down, it was our school system that stood up meal hubs to bring food to New Yorkers throughout the city. To this date, we have served more than 100 million meals since the start of the pandemic. To address the digital divide, we have distributed almost 500,000 LTE enabled iPads so that even our most vulnerable students could learn remotely. Responding to the loss and trauma across our city, our schools have continued to expand social emotional supports and trauma informed practices. That has included professional development of staff and teachers, as well as increased direct mental health supports in the communities hit hardest by the pandemic. We also work tirelessly to provide in-person learning for more students than any other city in the nation by far. And we made changes to our admissions process to double down on our commitment to equity and ensure our classrooms reflected the diversity of our city. These are just a few examples of the tremendous work accomplished across the city. And we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude to our families, teachers, and staff. The resolve and resilience everyone has demonstrated have been nothing short of remarkable. Now, with unprecedented investments from local, state, and federal government, we can deepen our commitments and effectively tackle the lasting impacts of the pandemic, especially the academic and social emotional needs of all of our students who have gone through so much this past year. As we look ahead, we know we cannot simply return to what our system looked like prior to the pandemic. It is imperative that we apply the lessons we learned during the crisis in the next school year. Our students need a school experience that is rooted in both healing and learning. More than ever, we need to connect to students in ways that recognize their own specific needs, experiences, and desires so that they can thrive. To make that a reality, we are focused on providing vital resources to our schools, educators, and staff members to enable them to deliver the highest quality instruction possible in a supportive, enriching learning environment. As we emerge from this crisis, we have the opportunity to give birth to a school system in this city that accomplishes far more for our children and families than we ever imagined possible in the past. Every element of the mayor's executive budget is aimed at advancing that goal. So is our unprecedented summarizing effort, which will provide far more ambitious and expansive summer programming than in the past. This will be the first time we will serve any students in grades K-12 in July and August who wanna participate. In collaboration with the Department of Youth and Community Development, we have reimagined what summer school can be along with partner community-based organizations that best know their neighborhoods. After all the trauma and disruptions caused by the pandemic over the past 15 months, our children need a chance to reboot their education in fun and supportive ways as they approach the full reopening of our schools in September. Summer Rising is an opportunity for them to learn, grow, play, and explore the city around them, from field trips to Central Park and museums to dance and art classes. The program sites are up and the applications are now open through DYCD's website. After enduring months when so many of our students were isolated from each other and their teachers, the opportunity to rebuild those face-to-face -face relationships will do so much to begin their healing process and preparing them for returning to school full-time in the fall. So let me turn now to the details of the mayor's executive budget. As a result of the historic influx of funding to the city, the budget provides crucial investments for our school system when we return next year and beyond. Many of these investments have been made with your invaluable input and advocacy. Our school system is fairer and more inclusive because of the efforts of this council in collaboration with this administration. The fiscal year 2022 executive budget totals approximately 37.7 billion, including 31.4 billion in operating resources and another 6.3 billion of educated related pension and debt services funds. 
Our funding is a combination of city, state, and federal resources with city tax levy money making up the largest share at 51%, state funds 34%, and federal dollars 14%. In the fall, as I've been saying since I started in March, we wanna give every student the option to go back into buildings five days a week. I want New Yorkers to know that our buildings are safe and that our schools will be ready. As a parent, I know how challenging this decision can be. And we are working hard to meaningfully engage with parents about, school, about next school year. This includes our five borough engagement tour that we started on Monday in Staten Island to hear directly from school communities about their experiences over the school year, help answer questions and gather feedback on the executive budget and force a discussion on school reopening for the fall. These family forums are critical to inform our plans for September and ensure our school communities are supported as we prepare for a strong reopening this fall. Again, we know we are opening schools to a different reality than we closed, and that is important. We are coming back from what has been the hardest year of so many of our lives. And I wanna make sure that what we teach reflects students' lived experiences and needs given the difficulties of this past year. This budget aims to provide schools with the resources they need to address our new normal. Simply put, this starts with more money going directly to our schools. As you know, thanks to stimulus funding and a long awaited commitment from the state to fully fund foundation aid, I am so pleased to share with you some of the highlights of how we are investing in our students and our schools. As a result of the foundation aid, we are able to provide 100% fair student funding to all schools over 1,000 schools and 700,000 students across every community school district will benefit from this investment, which will help ensure that every single school has what it needs to support students and staff during these challenging times. FSF is driven by equity and specifically provides more resources to schools that serve larger shares of students with disabilities, multilingual learners, and other needs. This is an incredible commitment an investment in our students and it would not, it absolutely would not be a reality without the advocacy of so many, especially members of this city council. Along with fully funding FSF, the influx of essential stimulus resources will allow us to expand successful programs that have been proven effective to boost much needed services and restore programs we know are valuable to our students. We want all of our students to see themselves in their curriculum their classrooms and their schools. This means we will have a dual prong approach addressing both social emotional learning and academics. To this end, the mayor's executive budget includes historic investments in the mental health and well being of our students that will build on our strong foundation of social emotional learning and mental health supports that enabled us to respond to this crisis and the trauma it has caused. We will now add over 600 new social workers, school psychologists, and family support workers into our schools. As teachers and students come back together in September, many for the first time in 18 months, every single school will have access to mental health supports. We will also be providing trauma-informed care training to every early childhood staff member who works with students and parents. Equally important, we are investing significantly in academic support. Given the system-wide academic recovery from the impacts of COVID-19 that will be front and center next year, our plan for supporting student learning is absolutely essential. This $500 million investment starts with evaluating every student's needs through assessments. It includes accelerating learning for our students with additional learning time focusing on math and ELA with a heightened focus on literacy. This, the investment will also be directed toward tutoring and more targeted support to our highest needs students, including our students with disabilities and multilingual learners. High quality professional learning for educators will also be a critical important component. We know that providing a high quality education to every New York City student depends on starting young. As part of this executive budget, we are strengthening our investment in early childhood education by adding 377 million for universal 3K for all so that every single family in New York City can access a 3K seat by September, 2023. 
This builds upon our commitment to bring 3K to every district by fall 2021 and means we will have 61,000 3K seats across New York City. In addition, another 22 million will expand the availability of preschool special education classes and support state approved providers to ensure our early learners with special needs have access to the strong start and services they need and deserve. This investment will add 800 new seats across the city and ensure that our promise of pre-K and 3K for all reaches every student. We know that while this pandemic has been trying for every student. It has, been the most, it has had the most severe impact on our students with the greatest needs. To ensure our ability to provide critical programs and services to our students with disabilities, we are investing 236 million next year to increase special education services. This funding will build on the progress we have made in strengthening delivery of related services and special education programs to keep students and families. We are also growing our community school strategy, which the RAND Corporation found to be effective in improving attendance and student outcomes in order to bring community schools to every district by 2022-2023. On top of the 27 previously announced new community schools, this funding will create 100 additional sites, bringing the total to 406. Restorative justice has been a priority of this administration and of this council and has contributed to a 66% decrease in school suspensions. So the budget will expand the availability of restorative justice programs in our middle and high schools. We are also thrilled to be expanding our public schools athletic league, increasing access to sports programming across the city for high school students, focusing on schools with the greatest need. We are also restoring investments we have made in arts education and the learning to work program, which offers paid internships, student support services, in-depth job readiness, and college and career exploration activities for targeted high schools. All of these programs provide essential outlets and learning opportunities for our students. Finally, this year has laid bare a lot of inequities we have known existed across our city and schools, perhaps none more stark than access to technology. The pandemic forced us to harness technology to create a 21st century learning experience for our students. While we are focused on returning all students back in classrooms next year, we also know that we need to build on the technological capacities we developed during the pandemic. So the budget increases help desk support, continues LTE service for the next school year on the devices that we have already purchased, and build out our digital learning hub. All of this will enable us to continue to integrate technology into the learning process for all of our students and more effectively prepare them for their future. These initiatives all interconnect to our broad vision for remaking our schools as we emerge from the pandemic and into a critical recovery period. The investments in the mayor's executive budget reflect not only the needs of our students, but also our vision and aspirations of where our school system needs to go as our city returns from this pandemic. After navigating through the countless challenges posed by the pandemic, we now have the opportunity and responsibility to elevate how we serve all of our students and families in ways far beyond what we imagined to be possible in the past. As we march toward fully reopening our schools in the fall, we look forward to celebrating not only the return of our students, but also giving birth to an ambitious new era for education in our city. I look forward to the continued thoughtful feedback and advocacy of this city council so that together we can provide all our students with the education they deserve. Thank you for your time and we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Chancellor, for the testimony. Let me start by thanking everyone, yourself included, Chancellor uh, Carranza as well, all of the deputy chancellors, the uh, support staff that you have there at Central, the principals, the teachers, uh, the nurses, our uh, paraprofessionals, the aides, everyone who has uh, really pulled through in this pandemic and uh, been on the front line every single day of the last year and two months, 14 months or so, uh, you know, working with our students and um, with all the sacrifices they've made, I just wanna say thank you to all of you for what you've done for our city. So thank you very much, Chancellor. 
Let me start by saying we're also joined by a couple of other council members, a few other council members, uh, and they are uh, council member uh, Borelli, Brannon, Felice, Rose, Kalos, Powers, Rosenthal, Rodriguez, and Barron. Council member Barron, a, for a former principal, as a matter of fact. Um, so let me talk a little bit about one thing that you did not mention, which was class size reduction. By law, the DOE is supposed to uh, report on class sizes um, twice a year. And the first time on November 15th, and then again on February 15th, many parents, teachers, and students reported extremely large remote class sizes this year, sometimes as large as 35, 40, or even 60 students online at once, making it even much harder to keep them engaged and interested in learning. Uh, now, um, after being asked by the council to report on disaggregated class size data on November 16th, uh, Deputy Chancellor Karen Goldmark wrote that they would delay the release of any class size data until December 31st, and any disaggregated data would not be released until February, February 15th. In late February, the DOE finally posted class size data reporting class sizes of 10 or less in many cases which likely reflected only in-person class sizes, but no disaggregated class size data reflecting remote class sizes. So um, to this day, no disaggregated class size data has been reported. When will you do that? And what is the uh, holdup uh, since you've had this data since at least last October? So you know, we remain committed to you know, reducing class sizes and definitely see that this budget is going to position us to be able to do that in, in a way in which we haven't been able to in the past. And so again, thank you so much for your hard work and effort to bring resources to our schools. Um, as far as the data related to our remote classes is, is what you're specifically asking for. Um, I'm gonna pass to, is Deputy Chancellor Goldmark on? No, she's not, okay. All right, so we will, we will, I will double back with Deputy Chancellor Goldmark to get that data present. We've been working on making sure that we, we wanna be transparent and make available all data, um, you know, clear and, and possible. And as you know, that that data that you are asking about that we did post reflects out in-person classes. Um, we also had to make adjustments to class side, obviously as a result of COVID and look forward to providing that data as soon as possible. So Chancellor, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. We look forward to getting that data. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the former Chancellor Carranza did say that that data was being collected. So it should be easily available for us to see. Are you, are you, would you agree with that, that that data was collected? That data is being collected um, and we will work to make sure that we make it available to you. Okay, thank you. So as you know, the council has put uh, or asked for $250 million in class size reduction for next year to be able to provide social distancing as well as additional academic and social support uh, students who will need uh, to help to recover from the pandemic. At a previous hearing, the chancellor said that the class size is a contractual issue implying something to be settled with the union but not as a, pre a prerequisite to quality education. But in the CFE case, the state's highest court said that class sizes were too large to provide students with their constitutional right to a quality education. So class sizes have gone up since the court delivered that decision mm -hmm. in 2003. And we are finally getting the full foundation funding as a result of the CFE funding lawsuit. So don't you think it's right that some of those funds should be spent on lowering class size? Yes. Absolutely. You know, as a principal. We lost your chance. Or too you well, the difference the size of our classes can make. Can you hear me? Yeah, and, uh, can you just repeat it? You froze for a moment. Oh, okay, sorry. So I said, start again. Um, as a former principal and classroom teacher, I know all too well uh, the difference that class size can make. And thanks to, again, the efforts of this council, getting us to 100% fair student funding, we're going to be able to bring more teachers into our school buildings that will help us to do that work around reducing class size. We also are gonna be bringing more mental health supports into place, social workers, 
arts classes. And so all of those factors are going to support the reduction of class sizes. And we look forward to being really intentional about moving that work forward. Okay, so as a former teacher myself for 25 yes. years in the Department mm -hmm. of Education, I agree with you, class size is really uh, very, very important. It would give me the opportunity to individual my, individualize right. my instruction much better if I had a lower class size. And that's what we're talking about is being able to work more closely with students for their individual needs. Yep. Let me just talk a little bit about uh, parent, uh, parent empowerment. Um, this, uh, the DOE is supposed to elicit parent input on how new funds should be spent. So are you aware that the CPAC and the Chancellor's Parent Advisory Council, which represents all the PTAs in the city, as well as the ECC, which represents the uh, parent-led citywide and district education councils, have passed resolutions in favor of the city using that $250 million um, toward lowering class size next year? Yes, we, we are aware of their uh, position. Okay, we're gonna make them happy? We are going to do our damnedest to make them happy, Chair Drum, <laughs> and okay. all the teachers across New York City. Listen, you know, n n no one knows better than all of us, all of us, right? Not only those of us who have been educators, but all of us who are parents and have students in our public school system, um, what a difference, in, particularly in this moment, the reduction of class size is going to make. And so we are, again, we have the resources to do things that we have not been able to do in the past, and we will be definitely working to ensure that we are specific and intentional about leveraging resources to reduce class size. And Chancellor, um, when I spoke with the mayor, he did uh, say that um, he would work with me on that class size reduction. And he uh, said that he wanted to see first what the impact of the fair student funding would be on class size reduction. Mm -hmm. Do you have a plan to use um, that fair student funding to you to lower class size? Yeah, that we absolutely do. And I'm going to bring in uh, Lindsay Oates to talk more specifically about what that would look like for us. And I'm going to remind the mayor of his commitments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair Jum. And uh, I just want to say in transparency, I was not sworn in at the beginning. So okay. if you'd like, I mean, if you'd like, if you'd like to do that now um, uh, for the record. Honest, thank you. We're gonna have the uh, the committee council do that. Yes. Ms. Oates, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful? Be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, thank you. So Chair Drum, so we are thrilled with the fair student funding investment. I know that you and Chair Traeger and many of your colleagues across city council have fought for years to reach this historic point where we are for the first time ever able to meet the entitlement for all schools under the fair student funding formula, meaning all schools will be funded at 100%. Um, and this is wonderful, exciting news, $600 million investment. What we know from past investments that have raised the floor is that schools spend this funding on staff. About 90% of past investments and in floor raises have been spent directly on hiring new staff. This includes classroom teachers, but also includes positions like guidance counselors, social workers, art teachers, phys ed teachers, dance teachers, and so on. Um, and we wanna support the principal's choice in making those decisions, particularly at this time, given that the needs vary from school to school. But we do expect that um, there will be hiring at schools as a result of this investment. Do you have any idea at this time what that number might be? I think it's hard for us to know at this point because these are local decisions that are made on behalf of the school community. Um, and I think we will be monitoring this closely as we usually do throughout the summer and into, the, um, into September with school. So obviously then one of the concerns for me is before we do adoption, if we're talking about the 250 million in class size reduction, we'd need to get some type of idea uh, what those numbers would look like in order to be able to fairly talk about the $250 million. So uh, I know you don't have an answer for me right now, but moving forward, I think that's where we have to look and we need, probably need to know before we can adopt. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I just have a few more questions and then I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Traeger. The executive budget uses CRSSA revenue 
<clears throat> to restore 214.8 million in one year cuts that were identified in the fiscal 22 preliminary budget and 121.6 million in cuts that were baselined in the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. However, given the nature of this one-time relief revenue, the funding for these restorations decreased or is completely eliminated in fiscal, in fiscal 25 and in the out years. So uh, which of these programs do you believe need a baseline budget? So I'm gonna pull Lindsay in to talk more specifically about that as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, as you point out, the funding is, the stimulus funding is temporary, but we are incredibly grateful to even have the stimulus funding. We had a very different hearing last year at this time, and we are incredibly grateful to have the $7 billion in federal funding added to our budget this year. And we are grateful that it has been added for the next three years um, and into half of fiscal year 25. We are able to do things that we had only dreamed about in years past. And so we are thrilled to have that investment. Um, and I think that as we look towards the out years, um, we are hoping that we can prove that these investments are you know, working and that they'll be um, baselined in the out years. So one of the things I certainly would like to see uh, baseline is the implicit bias training and the LGBTQ curriculum. So how does the executive budget address implicit bias? Are there any specific programs that are being funded to address implicit bias? And will these programs receive enhanced funding through the federal stimulus funds? The ex existing, so thank you for the question, sir. The existing implicit bias program was largely protected through the fiscal crisis of the last couple of years. And major shout outs to Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson's team for their tireless uh, work, making sure that these really critical trainings um, continued throughout the shutdown period and through this last school year. So major, major snaps, as the chancellor would say, to, um, to Deputy Chancellor Robinson and her entire team for continuing continuing to ensure that those services will rolled out this year. And we expect that they will continue going forward. Um, I hear you on the LGBT curriculum and we're aware of your request and we'll be working with OMB on that. Okay, good. So we're working on, um, or, or would like to secure the $1 million that we have there. Actually, we called for 2 million within the, uh, the council's budget response. Um, but as you know, this um, funding supported the creation of vital curriculum, professional development, and access to LGBTQ literature. So um, I know that you know it was not included in the budget. Can you just tell us why? And um, can we make sure that this happens as we move forward? So uh, as I previously said, I can't speak to why it wasn't included in this particular budget, but we are aware of your request and we are working with OMB and we'll have hopefully more to say soon. Okay, and I just want to, I'm sorry, Chair Drum, I just want to add, you know, th that is part of our commitment to ensure that all of our students see themselves reflected in the curriculum. And so while it may not be clearly identified, it is definitely a deep part of our commitment um, for our school, For you know, and I've said it to you and all of the council mm -hmm. members I've spoken to, key to our comeback key to bringing our schools back is that our students really experience and see themselves in the curriculum they experience every day. So more to come, um, but the commitment is definitely present. Thank you, Chancellor. And yes, in our conversations, I've really appreciated your support for that. I also just wanna compliment Eric Vaughn, who is uh, the, the, the leader there with the LGBTQ stuff. He has done a lot of work and I would love to see him get an assistant so that he can do even more work I'd like to uh, continue to talk with you about that as we move through the budget process, um, because I think that we could do even more for our students if that were to happen. I so agree. Thank, thank you, Chancellor. I'm gonna turn it over to my, um, my co-chair, Mark Trager, uh, a friend and educator. It's, I think it's great when we have two educators talking education, um, and I guess, yes. <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> Chair Trager. Thank you, Chair Drum. This sounds like, like a faculty conference. Uh, <laughs> at, at, at uh, uh, it's it's great, to, great, to, great to have you, Chancellor, uh, and, and, and the entire team. Um, just a couple of quick questions before I go into some of the more complex questions. Um, we, we, we're, we were aware, and, and thanks to everyone's collective advocacy, 
about the influx of resources into our schools that are coming and that are here now. Um, but Chancellor, I, I asked first, uh, why am I getting emails from folks about a, a hiring freeze on counselors and, and other positions? Can anyone speak to, is there a freeze on hiring these critical positions? And what are we doing to make sure that schools have the flexibility to hire the staff that they need to meet the needs of their kids? We're gonna, we're gonna, we have more information coming on hiring, but I'm gonna pull in Lauren Siciliano to talk more specifically about where their freezes and, and where we are as a system. Thank you, Chancellor, and good morning, Chair Traeger. Thank you for the question. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the Chancellor is absolutely right. Um, we are preparing right now for next school year, um, and we'll have more to share very soon about hiring policies for next school year. Um, uh, this school year, as you know, we were for most of the year in a very different financial situation. Um, and so we did have restrictions for the majority of the year on certain titles, including counselors, um, which didn't mean that you couldn't hire. It just meant that you needed to hire from the ATR pool first. Um, but we, of course, recognize how essential these staff are and will be, of course, moving into next year. So we expect to have some updates soon for school year 21-22. Um, I would also say just in general at this point in the year, um, there is not a, generally a lot of hiring in schools. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, but before we even get to fall, we, we have summer um, mm -hmm. and we, we have a promise of a very bold uh, summer rising program, which I think sounds wonderful. Um, there are questions that have come up with regards to staffing uh, for DOE personnel. Um, I've heard from a number of principals that there are staffing issues, staffing concerns. And so wouldn't it make sense to provide clarity to, to principals as soon as possible and lift any of these freezes as soon as possible so we, we could begin uh, the process now for summer? And, and, are, and are you aware of those staffing concerns for summer at Rising as well? So that's a great question on summer rising. So um, for our summer programs, um, the way staffing works, um, at, I'll just take social workers as an example, uh, existing staff are hired on a per session basis over the summer. Um, there wouldn't be a net new headcount or staff coming in to support that. So we uh, are very committed to making sure that our summer rising sites have the um, social emotional support that our students will need. Um, and we'll be working with schools to make sure that they're able to access those supports. So is there an estimate time date that we can give principals when they'll get that information? Yes, so actually uh, this uh, Monday of this week, um, we released uh, initial summarizing budgets to principals um, so that they can uh, start to see the dollars that they have for the summer. And, and Warren, about, what about uh, the hiring freezes being, being lifted? Uh, any any uh, estimate on that? Um, we expect to have more information in the next few weeks as we prepare for uh, initial budget rollouts. Um, another item that just, can anyone just shed any light on that I get a lot of emails about and calls about with regards to early retirements and what that will do in terms of the impact on, on staffing? Can anyone speak to that? Sure. Lauren, you want to continue with the early retirement conversation? Sure, absolutely. Um, we are aware, of course, of um, what was included in the, um, in the state budget, uh, and we are working with the city uh, to understand the plans for early retirement. So, which means there's no plan right now, or are there discussions underway because we there's not, there's not much coming out for us in terms of information at this time. There, there's not a decision as of yet. There are discussions happening with our union partners right now. Um, earlier this year, I authored an op-ed in the Daily News calling for the DOE to begin on the path to making every single school a community school. There is no doubt that community schools are truly the model for academic and developmental success among students, while at the same time supporting the surrounding community. Uh, the fiscal 2022 executive budget adds 9.5 million, um, growing to 51.2 million in the out years for the creation of 100 new community schools. This is in addition to the prelim budget funding 27 additional schools in the hardest hit communities. How was the budget determined for the addition of 100 
community schools? Um, what is the average cost of a community school and what types of services are included uh, in this estimate? So you and I agree, Chair Traeger, that community schools are uh, amazing resources for our communities, and which is why we have expanded um, and are looking to add over 100 this coming school year. I'm gonna ask Deputy Chancellor Robinson to talk about how we selected schools, how we're funding schools. Um, but I just wanna also add, you know, our partnership this summer with DYCD um, and partnering directly with community-based organizations, I also see as an opportunity to build on that community schools model to introduce schools who haven't prior been in partnership with CDOs in this way to really think about expansion. And with that, I'll pass it on to Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Thank you so much, Chancellor, and uh, thank you so much, Chair Traeger, and everyone for your ongoing support for our highly successful community school model right here in New York City, which is serving as a model for the nation. So thank you. Thank you so much. As we all know, community schools have proven to be successful and we are continuing to invest in what we know works. Uh, we started off by targeting um, the highest need communities and we'll be launching uh, the 27 community schools. They'll be open this September. So we're pretty excited about that. And the process for the 100 community schools will start shortly. I'm joined by our new senior executive director, uh, Sarah Jonas, who is on now and can talk a little bit more about the process for onboarding the 100 community schools that will be starting with us in uh, September of the 22-23 uh, school year. Sarah? Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Um, so yes, again, I just wanna echo um, our excitement about the city's commitment to expanding community schools, a strategy that we know works um, and has been proven to work. So just really excited about, uh, about those plans. Um, and as far as the uh, sort of determination of um, which community schools, uh, the selection for um, expansion of the 100 community schools, we will be planning to engage uh, district and school leaders as well as community parents and stakeholders to help determine which schools should be prioritized um, for that additional expansion. Um, and as, as we've done um, in, uh, in the past, um, some of the factors that we'll consider would include, you know, which schools would most benefit um, from becoming a community school and from the strategy and from the, the services and supports that are part uh, and central to the strategy. And those would include as well, uh, looking at econo uh, economic needs index, excuse me, as well as the percentage of students uh, experiencing homelessness. So, th so those are some of the factors uh, that we would consider in selecting uh, schools for this opportunity and for the expansion opportunity. So, uh, so Director Jonas, first of all, welcome and congratulations now in, in this uh, permanent, permanent role. Um, uh, what I would add is that, um, and this is something that I, I agree with the DOE when the initial 27, uh, there was a focus of the hardest hit communities. Um, we need to double down on that. Um, the hardest hit neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods that have been under-resourced and marginalized before the pandemic certainly have taken the brunt of this pandemic, particularly our communities of color. Um, and I would strongly urge that we double down on that investment, expand those services because they, they do make a difference. Um, and I'd also appreciate more engagement with the local officials. Um, um, mentioned CECs, the local council members, local officials who really know their communities uh, the best um, and uh, in terms of, of the selection and, and the expansion. Uh, is there a commitment on, on that end? Absolutely. Again, I think that's you know core to the community school strategy is engaging community stakeholders in driving community schools. Um, so absolutely uh, would be engaging with communities and community stakeholders uh, to help inform the selection of, of schools for uh, expansion efforts of community schools, yes. I, mean, I just had a great conversation with, with a wonderful colleague of mine, Councilmember Adams from Queens, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal advocate for community and champion for education, represents a wonderful district, but a very hard hit district by the pandemic, uh, and certainly has ideas and suggestions on schools in her district. So I, I encourage the DOE to connect Councilmember Adams and, and members uh, that really know their communities uh, the, the, the best. Um, I want to move to uh, social workers, counselors, nurses. Um, how many social workers are currently funded in DOE's budget? And how many social workers will be funded in the fiscal 2022 budget? 
Linda let Deputy Chancellor Robinson, who's done a phenomenal job of creating a pool of social workers, creating a space for them in our schools and really being thoughtful about centering that need, particularly in this moment as we go forward. Thank you so much, Chancellor. And thank you to this council and Chair Traeger for your commitment um, to this important work. Currently within um, our school system, we have approximately 4,500 school counselors and social workers. Uh, we also have approximately 1,000 uh, school psychologists. Um, and the new commitments that we have that are forthcoming include um, new school-based 500 social workers, we also have new psychologists coming on board for about 90 psychologists and new family support workers, which would give us a total, as the chancellor shared earlier, of approximately 6,000 mental health workers. Um, our commitment moving into the uh, upcoming school year is to ensure that each school has a school-based social worker or a mental health clinic on site to support our uh, students and their well-being. We've made historic investments in mental health and in the well-being of our students. So we're building upon a foundation of social emotional learning and mental health supports that have allowed us to respond to this crisis. And we also remain committed to taking the work to the next level and ensuring that we have school-based supports in place. So, and, and again, I wanna actually echo the kudos to deputy transfer Robinson or as chance reporter does, uh, I guess the, the snaps, uh, because she she is, we are really lucky and fortunate to have Deputy Chancellor Robinson uh, in, in her role and we really appreciate her. Um, I guess the question for, for us is that with the, even with the new investments, which we are applauding uh, for, because you know, you know me, I'm, I'm all for as much social emotional support for our schools, even with the investment, um, how many schools will be uh, without a full-time social worker in, in the school? We are, we will have 100% of our schools covered with either a full-time social worker or a mental health clinic, which as you know, many of our mental health clinics staff, social workers and psychologists and other mental health support staff members. So that is our commitment. Um, our chancellor has also um, focused on cell academic integration, ensuring that young people are receiving social emotional supports every day um, within the classroom setting as well. So we are, we have a comprehensive approach in place as we're moving into the next school year to include tier one supports that will live in classrooms and all the way up through tier three supports, which will um, be our social workers that will be on staff and our mental health clinic. Uh, so, so just to be clear, um, and, and, I, and I certainly I appreciate that answer. Um, for us in the council, a, uh, and I'm sure many of you in the DOE, but for us in the council, a major priority particularly in, 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 this, in this year, um, is to make sure that every single school in New York City, every public school in New York City has a full-time social worker, has a full-time counselor, has a nurse. Um, and also just to, be, just to be clear, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, these new social worker investments, they're coming out of Central's budget. They're not coming at the expense of the FSF from the school, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so is there a number that we can get uh, because we are not done getting more money for the DOE. We, we, I've made that clear uh, to, to the mayor's team who I'm sure are watching as well. Uh, we are nowhere, we are nowhere done um, and we have more work to do. Uh, so, how, you know, we, what, what we need is how many schools are still without a, 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 a counselor? How many schools are without a social worker? How many schools without a nurse? Can someone help us get, get that number and the cost estimate? Yes, I think um, we would like to follow up to talk more specifically about you know, how we can go about building upon um, the investments that we've made. Um, but I just would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your leadership in this area, for always emphasizing the importance of uh, mental health and wellness pre-pandemic. And we will continue to build upon those investments. No one has done more to increase mental health supports 
within New York City Public Schools in this council and this administration. Um, so thank you all so much for um, caring for and supporting the well-being of our students. And we can certainly follow up and continue um, the discussion. Yes, uh, thank you. And we, we definitely, as soon as we can get that information, because we, 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 have, we have to negotiate this and we have to get this done. I, I, I think it's important for us to say that every school will have full-time supports in them. I think that, that's, that's a, it's a statement budget. Um, the executive budget adds $720 million to fiscal 22 for academic and instructional supports, yet there is no level of specificity um, as to how these dollars will be spent. In our prelim budget response, the council called for investments in small group high dose tutoring and in purchasing of evidence-based literacy curricula and literacy intervention trainings. To date, we have not been engaged by, by the administration. Uh, can I just make sure folks, folks can hear me. To date, uh, we have not been engaged by the administration on, on how you plan to spend this funding to address all the, the impacts on learning uh, that students have experienced over the past year. Do you have a specific plan on how to spend these dollars? Will you commit to invest in these council priorities to work with the council on how this funding will be spent and to ensure that there will be full transparency on how nearly a billion dollars will be spent? So we agree with you, Chair Traeger. Um, academic recovery is a critical part of our investment um, and accelerating learning for every student and every family and every community is critically important. Um, and that has to happen at the school level. And it, it means that we will definitely be providing student support with interventions that they need to be successful in the future, um, create enriching learning experiences for all students, leverage assessments to tell us where our students are so we can make instructional decisions. And so those are all a part of the decision-making process um, as we move forward, centering our highest need learners. I'm definitely interested in engaging partnering with this council who is so committed to education, but I'd also like to bring in our chief academic officer, Linda Chen, to talk more specifically about what those investments will look like in our budget. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Chair Traeger and the council for your consistent support and advocacy for academics, and also particularly as you've outlined literacy um, so I'll start first with um, connecting to what the chancellor just said. We know that the very specific supports of our students are best known at the school level. So what you'll see with much of those investments will be uh, funding that will be directly um, um, going towards schools and will reflect in a couple of areas, some of which you've identified. One is, as the chancellor said, we will make sure that there are baseline screeners and diagnostic assessments and tools made available to schools. This is something that we have been working on and making sure that these are well vetted resources that will be used for accelerating learning for our students. We're also making investments in curriculum, specifically in ELA and math and really zoning in on the interventions that are needed including high dosage tutoring. We also believe that in order to accelerate learning, we have to really make sure that teachers have the resources in their hands to be able to know how their students are doing, have the resources and training that's needed to provide those very personalized interventions and supports, and also have as part of a whole comprehensive look into high dosage tutoring that complements and supplements the work that teachers are doing in tier one or core instruction for all students. The chancellor also mentioned earlier in her comments, the importance of our students seeing themselves in their curriculum. Their ability to be affirmed for who they are helps them learn and accelerate those skills in ELA and math specifically. I would also say the full picture includes not only those course, sometimes what we'd like to call core subjects, but I know I'm in good company here with educators where really the arts are core subjects as well. So we know that a student needs a full, well-rounded and enriching and rich experiences in their education in order to excel 
in everything from core subjects to enrichment and beyond. I do want to also uh, respond to your question about literacy specifically. We know even before, and again, I want to thank the council for their efforts and advocacy, that foundational literacy is key. It is key to being able to unlock knowledge in all content areas. So as we said, we will have direct investments to schools, but at the same time, we're delineating very clear resources for foundational literacy in our earliest grades. And I wanna thank Deputy Chancellor uh, Josh Wallach and his partnership with the Universal Literacy Coaching Program and early literacy efforts. That also includes research-based high dosage tutoring some of that has already started this past year. We are continuing to do that in the summer and leveraging summer months to do that work. I would also say another part of this investment is that we know the school day is only so long and we wanna make sure that there are opportunities beyond the school day as well to deeply provide those services for students. And we know those decisions are being made very specifically at the school level to support our earliest learners to our high school students being prepared for college and career. Thank you. So, and Dr. Chen, I, and I appreciate that, that answer. But what I would add is that, um, that, that there is a doubling down of the lens of equity in terms of, of these recovery resources. Um, we have the data about the schools with the attendance challenges. We have the data about the schools with the high number of NX rates. Um, we, we know the hardest hit neighborhoods. Um, and, I, and, I, and I agree with you about that we need to meet the holistic needs of our children and give them a full rich curriculum during the day of art and music and all those wonderful connections and physical education and, and so forth. But my issue is making sure that it, it reaches those neighborhoods and those schools. Uh, because not every not every neighborhood had the luxury uh, or, or the money to send their kids to private learning pods where they were learning in person this entire past year. Uh, many many communities waited months to get their iPads and their technology and their internet, uh, while some folks had a seamless transition. So there really needs to be a doubling down of that lens of equity in terms of the resource distribution of these critical recovery dollars. And I'd love to speak more about that with the DOE. I wanna continue on. Every year we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on Carter cases for students with IEPs whose needs cannot be met uh, by DOE schools. Print-based disabilities account for a significant portion of these cases. There's a significant body of research that many print-based disabilities can be addressed in general education settings if evidence-based literacy instruction is offered. Unfortunately, this curriculum is often costly and many schools cannot afford to purchase this. In the interest of meeting the needs of tens of thousands of students in the least restrictive setting and of fiscal efficiencies, will a DOE commit to fund a citywide menu of evidence-based literacy curriculum and literacy intervention teacher trainings in? Thank you, Chair Schrager. And I, I want to just reiterate our commitment to ensuring that we are also targeting and directing resources in, in our hardest hit neighborhoods and making sure we're lifting up those priorities that you spoke so specifically about. Um, and, and to the programs that you're talking about now, you know, I had the opportunity to visit Principal Kavanaugh in PS15 in, in Brooklyn um, and see her amazing Spanish dual language program and the ACES program in, in, in action at her school. Uh, integrating students into the general education classroom who would be in District 75. And so our commitment to this work is deep. Uh, and to speak specifically to your question um, and address your concern, I'm going to ask Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Special Needs Learners, uh, Christina Foti, to join us. Thank you, Chancellor. Good morning, uh, Chair Strager and Chair Drum. So nice to see you all. Um, we absolutely understand the need and urgency around providing uh, evidence-based um, practices in schools uh, uniformly, right? So the, the menu, the um, completely agree with everything you, you just uh, have asked for and, and are certainly looking um, at 
various uh, approaches to doing that in the upcoming year. I think we'll be able to share more on that very soon, but we are in complete alignment about the need and uh, the approach. I just, you know, I also just want to comment briefly on, on Carter cases. Um, and, and you probably know a lot about this, but just to reiterate, um, you're absolutely right. The cost of Carter cases has been uh, increasingly large, um, but unfortunately, Carter cases have become increasingly disconnected from special education practices uh, in, in this city. Um, and of course, you're well aware that the volume of Carter cases has skyrocketed. Um, however, the levels of service provision, as evidenced by our ongoing reporting to city council uh, for public special education services, has, has increased dramatically over the past few years. And so I want to be careful about making sure that we honor and respect the, the good work that our educators are doing in our public schools for, around special education and really um, also reassure you that we understand uh, the, the needs for evidence-based literacy uh, programs that uh, are competitive of, to what's going on outside of, of the public school system and, and really hope to be able to talk more about that soon and um, are very much in alignment with uh, and, and understand the urgency uh, for those practices. Thank you, Ms. Fote, because to me, this is also another issue of equity. Um, families in my district don't have seven to $10,000, uh, e even, even more uh, for a screening to prove that their child has a disability than to hire a lawyer. This, this is a broken system. And you know, there, there's curriculum out there for us to purchase for our schools, provide the adequate PD and training for our teachers to, to incorporate this in the school day. Um, so it's, it's a good best practice to incorporate and it's cost efficient. Um, and I think that this is the direction that we, that we, that we need, we need to, to move in. Uh, and I would really love to work with you on, on establishing that once and for all for our schools. I want to just two more quick things and turn it back to, to, to the chair. PSAL, um, very grateful that executive budget includes funding for PSAL expansion. This committee and the council as a whole, particularly I know Councilmember Reynoso and many others, Councilmember Drum, others have been fighting for PSAL equity for years. Could you please explain how this funding will be spent, including a breakdown of the new teams year over year and how many schools and students will receive access? Will these equity efforts begin this uh, this summer. Sure. And just want to again lift up uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson and the work of her team and honor um, Donald Douglas, who really led this work for our system, who we lost this year, but like really bringing this work to life. Um, one of my last meetings with Donald was as an executive superintendent in the Bronx and really thinking about ways that we could partner schools to build out PSAL options. And so want to just have, again, our amazing Deputy Chancellor Robinson speak to the PSAL expansion and the hard work her team has done to do this, but also just think it's so important to honor Donald Douglas and his memory and, and his commitment to PSAL and building th this system out uh, in the DOE. Thank you so much, Chancellor. And it's really a team effort here. Um, and thank you so much for acknowledging um, the team's loss. Uh, with the loss of Donald. Um, when the chancellor started, she was certainly committed to um, bringing back PSAL sports, fully recognizing the importance of sports for our students. We are aware that, you know, sports benefit our students' mental health and wellness, um, along with building um, important cell skills, like, you know, relationship building mm -hmm. and social awareness, self-awareness, confidence, pride. So increasing access to sports programming across the city um, is a core uh, focus for this chancellor, Chancellor Porter, and this administration. And once again, we'd like to thank council for your advocacy over the years. This charge was really led by our young people. I give them all of the credit for leading the way in this area. The funding that we have um, for uh, PSAL expansion will increase uh, PSAL to, by 215 uh, new teams, 
We're looking forward to having 30 shared programs across 100 school communities, ensuring that every high school has access to PSAL programming. For the first time, we'll be able to say this, and that is the commitment of this council and this administration has never been said before, but we'll be able to ensure that every school has access to PSAL sports. We're also excited because we're increasing access for District 75 students as well, along with direct student support to focus on increased college access. So making the connection between the scholar athlete and ensuring that PSAL is a pathway to the NCAA for many of our scholar athletes. And that would not be possible without the commitment of our chancellor who made it an early priority. So thank you so much, chancellor. Thank you uh, to Chancellor and to Deputy Chancellor Robinson for being steadfast champion on this. Uh, so just, just for clarity's sake, yes, uh, will we be able to say that every single uh, high school, every school will have the resources to participate in a PSAL program this, uh, this fall or this, this upcoming school year? Yes, we will begin um, the rollout of the shared programs across 100 schools, and I can give you the breakdown across the three years as a follow-up. Great. Uh, the final question, then turn back to the chair. The pandemic has highlighted the need to have someone at the DOE who has expertise in the laws and protections for students in foster care and focuses full-time on that population. Complicated questions often arise involving students in foster care, such as who can sign consent for special education evaluations and who could attend parent-teacher conferences. Students in foster care have the lowest graduation rate of any student group in New York City, and the average student in foster care misses the equivalent of one and one and a half months of school each year. In March 2018, the city's interagency foster care task force recommended that the DOE establish an office with central staff to focus on students in foster care. However, the DOE does not have any staff members focused full time on the needs of students in foster care. Given the DOE's emphasis on equity, will the DOE commit to adding staff focused full time on the needs of students in foster care? So we remain committed to our students in foster care and have been in, in conversation with our partners at ACS about just this, uh, creating this space in our organization and really um, you know, providing that central level support. So again, I'll let the amazing Deputy Chancellor Robinson talk more specifically about the work that has started in her office and, and what we look forward to doing. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Um, for our support for our young people in foster care, uh, we understand that our young people in foster care face unique challenges. And we also are organized to provide them with critical supports and services that they need um, from access to counselors, to mental health support, um, and other resources. There is a point person at every school to address the needs of our young people in foster care, and along with um, support systems at the BCO and then within the Office of Safety and Youth Development. Um, we agree and our chancellor has shared that, you know, she wants to see a stronger coordination of services and, um, you know, we'll receive a proposal to review um, having a dedicated office. So that's work that's underway right now. Um, based on our chancellor's commitment, fully recognizing that, you know, we have a, a group of young people that require more support. I think it, it touches on um, what you shared earlier, Chair Traeger, about um, the equity issues and ensuring that supports are being targeted to um, students and student populations of greatest need. And our chancellor is certainly committed to doing just that. And we're working on that now. I, I really appreciate that. And I'm very glad to hear that that's Talks are underway. Just let you know, Chancellor, uh, this council is in full support uh, of creating uh, dedicated staff full-time positions on this issue. Um, you know, equity, it's, it's, it has to be, and I'm sure you know, it has to be an applied practice mm -hmm. and not just a slogan. Yes. Something that we do every single day. That's why students in foster care are important to us. And also special education uh, preschool children, who I mentioned in my opening statement, um, if we, if we fail them, if we don't provide that program where there's, there's pay parity for their teachers, number one, we fail them, and number two, they will be the Carter cases of tomorrow as well. Um, and they, don't, they shouldn't have to go through that, that process. So these, these remain very big priorities for us in the council. We'll have to work with you to, to get this to the finish line.
turn it over back to, to finance chair Jerome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, before we move on, let me say that we have been joined by council members Ayala, Lander, and Gennaro. And I'm gonna turn it now over to council to allow uh, council members to ask questions. Thank you. If any council member have questions for DOA, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to, to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. You will now hear from Council Member Grudenchik, followed by Council Member Kalos. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Ruiz. Uh, thank you, Chairs Drum and Traeger. Um, Chancellor, I am not a professional educator, but I did the next best thing. I married one. Um, my wife just finished about her 70th semester at Nassau Community College. So, um, and I, most of my friends married educators or became educators. Uh, there's just two things I wanted to talk about uh, this morning. I have had the pleasure of working with many of the people um, who have testified this morning. I represent um, Eastern Queens. Uh, I have a big chunk of District 26, the, the northern tier of 29, and at least five, depending on how you count, standalone District 75 schools in my district. And I love each and every one of them. And I think for me, um, the worst thing about this pandemic is I haven't been able to go to my schools um, mm -hmm. in many ways. I really miss going to schools. So on that, I, I do want to ask you, and I've asked this to at least uh, two of your predecessors so far, Technology in the schools. Um, when I took over as councilman uh, about five and a half years ago, my first budget, um, I, I visited one school and the computer teacher there was working with nine-year-old Max, which to me is essentially a nine-year-old paperweight. Um, he couldn't upgrade, he couldn't do anything. And I'm wondering if there are any funds, I have and many of my colleagues that are here today will nod because they understand they have been paying for technology in New York City public schools. Um, is there any funding of this um, incredible windfall that we've received uh, going to technology and, and how will that happen? Yes, thank you, council member. I'm so glad to hear you've married well and all your friends have married well. So <laughs> congratulations to you. And we are really excited that we are definitely putting resources to technology. And I've, I've talked over and over again about what this pandemic has taught us about the 21st century classroom. And to your point about those nine-year-old Macs, technology turns over very, very quickly nowadays. But what we've learned is that is the interaction between the adult, the teacher, the student and the device that's gonna really bring technology to life. But I'm gonna ask Lauren Siciliano to talk okay. more about um, our technology uh, allocations in this budget. Thank you, Chancellor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good morning, and thank you for the question. Um, as the Chancellor said, we have made significant technology investments, um, including but not limited to the um, 500,000 iPads that we have purchased for schools. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the, uh, the funding that we have received um, uh, will allow us to continue to fund the LTE service for those iPads. Um, and we continue to have some iPads centrally available for distribution and to support as needed. Um, in addition, uh, the stimulus funding includes uh, critical investments to make sure that our students continue to have access to 21st century digital learning tools. Um, this includes um, funding not only for uh, supports for teachers um, around access to digital tools, but also, of course, um, funds that will allow us to continue to expand wireless access in school buildings, um, as well as to support schools in taking some of the same um, device uh, tracking and support protocols that we've been using this year um, and continuing them next year, including expanded help desk support. So we are absolutely committed to um, ensuring continued technology investments in our schools and very much appreciates the council's advocacy in this area. Uh, I would also note that um, the infusion of additional dollars to schools through investments like the fair student funding formula um, also will provide resources to schools to ensure that they can continue to support technology. Well, um, I'm happy to hear that. One thing I do want to put on the chancellor's uh, mind, because she has nothing else to think about, of course, um, are smart boards. And I'll tell you one of the, I've, I've told this to uh, both Chair Traeger and Chair Drum uh, in the past, uh, a number of years ago, I was visiting, I think it was PS213, which has uh, several blended programs with P4. And um, 
one of the children was able to participate, um, a special needs uh, student, um, using a pointer in his mouth, but he was like every other child, he was able to stop that. It was basically a roulette wheel to see what you got on the smart board. And I cried. Um, and I'm not ashamed to tell you that because mm -hmm. it was that magic moment that where it all came together for that one young person. Yes. And he was as much a part of that school as any other child. So mm -hmm. I thank you. I wish you good luck. Um, and uh, I'd love to see you out here in Eastern Queens whenever you whenever you have a few moments. <laughs> love to do a visit with you. Okay. Get us all thank back you. in schools. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Chairs. We will now hear from Councilmember Kalos, followed by Councilmember Lander. Time starts now. I've spent the past seven years asking about adding school seats, pre-K and 3K in particular, and why would this year be any different? Uh, when I asked the mayor during preliminary budget negotiations, he said he would make he would keep his promise to make. 3K universal by 2021 if we got funding from the federal government. So I asked Congresswoman Maloney and she got the money. On March 24th, I was proud to join Mayor de Blasio in announcing the 3K expansion for all of Manhattan and citywide. At the time, I shared concern with how hard it would be to roll out in less than six months, uh, but um, we've still been doing it. We've been going to schools, we've been going to providers, we've been going to empty storefronts and passing that information along to DOE. I've been a little bit disappointed that we haven't heard back. I'm really confident, but just to be very specific about it, uh, in terms of uh, my district, at this point, I believe there are three sites in my district, one on Roosevelt Island uh, and two, in, one in the 80s and one in the 90s, two in the 90s. So we have four seats for a thousand, we, we have a thousand four-year-olds, so assuming a thousand three-year-olds too. Uh, and that's just not going to be enough. Uh, can we use any of the school seats? Uh, there was a 4% decline in enrollment citywide, mm -hmm. but in my district, two of the schools in my district lost more than 25% of their students. Uh, PS 234 lost 171 students. PS 89 lost 104 students. Um, the, sorry, that was just in district two. On the Upper East Side, PS 158 lost 130 students. PS 290 lost 101. Uh, if you take all the schools on the Upper East Side combined K through eight, we lost 543 students. Can we make those seats available? So thank you, Councilmember Kalos. And, and you, you can tell from our commitments in the budget that we agree with you around the importance of centering our early childhood education. And this is my second hearing and I'm very clear about your question and what is important to you. <laughs> so you've made it very much known. I'm gonna ask Deputy Chancellor Wallach to talk more about pre-K, 3K expansion and what we can do specifically in your district. And, and I have two follow-up questions. Yep. So the answers can be as quick and the, to the point as possible, especially possibly even just yes. Okay. <laughs> So thank you, um, I appreciate it, Council Member Kalos, and I will be brief. Um, we, are, we are committed to working in close partnership with you to achieve the vision of, of 3K for all as quickly as we can. Our goal is to have a seat for every family by the fall of 2023. Um, in school district two, we have 45 programs that are offering 3K on the application now, um, but we wanna work with you to go as far and as fast as we can. And so we are in dialogue now with, uh, with principals and the superintendent in, in uh, school district two and throughout your district to see where there might be other opportunities. Um, we will work with you and families through this admission season um, to go again, as quickly as we can. That if being said- school isn't available uh, on the deadline of May 28th, does that mean that that school won't possibly be a 3K site or will we be able to add 3K sites after the May 28th deadline for families? We will continue to add sites um, uh, and, we'll, you know, and we'll keep you posted on that. We would encourage families to apply for 3K um, now with the sites that are available, put their names on waiting lists, and then we will keep them informed as new sites become available and they can apply for those as well. Um, but regardless, we will keep your office posted and families posted throughout the district as new opportunities arise. We got most of the seats that we did uh, through building out new locations. We forwarded a number of locations. SCA is telling me that they have no plans to open anything by 2021. Everything is for 2022. 
Uh, is there a way to get some of the existing school sites converted and online by the 20 by September? Additionally, uh, we have a lot of community-based organizations. They're the ones who got us through this to begin with. Um, and some of them have multiple sites. They're owned and operated by one LLC, but each site is a different LLC. Can we let all of the sub LLCs in uh, to do that? And then we've got other providers who are answering the call and saying, we will do this, but the DOE won't open the RFP. Uh, will you open the RFP for September? If you can't for September, would you open it for January? We believe that we can add uh, some, uh, we, can, we can work with, with school leaders to bring some additional district school seats online. Uh, as far as school construction goes, that it just typically takes, you know, from the, from the process of securing property to building it out in a safe and, and healthy way, it takes time. Um, and and we'll, we continue to work with uh, the school construction authority on that. As for specific uh, community-based organizations, Let's continue the dialogue. We have to follow all the rules, obviously, of city procurement and be careful about that. But where there's flexibility, you know, the mayor and chancellor have been clear that this is a priority and we should push, we should push as hard as we can and we will do that. We will now hear from Councilmember Landard, followed by Councilmember Rose. Time starts now. Thank you very much to the chairs and to the chancellor and the whole DOE team. Just really appreciate what you guys have been doing and going through and managing and supporting and, and all of this really, really grateful. And I want to say thank you again to Lindsay for working with us on the school budget relief issues. Um, and glad we are past that and to fair student funding. Um, what I want to ask about first is how we're involving school communities in planning for the resources we have for social and emotional and academic supports as opposed to just kind of waiting or having some menu. Um, I partnered up with somebody else and did a survey of about 100 remote families and found that more than half had not heard from anyone from their school about what would make them feel confident coming back next year. And it just seems to me it would be wise to take some of these resources and invest in supporting our school communities to have the resources to plan together for what, how they want to invest those funds, like talk to folks in remote cohorts as well as in-person cohorts, do a lot of outreach, like that might take money itself. We already have principals, people mostly want to hear from principals and teachers, yeah. but they're swamped with the work of the year. So how do we support school communities to do outreach, to be talking to all those families and then involving them in making some you know, hopefully there's some flexibility and room for decision making. I know you guys are doing some borough town halls, but obviously only a very small percentage of people are going to be able to come to those. So how do we make sure you know, the most important thing, it seems to me, is not to say to school communities, you know, here's some money um, and you can spend it in ways X, Y or Z. But here's how we can help you make your school into a community that supports resilience and healing. And that's an enormous task. And so helping them have the infrastructure, you might even want to pay some parents to be on a school reopening council, pay some teachers to spend time this summer beyond summer rising to be getting ready for what's necessary uh, to really make the fall supportive and healing for all our students. So can you, can you say a little more about how what you're setting up and how that can happen? Yeah, first of all, Council Member Lander, I completely agree with you. The, the big borough tours are important. Um, they are an important part of the process, but what is going to get our students back in school and our families committed is that interaction between the school and the family, period. And so we're doing a number of things. So internally, we've been going through the process of you know, just going, doing what we call empathy interviews, just checking the pulse of where our schools are, where our central office team members are. Um, and we're gonna be sharing a report with that, of what came out of those conversations, what schools need to, to really be open from us, from the central office. Um, we're also, you know, part of our summarizing planning is about that partnership and providing resources to our school communities to help support the planning process forward. But I agree with you that we are, they are part of the conversation with us. Um, I'm working with our Chancellor's Principal Advisory Council to inform school reopening along with our union partners. But I'm going to let 
uh, Lauren, Lindsay, I'm sorry, and Deputy Chancellor Robinson, and if we have time, our Chief Academic Officer, Linda Chen, talk about what's been happening in their division, specifically in service of, you know, uh, supporting our principals really being in partnership with families around reopening. Thank you, Chancellor, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Lander. Uh, we have now released as of Monday, what we call our, fam, our, our fall planning grant. Um, this is an allocation that we're doing for the second year in the row for the exact purpose that you're describing. It provides funding to school communities to support, um, to have the ability to pay procession to teachers, to assistant principals, um, so that they can do the work that you just described so eloquently throughout the summer supporting reopening. We did an allocation last year, we found that to be successful. So we're repeating that process this year. Um, and that's something that schools know about now. It was posted on Monday, and so they can start to work towards that. We also did a planning grant to support planning with summer activities. I know that we have great work on um, trauma-informed care that um, does involve payments to families, and I think LaShawn, uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, can speak more to that. Just to be clear, every, every school is getting those Grants, they don't have to apply for it. There, no, it's, all. it's yeah, a grant is a little misnomer. It, every school is getting an allocation and every school can use it to support those planning activities. Okay, and then my last question is just about um, making the outdoor learning program permanent. We have a letter coming to you. Um, obviously, especially for summer rising, it's been great to be able to use the streets and outdoor spaces uh, we made the open restaurants program and the open streets program permanent. So I'm hoping we'll be making the open schools or outdoor learning program permanent. Um, and that might take a little more time to figure out what it looks like in the fall and what permanent means, but at least for the summer, I hope it'll get extended beyond the, the current timeline. We completely agree with you. We, we would love to see that we expand ex outdoor learning. Um, it's been a great resource for our schools. Um, and we think as we move towards a potential full reopening, which, which is what I'm hopeful for, we'll need those outdoor spaces to support our schools. So thank you for your support in that space. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Rose, followed by Council Member Dinowitz. Time starts now. Thank you so much. I want to thank Chairs um, Drum and Traeger for their zeal and fervor just to make New York City schools excellent. Um, and, and Chancellor, I want to welcome you and say um, uh, thank you so much for making Staten Island your first visit. <laughs> Usually we are last on the list. And um, I, I want to apologize. I had all intentions of, of uh, participating, but uh, something unplanned came up. Um, but I, I, my concern has been from the beginning of the pandemic, um, the loss of learning, a learning loss, and the fact that uh, so many of our students did not have the equipment that they needed um, to, to even pr participate remotely. Um, so I'm really worried about the academic um, deficits that they are going to uh, suffer from. So the executive budget included a 500 million investment in fiscal 22 for academic recovery and student support. Um, it's our understanding that uh, DOE hasn't quite yet determined how to use this broad category of funding. Um, so even before the pandemic, fewer than half of New York City's third graders, third through eighth graders were, um, were less than reading proficient with striking disparities based on race, disability and housing status. Is DOE considering options to revamp the way New York City teaches children to read based on what research shows and ensure students get the reading instruction and interventions that they need? How can DOE best use the federal funding to ensure students learn to read? And um, will any of these funds be used during summer um, rising? And if so, how much? And, um, and do you think that 28 to 30 days of programming for summer rising 
is enough time to address young people who have failed courses or, or need to even learn um, the new ones that um, the instruction that was given during the pandemic. Thank you, Council Member Worlds. I'm gonna start backwards from the end of your question and pull our, Deputy, our Chief Academic Officer, Linda Chen, in to talk very specifically about uh, the academic recovery work we're doing. And so I think summarizing is the bridge back to school. It is a starting point. It is absolutely not our ending point. And it, it's gonna serve a number of purposes. It's gonna provide academic support, academic intervention. It's going to provide very importantly, fun times for students back in school, but also build that bridge back to learning, to in-person learning um, that, that we need to have happen for our students to address those gaps that you talked about. Um, as far as our academic recovery work, we are looking very specifically at research-based practices around screening screeners around where our students are so we can provide targeted instructional support, but also centering our most vulnerable learners as a part of the path forward. Um, and that includes our students with disabilities, our English language learners, and our students in communities in, that are traditionally underserved. But again, I'll let uh, Dr. Chen talk more specifically about those, uh, the academic recovery ex um, efforts. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, um... Uh, Council Member Rose, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, we have students who pre-pandemic, we were striving to support. And that is also, in terms of our equity work and action, we wanna make sure we double down and support those who didn't receive what they needed before. And especially for the pandemic, now all of those disparities have been absolutely exacerbated. And so part of what we are doing is a multi-pronged approach. So first and foremost, as you said, we need to be able to identify as quickly as possible what the learning needs are to accelerate their learning. That means we need to have um, screeners and diagnostic tools available to our schools so that they can quickly and efficiently discern what are the needs in English language arts and in math. And then, we also have updated our core curriculum to make sure that that curriculum can meet our students where they are. Part of this readiness to accelerate their skill development and their knowledge development is making sure that we begin with the social emotional learning support. Time expired. And affirm students where they are so that they can really accelerate their learning. We also, in addition to the core curriculum updates, we also have interventions that are evidence-based, as the chancellor spoke about, in both small groups and pairings. We also have um, high dosage tutoring that is part of the comprehensive work around recovery and academic recovery. And then lastly, I know we're short on time, specifically around literacy. What we have seen is that over time, students that need and deserve a full literacy instruction that means foundational literacy that includes phonics and phonemic awareness and vocabulary and fluency and comprehension. They have not had equitable access to all of those evidence-based skills, programming and interventions. And that is what we are also doubling down on, not only in our budget, but in our um, priorities of professional learning and training. So those are some of the things that we are doing to move towards recovery and as quickly as possible. That's also why, as the chancellor often says, it is so important to open, open the doors to every student to be able to serve them in person. And I hope that um, the materials that you use are going to be inclusionary and reflective of, of the students that are there. Um, and, and not just um, for um, black and brown people during um, Black History Month. Thank we are you. with you, Council Member Worlds, 100% with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Now we'll hear from Council Member Adams. Time starts now. Thank you so much to both of the chairs this morning, uh, Council Members Traeger, uh, Chair Traeger and Chair Drum. Thank you so much, Chancellor Porter. Always a pleasure. Um, to be in your company and your staff. Um, it's a very exciting time right now for the DOE. It's an exciting time, I think, 
for New York City as a whole in our uh, reopening of schools and enthusiastically getting our children back to work. So I'm just going to ask a, a few questions all together. Um, I'm concerned about the lost children uh, in middle school and high school. Um, I represent District 28 in Southeast Queens, Jamaica, South Richmond Hill, South Ozone Park. Um, and I'm concerned about the lost children in my district, those who disappeared from the system. Um, so I'd like to know what's being done to find them. Uh, I know that summarizing, we're, we're putting a lot on summarizing right now to retrieve them and recall them, but what's being done right now to find those children and re-engage them again? Time has been lost and they're out of sight, out of mind. That's one thing. Um, the second thing, that uh, concerns me uh, is, and I'm gonna tie it all together, the unfortunate death of uh, Rami Vilsain uh, and um, bullying that he uh, was subject to at PS361, I believe, um, and the subsequent um, response of DOE, from what I understand, and I, I get it, it's probably protocol, but the grieving family feels detached and they feel abandoned. Um, by the school that they put him in and entrusted him. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit about that protocol in that situation. And also um, in taking a look forward as far as anti-bullying for our children that are so, so troubled and have things pent up and may not even realize the significance of their actions. What are we doing as far as enhancing anti-bullying treatment, a training for our children and also for our teachers and sensitivity. The child was bullied for days um, and it continued and now he's not here anymore. Then my final question has to do with the nurse that saw him. There was a nurse at PS361. My scope and my vision, part of it um, for New York City schools is to have clinics in our schools who brought in the base of healthcare for our children. I think, had there been a clinic in place um, to handle a broader base of issues for our children when it comes to their healthcare, the situation may have been different. I don't know, but it may have changed things a little bit. So I just wanna get your thoughts on that, You know, on expanding some of the great things that you're looking at right now and doing. It's a lot of funding that we're getting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to throw out there one more time because my colleague, Councilmember Rose, put this in there. Equity in our school systems is a must. Black and brown children are the majority in our schools, and there is no curriculum representative of them, of their history. There is no curriculum that is consistent. Hell, not just the slavery aspect, but the academic, the educational, the arts, all of it because we encompass all of that and all children would benefit from an inclusionary curriculum that included all of the children in the schools in the city of New York. So I'm gonna stop there because I could get on a roll, but I'm gonna stop. And again, thank you very much uh, to the chairs again and thank you for your testimony. I, I could join you on that role, Council Member Adams and Council Member Rose. There's no greater advocate for ensuring that a curriculum is inclusive and representative in our schools. Um, and we're going to get it done. And, and, and it really is thanks to the resources of this council that we are going to get it done. Um, I also just want to honor Romy Vassant and his family. This is a heartbreaking tragedy. You know, every time we lose a child in our system, it affects me not only as a leader, but as a mother. Um, and I can't imagine, you know, it is unimaginable the pain that the family's in. Um, you know, we are, a full investigation is underway um, and our deepest sympathies are with the family and, and would love to talk to you uh, offline if we need to about what ways that we can better support the family outside of protocol. Uh, we we want to make sure that the family feels supported and covered in this, it's just really difficult, challenging, um, just heartbreaking time. Um, there really are no words. I, I also want to say, uh, you know, as, as an educator in the Bronx, uh, those lost children out of sight, out of mind, are never out of sight and out of mind for us. They, 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 they go to bed with us at night. You know, we wake up to them in the morning. They keep us up at Time. night. 
And, and so ensuring that we have clear protocols around attendance, re-engagement, it's the work of our team in under the Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson. And I'll have a talk a little bit more about what the, that looks like. Uh, I don't know if the first deputy chancellors on this call could talk a little bit about our summer program and how we are addressing um, students who need to regain credits and how we're bringing them back in the system. But our commitment is to every New York City public school student and to making sure they hit that finish line of a high school diploma and college and career readiness and beyond. Thank you. And we will now hear from Council Member Dinowitz. Time starts now. Thank you. And I want to thank Council Members Drum and Traeger. It's, you know, great to have teachers in the council. Uh, I'm council member from the North Bronx. And before I was in the council, I was also a teacher. I was a special education teacher. Uh, and I taught here in the Bronx. I actually still consider myself a teacher. Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to echo what Council Member Adams uh, said her sentiments about clinics and schools. Um, I taught in buildings with clinics. Uh, they were invaluable tools for providing our children with vital mental health supports that they needed. And uh, trust me, many of our, our children do utilize and need those services. Uh, one of the favorite classes that I taught throughout my years as a special education teacher was environmental science. And I was fortunate enough that my school had a garden and I would bring students to the garden and between growing fresh food, eating that food, students learn to love green space. They learn how to be stewards of the environment. Some of their diets even changed. And that's not even to mention how being outside and engaging with the environment uh, and growing, growing things impacted their social emotional health. But you know, this type of outdoor education, education, environmental education, it's especially important here in the Bronx we're ranked the least healthy county in the entire state. And many of my constituents have limited access to green space and fresh food. And so what I want to know is what funds are set aside, what's, what's being done for physical space so that gardens can be built in schools for all ages. Of course, funding for the staff to maintain this space for sustainability coordinators and what efforts are being made to coordinate with many of our organizations that specialize uh, in this type of environmental education and specifically um, is this any of this money these efforts um, being prioritized for communities that have historically been left behind like here in the Bronx yeah you know I know better than anyone else council member Dino, it's, uh you know the, the way the the Bronx has been left out uh, traditionally um, but also the importance of creating green spaces and and the, the joy it brings young people when they get to engage in those green spaces. Um, I'm going to ask Deputy Chancellor Goldmark to talk specifically about how we are providing access, how we're working with CBO partners to build those green spaces in the Bronx. And would love to talk again more offline about how we expand those opportunities, not only in the borough of the Bronx, but across our city. Thank you so much, Chancellor Porter. Hi, Councilmember Dinowitz. It's nice to be uh, face to the voice. Um, we yes. were talking about a specific green space in the Bronx. I believe that was yesterday. It feels, um, yeah. Maybe the day before. Um, so thank you for your question. Uh, actually, with a lot of support from the council, we've done really a tremendous amount of work this year on outdoor learning. And we've been working closely with the Parks Department and with the Department of Transportation. Uh, we now have hundreds of schools across New York City of all types, uh, DOE, district, charter, non-public. So every school in New York City was eligible to apply for outdoor learning. And one of the things we learned this year is precisely how important that outdoor space was. It's something that we already knew, but we've been deeply reminded of. And we are actually in the process right now of planning for what Outdoor Learning 2.0 looks like. How do we take this? Not only so that children are outside, which is so important, but so that it's uh, there are curricular connections to, to being outside and there's a specific uh, reason to be outside, which by the way, playing outside is a very good, valid, uh, legitimate, specific reason. So we're not, uh, you know, no shade on that, uh, but we are also looking at how do we expand this so that it's a learning experience um, and how do we specifically attend to neighborhoods um, where there actually is less green space. 
because many, many, many New Yorkers realized over the course of the last year exactly how far they were from a really large green space um, when, when uh, we were all uh, only walking places, which mercifully we are no longer in that situation. Um, and when we did the outdoor learning initiative the first time, we also prioritized the neighborhoods uh, that were uh, most impacted by COVID and that had the least amount of green space um, for those outdoor learning permits. Good, and and not to cut you off, I have 22 more seconds, but but again, with outdoor learning, it's, it's not just being outside, but engaging in, in yes. what life can be created outside, how students can build with their hands and see, you know, and see things grow. And, you know, as educators, we so often talk about, you know, seeing the, you know, the, the, the children seeing the fruits of their labor. It's very, very challenging to see that. On I'm inspired. Paper, but can I have a few more seconds, Chair? Okay. You know, but seeing things grow is very impactful to the social, emotional, and mental health of our children. So as you look to 2.0, um, I would, you know, very eager to work with you on making that just not, as you said, not just being outdoors, but making that outdoor experience uh, purposeful, uh, and of course, of course, prioritizing uh, places in the Bronx and like the borough of the Bronx, which absolutely need that both for social emotional support and for, um, you know, a borough that has historically been been behind in health outcomes. Uh, you know, the, the asthma rate is in incredibly high, and we have high absence rates be because of that asthma rate, and children, you know, expanding the green space, but also teaching children and, and raising a generation of children who love and can advocate for and, and work in their own communities to build and expand their environment and their health uh, is vital. So I'm eager to, to work with you on that. And of course, but again, making sure that there's actually funds to do yeah. this because it costs money to build a garden. It costs money to pay staff and work with community partners uh, to do that. Thank you. Chairs, we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson. Now moving on with Councilmember questions. We have questions from Councilmember Riley. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum and, and Chair Traeger for your, your resiliency uh, during the pandemic and your leadership. Um, thank you, Chancellor Porter. I, I, have no question, I have no questions pertaining to the Bronx schools because you know for years um, how much we have been underfunded. Uh, and underappreciated. I know with your leadership that we won't be having that um, anymore moving forward. But my question really goes with um, financial literacy in the education system. Um, as you know, many of our students who are going into high um, college um, usually don't get the financial literacy that they need before they enter into college. And then they accumulate so much debt when it comes to credit cards and different other uh, financial hardship that they realize when they get to college. So my question is, is there any plan with DOE to invest into more financial literacy for our students, um, especially students of color that come from communities like the Bronx here in the 12th district and all across uh, New York City? Thank you, council member Riley. And you know, we, we probably are victims of that uh, lack of learning around financial literacy early on and definitely believe very much in the importance of teaching financial literacy, but also ensuring that part of the pathway to college and career readiness for our students includes understanding the financial costs and the financial kind of attacks from credit card companies um, mm -hmm. on our students around, um, you know, really, you know, getting ready for college in, in all of those ways. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson has really led our work in, around college access for all, which has included financial literacy around college um, and college readiness and awareness really being grounded, not only in the academic skills needed for college, but also the financial skills. And so I'm gonna pass it really quickly so I can get Deputy Chancellor Robinson in. Thank you, Chancellor. I'll start and invite um, Dr. Chen on as well, um, who shares uh, the College Access for All work. Um, I, I think this is a great opportunity. You know, the Chancellor spoke earlier around um, curricula um, development and investments that we have to take a closer look at our um, economics class that all students must take prior to graduation, which, you know, has a focus on financial literacy, I think we can certainly take a closer look and look at um, alignment with um, some of the concerns that you're raising, Council Member Rowley. 
Um, but uh, Linda's team, they support college access for all high school. Uh, we support the middle school component and you know, really work together to coordinate those supports with the focus on financial literacy as our young people transition from um, high schools to the post-secondary setting. So Dr. Chen, if you would like to add, please do so. Sure, uh, very quickly, um, yes, financial literacy is important and more than ever. We continue to expand those lessons throughout, not just waiting until high school, so that students are getting financial literacy throughout even elementary to middle school grades, and specifically in college access in the high school space. We do quite a bit of work with a number of our partners to support our young people in planning for college and career. There's so many complicated aspects of applying for college and being ready to be able to not just get in and through that process, but to be able to maintain the financial sustainability, not only for college, but also for career and for life. Yes. So those are some things that we've, we've included as well. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I'm looking forward to, you know, partnering with the DOE to see how we could do uh, more within the council, because we really do want to ensure that our kids are financially literate, especially those going into college. And we yeah. do have some kids that choose not to go into college. Maybe they yeah. want to go into a career. So we want to make sure that we're preparing them, you know, ahead of time. So thank you, uh, Chancellor Porter. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, you've been amazing um, for the education community. We're looking forward to our partnership uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Council Member Riley, for your con continued work across the borough. I see you. <laughs> Thank you. As a resident, I see you. Thank you. Council Member Riley, don't go too far. I have a pitch, which is that in the Council's budget response, we did ask for $6 million in funding for the New York City Kids Rise program, yes. which actually sets yes. up a scholarship for students. And it has existed in District 30. Uh, and 95% of the students in District 30 now have a 421k uh, set up for them. 95% of the students. Beautiful. So if we can get this into the budget, which I hope we'll work with the chancellor on, and I know that they have met with the chancellor, uh, this would be a wonderful uh, way to uh, expand that college access to all students. College access for all will really become real. Amazing. So uh, I look forward yes. to working with the chancellor on that proposal as well. Definitely, you, Chair Drum. And I can tell you, as I told them when I met with New York City Kids Rise, it's a no brainer. We are definitely looking to expand um, and definitely expanding across the boroughs. Great. Thank and you. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. And it's so mm -hmm. community inclusive. It's incredible. But uh, let's go to Council Member Lewis, who now has questions. And then we'll go to Council Member Traeger, because we're a little over time. And uh, we need to go to the um, School Construction Authority part of the hearing as well. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and Traeger, for your leadership and for being staunch supporters of our students in schools. Um, so sad to see you two go, but um, you definitely have left us the framework on how we should be carrying the mantle moving forward. Um, I just have a quick question, it won't be too long. Councilmember Adams, she had a tragedy that happened in my district about a week and a half ago. It still has our community um, in uproar, um, but Chancellor Port, I just wanted to thank you and your team for uh, responding to the community regarding it. But I just have a quick question about social workers. I wanted to know what framework will be used to access the new influx of social workers, school psychologists, and other support staff to schools within this next budget. Definitely. Um, I'm gonna just pass it over to Deputy Chancellor Robinson to answer that quickly. Thank you so much, council member, um, for this important question and continuing um, to you know, keep the Romy family Yes. Um, in, in our prayers, um, and certainly a, a heartbreaking tragedy that occurred that our chancellor spoke to earlier. And for our schools, um, funding for social workers will be um, sent to schools via a school allocation memorandum. Um, and each school will have an opportunity to um, hire their own social worker. Um, we've heard from school leaders about the importance of um, them engaging their school teams and making the selection for the hire. So that will happen. Um, and uh, I believe we should, and, and perhaps um, Lindsay's team can speak to when the funding will be FAM, um, but I believe that should be happening shortly if it hasn't already. Um, but we'll be coordinating closely with schools to ensure that those social workers are hired and in place this fall. Um, so schools will receive considerable support in making this happen. 
Uh, I think Lindsay is muted, but it, the, the SAM is actually already out. And okay. so we look forward to making sure we're leveraging those resources. And Council Member Lewis, thank you for your partnership and support of the Romy family, Romy's family. Thank you so much. Chair Traeger. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, just to have some quick follow-up questions and then we'll move on to the Capitol. Um, I wanted to just dig a little deeper on the $720 million in academic and instructional uh, supports. I think we heard before from Dr. Chen about diagnostic screening. Can we learn a little bit more specifics about that? And also what comes after diagnostics and the screenings? Because the work is really also in the intervention services and making sure, making sure that they're adequate. And again, doubling down on, on, on equity in those services. Could, could someone just go, go deeper on that for me, please? Yeah. Yes, I'll, uh, Dr. Chen, go deeper into that. And I just will also add that also including, included in that investment is the, the conversation that has come up over and over and over in this call. And that is ensuring that we have a curriculum that is reflective of our students and responsive. And so I just wanted to lift that as well. But go ahead, Dr. Chen. Yes, thank you. So um, we're looking at a full package, right? Um, I think uh, many of you know, we've never been able to fully, uh, you know, RTI or MTSS, those are things, response to intervention or multi-tiered systems of support are things that we've known about for a number of years, but we're now able to really fully resource those efforts. So it begins with, and again, with the screener, right? So it's like a temperature check, like how are students doing, doing in accordance with the grade level or subject area standards? And then there are diagnostic tools to go a little bit deeper. So it's almost like you go to the doctor's office, you get a temperature check, and it gives you some high level information that helps teachers plan for um, core instruction, the instruction the chancellor's talking about, which is uh, reflective of who our students are and are affirmed in the curriculum. And then there's, like you said, uh, the Chair Traeger, taking that deeper look into what students need maybe in smaller groups for targeted interventions around certain standards. We also know that students may need even a deeper look in, in terms of diagnostic tools. So if students are having a hard time reading, we may not know why they can't read at grade level. Is it a decoding issue around phonics or phonemic awareness or fluency? Or is it a, a sort of meaning-based situation around comprehension and vocabulary? So the diagnostic tools chair helped to determine and better be more precise as to the types of interventions that are needed so that we can match what students need with the interventions that can accelerate their learning. And earlier in the, I think you asked for reference too, when we think about tier through three or those intensive interventions, that very support like around the evidence-based literacy interventions specifically that are needed we also know that takes a fair amount of training. And so that's what also the resources are devoted to around training. To your point earlier around the hardest hit areas and the kids that need it the most, that is where we are prioritizing training, prioritizing resources, and also prioritizing the high dosage tutoring that we talked about earlier. So uh, just, just for clarity, is, is the DOE Con uh, considering how will you conduct this diagnostic work? Is this going to be uh, a, a test? Is this a formative assessment? What is, what is the tool? These are low stakes assessments. These are not to be used for high stakes. It's really for teachers to be able to know how to most precisely and efficiently provide services. I would also add, it's important for our students themselves and our families to understand, we've gotten a lot of questions, families like, where are my students? That information is also designed to empower students to know where they are, to make sure our families know where our students are and know exactly what the plan is to support the acceleration of their learning so they know what they will be getting as a result of those assessments. So a couple of quick follow-ups. Has this been communicated to schools that these are low stakes, formative assessments not to be used 
to evaluate kids in terms of report cards, not to be used in terms of teacher observation reports, that these are just clearly low stakes assignments. And also, where will the schools find the added resources? Will it be a new SAM? Where will they find the money for the services that come about after this, this assessment is done? Yes, uh, we've, we've shared that these are low stakes and also they will come in the form of SAMs and also direct resources as well, both. And when can schools expect to see that SAM or hear about, or get guidance about that SAM? We are working very hard with the finance office. I, I will also just, just defer to Lindsay in terms of timing, but uh, there, luckily there are lots of resources and we're making sure that they're very clearly delineated and distributed. And I would also add that, that these assessments, these low stakes screeners already happening in our schools. Schools are using iReady, they're using MAP, you know, MAP, fix, correct me, Linda, the, 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 say it again? Map growth, yes. Map growth assessments. And so these are really assessments that tell a story of where our students are academically. What we wanna to move to in the new school year is being very, one, supporting and resourcing them happening, and two, having a consistent practice across the, our system around how and when they happen. Okay, and, and is there agreement on uh, the areas around small group, high dose tutoring? Um, how will students be selected and identified for, for, for that? Uh, what kind of guidance will be given out to schools about that? Um, can anyone speak to that issue? Yeah, I'll, they, go ahead, Linda. They, they definitely, I'll just start by saying there's absolutely agreement and around that. You know, we wanna make sure that we provide access to that high dosage tutoring that, that many of our families don't have the resources to provide on their own. Um, and so there's absolutely agreement around that. But Dr. Chen, go ahead. Yes, so between high dosage tutoring and the interventions that are very targeted, um, we are providing information for schools to know. And again, I echo what the chancellor said. Much of these things are happening in our schools, but we are able to make sure that they're the resources and the funding to support these to do it more deeply. So that depending on how students, um, their results are in terms of their screeners and their diagnostics. And I wanna also mention too, that teacher information is also very important. It's not about one measure or one assessment, but the teacher observation and that information and information from families are important as well then they can target and align the types of needs with the types of interventions that are needed. And that includes dosage and frequency and all of those factors as well. And we also, I'm sorry, Chair Trigger. Please change your question. Yep. We also want to make sure that we are not just focusing, although we want to make sure that we are closing gaps, but that we're not just leaning into remedial services, but also academic enrichment and building, you know, creating really strong building blocks to advance students forward. Right. And, and will there be equity accounted for in this new SAM in terms of our multilingual learners, our kids with special needs? Can anyone speak to that? Absolutely. Uh, Mirza and Christina Fodi are here and they are like absolutely Chair Trega and thank you for making sure we lifted that up. Centering our most vulnerable learners is, will always remain a priority, but uh, Mirza, mm -hmm, go ahead. All right, and that's inclusive of what we've been discussing in terms of assessments and interventions are also specifically there one specifically for multilingual learners in mind and students with disabilities with more intensive I, I have to say this because um, as someone who represents a district that has uh, a, a, you know, a high number of student, multilingual learners and I've heard from uh, uh, providers and we, we need to do better in this regard of getting information out and connecting uh, with our uh, immigrant families, our multilingual learners, because this has been a major, major challenge. I said this before, not everyone watches the 10 o'clock press conferences. Yep. Not everyone watches, follows yep. Twitter and Facebook. Um, families get information in different ways. Um, and I think we need to think about how do we double down on partnerships with community-based organizations that actually serve our immigrant families on a daily basis uh, to get information and connections to services. I really think that, that this really needs to be 
the, the, the direction that, that, we, that we move move toward. I want to just quickly move on in terms of um, an estimate cost for pay parity for our preschool special education teachers. Uh, I know uh, I previously spoke to Lindsay Oates about this uh, at a meeting. Lindsay, do we have any, any numbers or data yet on how much would it cost to provide pay parity for our preschool special education teachers, namely the 4410? Mm -hmm. So, uh Thank you for the question, Chair. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach to join me on this. But as we spoke earlier, um, we are investing in special ed pre-K in an unprecedented way. We are thrilled to be able to make that investment and add additional seats. Um, my understanding is we don't have the best access into the financials of the individual organizations that run these programs. They are not uh, contracted with DOE now. They certainly don't work for us. And um, so we don't have a specific cost estimate. I think we are working on that and I can let Deputy Chancellor Wallach speak to the, the work that his team is doing on that. Uh, thank you. No, that's exactly right. Um, and uh, you know, when we, when we, with your partnership and help, achieve compensation equity for general ed community-based organization teachers. We were able to do that because we had very good information about their salaries um, and could, could, could really project how much that would cost. We just don't have the same information about this group of organizations, but we're working with the state ed department to get that information and would really like to partner with you and your team as well um, in getting a hold of it and reviewing it so that we can make the best assessment. We share your your goal of making sure that all of these educators that do such tremendous work for our children and families are compensated fairly. So we just want to get that information so that we can come to the right answers. Right, and and to give just colleagues in public context here, uh, because the pay parity agreement they were able to uh, advance for early childhood educators a few years back, because it did not extend to preschool special education. Many of the, these, these providers that would serve at the time were over 30,000 children. Um, they are facing uh, major vacancies. They cannot fill positions because there's no pay parity for special education preschool teachers. This is a state mandated, of course, program. The state, of course, bears responsibility. But now that we have these added resources, there's really no excuse not, not for us to get this done. Uh, we do need the data. I agree with you. I, we've been pushing and getting, trying to get this information. But we need to get this and we need to get this done um, because, again, we're failing kids. And also, these will be the Carter cases of tomorrow. Parents are, they have a, the kids have a right to this education and we have an obligation to get it done. Parents will sue and they shouldn't have to sue to get their kid quality education. So I think that, we, that this, this is a major, major priority for us to get done. Uh, moving uh, quickly along. Um, why doesn't the executive budget add additional funding to support DOE's operations for summer rising? It seems that this is an entirely moving in DYCD, not really into DOE. And there is concern about, you know, there are supports that we need to provide for kids in summer, particularly our multilingual learners, particularly kids with special needs. Uh, students um, in the ju juvenile criminal justice systems, students in temporary housing. Um, can anyone speak to why is it that the money is O and DYCD and nothing in DOE? Uh, I'm going to pull Lindsay in to talk about it quickly, but just to know, like the resources are here as well, and we are also targeting our special populations of students. And if we can get to it, Dr. Chen can also speak to th that work as well. Yes, uh, Chair Traeger, thank you for your question. We, are, we have a baseline budget for summer in the city as it was previously called, called and we are obviously continuing to use the, <clears throat> the new resources, uh, excuse me, our existing resources. We also have been able to maximize other types of federal revenue to expand these programs, so Title I and Title IV in particular. We allocated the funding to schools for planning purposes actually earlier this week on Monday. We can share that link with you so you can see what the school allocation memorandum looks like and you can see that 
allocations per school in that school allocation memorandum. We are using some stimulus funding in our budget um, to expand the services this year. And DYCD is obviously funded separately. And so I believe that they received additional resources for their component, um, but I can't speak to those specifically. You know, on the academic fronts, as the chancellor said, there are um, line items also in the summarizing budget. Uh, schools will make school-based decisions around curriculum and those aspects, but we also have in there special education educators who are trained to provide literacy intervention supports, those evidence-based supports that we were talking about, as well as multilingual supports. So Dr. Chen, just to follow up on that, are you making a commitment that any child with special needs in New York City, there is going to be a program for them this summer uh, within our DOE DYCD partnership. Is that correct? Yes, every special education student will be serviced, whether they're ones with 12 month IEPs or other students with IEPs. And that also extends to all of our multilingual learners. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, if there's additional questions on that, we'll follow up after the hearing. Moving along, uh, does anyone from the DOE have data? How many schools do not currently have um, a full-time nurse? Not buildings, but schools. Deputy Chancellor Robinson, can you speak to the, the nurse staffing situation? Yes, thank you so much for that very important question about our nurses. Um, the model for the nurses is to ensure that every school has a full-time nurse that's report every building, excuse me. Um, we would have to get back to you on the number of schools without a nurse, but every single school building is covered by having a nurse in place. We engage in this work in partnership with the Department of Health and Health and Hospitals, and it has been a successful model. Um, to ensure full coverage. This is the first time we've ever had every single school building um, providing supports for every school across the city um, in this manner. So we look forward to continuing with our partnerships with the Department of Health and Health and Hospitals moving into the 21-22 school year. And we can absolutely circle back with that information. Yeah, and, and Deputy Chancellor, I, I, listen, I know I know that you get it, and I know that we're, we're, we're on the same team here. I just, what I would stress is that we, we need to push for a nurse in every school, not just building, because there are school campuses that might have four or five schools in it. Um, and if one of the schools, let's say, has a child who doesn't feel well, many times they ask the nurse to stay with the child until the parent can come pick them up. But that means, you know, again, the entire other building campus does not have access to nurse during these times. And also we're still in a pandemic. And I want to make it clear that this is not over. We still have work to do. And even beyond a pandemic, our school should have nurses. There's money for us to get this done. Um, and it is a priority for us in the council, but every school does have a full-time nurse. And also resolving, just to be clear, for our, uh, our DOHMH nurses who are required to have the same license and credentials as their DOE counterparts, there is still a pay parity issue there, and that has not been forgotten. Um, we need to value our nurses more than ever th these days, not just with words, but, but with actions. And that goes for many of our school personnel, our school food workers, yes. our school cleaners, yes. who have really lifted up. They are the foundation safety net mm -hmm. of our school communities. We need a lot more help and support and resources uh, for, for them. Last question, and then I'll, I'll stop here the uncompensatory services. Um, just wanna make sure, does any of the, of the funding for compensatory services, uh, and I think we've heard a little bit about this, but some, some of them kind of go deeper, I'd appreciate it, uh, support um, universal screenings for dyslexia and other print-based disability, and how much does it actually cost for DOE to implement a universal print-based disability screening in, in our school system? So we'll, we'll start with Dr. Chen and then um, Lindsay, I don't know if you have any details on, so we'll stay with Dr. Chen. <laughs> so as we mentioned earlier, there are screeners and diagnostic tools that will be provided, but, and they also include the ability to identify print-based disabilities. So that is inclusive in what we shared earlier. So, just we're clear, 
every single child will be able to be screened for print-based disability and dyslexia and, and who will actually do that work? There will be universal screeners for all students, but specifically in terms of the diagnostic assessments, that's a deeper, once the screeners are done, it will um, be able to indicate if students need additional specific screeners that would then identify any print-based disabilities. And Dr. Chen, last thing you had mentioned earlier, my previous question, just wanna make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, we, we are requesting that we actually purchase the evidence-based curricula and training to go along with it to provide the intervention services required to address the needs of our children with print-based disabilities. Is that something that, you're, that the DOE is, is now seriously considering? Yes, the DOE absolutely has always seriously considered that, but now are able to actually resource it. And that is both for students uh, with IEPs and without. Yeah, uh, very important. Okay, with that, I, I will uh, turn it back to the chair and I thank the chancellor and, and her team for the great partnership and uh, really, really appreciate this chance for getting it. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank you for your leadership during this very trying time. Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to follow up, Chancellor. You had said you're going to be intentional about reducing class size. So are we talking about additional funding and moving toward that goal? Is that what we're going to be looking forward to doing as we go through the negotiation process? Well, I will say, thanks to this council, we don't have to look for the funding because you've put it in our hands. And so when I say I'm intentional, it will be intentional about ensuring that the resources that we are putting into schools is to fund more staff members, which is that what, what that 100% fair student funding allows us to do, which will then allow us to work on reducing class size. Okay, but in my conversation with the mayor, mm -hmm. the mayor did said that he would uh, be open to mm -hmm. adding additional funding above and beyond what class, what fair student funding would uh, provide. We, we're happy to, you know, you, you, ne you all have never made the financial operations people happier in this system. And we are always happy to talk about more funding for our schools, particularly around, as we come out of this pandemic, class size reduction um, to address all of the questions that came up, particularly around academic recovery, around social emotional supports is gonna be critically important. And my dogs are very upset unless we get class size funding. I, 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 heard, I also heard your dog's question and tell your dog I'm working on it for them as well. Oh, okay. All right. They want to be small. <laughs> they are. We, will, we, will, we recognize the dogs. Oh, okay. Yeah. They have questions from Chair Rosenthal. And then we're going, that'll be it for the, this portion. I promise. I'm Chair sorry. Rosenthal. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Chancellor, I look forward to meeting you. You're a dream, and I really appreciate all your work. Um, very, very impressive. I just wanted to double down on um, the the Rise program, mm -hmm. and you know, just sort of wonder, uh, you know, in in thinking about the Rise program. And, and the mayor's interest in, in signing the legislation about um, private employees being able to opt into uh, the city's pension plan, just that, you know, the RISE program is the answer for uh, economic equality. It's among the answers. And I hope you'll uh, seriously, you know, it's one of those things where it's something little on the fringes, but it has such a big outsized impact. Um, so I just wanted to weigh in about the importance of that. Um, the second question, just following up um, on the uh, budget for summer rising, do you uh, show, show that in the budget? Do you, in, in the executive, Budget? Is there a line? Is there a way we can find the funding for it? Uh, Lindsay, I, I, I am not sure, but I'm going to ask Lindsay to talk about it. Thank, thank you. you for thank you for that. 
Thank you for that question, Council Member Rosenthal. So there's not a specific line item in the executive budget, partly because the executive budget was released, as you know, in um, at the end of April, when we were still finalizing the budget allocations for uh, the summer rising program. We are spending um, just in the interest of transparency and I apologize apologize, I didn't say this before when Chair Trigger asked the same question, we are spending $40 million on the Summer Rising program from our stimulus package. Um, and we can um, ask OMB to reflect that more clearly in our budget now, if that would be helpful for your purposes. But we are spending significant new resources. Um, in addition to stimulus funding, like I said before, we are using existing resources like Title I and Title IV. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then lastly, uh, just to double down on Councilmember uh, Drum's question about reducing class size, um, could you just say again, would the money for to reduce class size come out of fair student funding? Or will there be a separate allocation for hiring teachers to lower class size? And I left this question at to the end on purpose because I think it segues right into uh, the school construction authority and the need for more um, classrooms if we're gonna be able to really reduce class size. Definitely does, great, great segue. Um, yes to FAIR student funding, the increase getting all of our schools to 100% will absolutely support class size reductions, but we are never ever going to say, stop advocating for more and to go above and beyond that. Well, wait, that's an important differentiation. And I see Chair Traeger wants to jump in. I'm happy to mm -hmm. turn it over to him. No, I, I just want to add, because uh, and Chair Rosenthal, thank you for always centering like the most critical needs of our school communities. We really, really appreciate you. You've been a champion on BNT as well. But I don't want to overlook an existing structure that schools have already that mm -hmm. I was on when I was a teacher. I was on my school school leadership team, yes. SLT. So when people talk about planning and so forth, yes. there are pre-existing structures within schools that do this work day in and day out. And they advance what's called a CEP, yep. comprehensive, comprehensive Education Plan. They set goals each year. So I appreciate the, the SAM with, with the resources, but there are folks doing this work day in and day out within the school community. And I just wanna give them a shout out. Uh, Thank sorry. you, Traeger. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you put your teacher hat on real quick and SLT member hat back on. I'm sure the school community appreciates it. All right, so with that in mind and with the segue to School Construction Authority, are you contemplating, you know, do you think of those things hand in hand? So I'm, I'm glad our Deputy Chancellor Goldmark cut on her camera at the precise moment. We, we mm -hmm. you know, they are hand in hand, but they also, we also are resourced to do a different thing than we've ever been resourced to do in the past. And so, you know, I think creating more seats across our city is a part of the conversation, but it's not the only part of the conversation. But Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. I'm expired. Does that mean I'm done? <laughs> Why don't you jump uh, on here? <laughs> I, like, I no. think you can answer and shares, I promise not a follow up question and don't take advantage of me, Ms. Goldmark, with that. <laughs> but if you could give a comprehensive answer to that question, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, so I was going to, uh, we're about to have the whole capital hearing. Um, so as the Chancellor said, there are many paths um, to addressing our capital needs, including uh, new classrooms and smaller classes. We are uh, working on the 53,000 new seats that are in this capital plan. We have uh, a number of building enhancement projects. We also have uh, a new funding stream for innovation uh, and uh, inclusion. We have a new funding stream for District 75 seats, which is a major need in the system. So there are lots of ways we're uh, addressing the, the many uh, challenges we have on the capital end. Um, I don't wanna step on uh, President Kubota's toes too much with all of what we'll be talking about, um, but we do have the largest capital plan that we've ever had. And we have been making progress over the last 10 years um, on our capacity overall, which is a major, major driver um, in terms of the 
uh, other things that we can do. We've been working with schools on how we can have campus planning. This is something that Kevin Moran has been leading um, so that we are taking a look at how we're using our buildings. Many buildings that have co-locations in them haven't been revisited since the co-locations and sometimes the way we use the space isn't optimal for students. So all of the buildings that we currently have, all 1400, are also up for us to take a look at what we can do to serve children better in, in, uh, in the spaces. Not all at once though, sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know what, let's, uh, Deputy, Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, let's stop here. I have, do have follow-ups about uh, class size reduction, but let me um, formally start the part of the uh, hearing regarding school construction authority. So if, if that's okay with Chair Trader. Yeah, okay, good. All right, good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's sixth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We just heard from the Department of Education on the expense budget, and we will now be joined by the School Construction Authority. We are joined by the Committee on Education, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Mark Traeger, and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. I just want to check to see if we have other members who have joined us. Yes, uh, we have Councilmember Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Ayala, Brooks Powers, Dinowitz, Gibson, Gradenchik. Koslowitz, Lewis, Riley, Rose, and Minority Leader Matteo. Uh, in the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but I'd like to turn it over to Chair Traeger and Chair Rosenthal for their statements. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair Drum. I, I'll be I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to make sure that we just kind of. You know, as Chair Drum mentioned, just get right right to highlighting our critical priorities in the capital budget. Um, certainly, uh, the pandemic has made it abundantly clear how important uh, devices uh, and also internet, in, adequate internet bandwidth is to the success of every one of our students. Uh, to support this, the council called on an investment of $270 million over the next three years to fund additional uh, devices and replacement devices, in addition to any type of additional support uh, to uh, have adequate internet bandwidth and capacity for our school communities. Uh, we also called upon the administration to expand the expansion of the AC initiative, which we adv advocated for to include in also non-classroom spaces. You know, talk about our school food workers. They work in kitchens that are very hot, not safe, and they do incredible work. We need to honor them more, more, than, more than just words and tweets, but with actual resources and, and, and respect. And we also called for a doubling of the, the previously secured $750 million for accessibility the council secured to further expand accessibility of our schools. Lastly, to further the goals set forth in the council's Green New Deal for New York City, we asked for an annual investment of $80 million to increase installations of solar panels on schools. And I'll turn it back over now to our great chair uh, of, our, of our capital, uh, Chair Rosenthal. All good, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, but I think you said it all and I'm look forward, looking forward to the hearing. Thank you so much again, Chairs. Hey, I guess we're going to turn it over now to council who will swear in the witnesses and, uh, and then we'll proceed. Thank you, Chair. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I'm counsel to the New York City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you'll need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will now administer the affirmation to the, affirma to the administration witnesses, including those available from DOE for Q&A. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? President and CEO Nina Kabuda? I do. Thank you. Deputy Chancellor Karen Goldmark. She needs to be unmuted. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Lauren Siciliano. I do. Thank you. 
Mr. Scott Strickland. Needs to be unmuted. Thank you. Mr. John Shea. I do. Thank you. Mr. Thomas Teratako. I do. Thank you. And Ms. Elizabeth Williams. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kabuda, you may begin when ready. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chairs Drum and Trader uh, and Rosenthal, uh, as well as members of the Finance and Education Committees. My name is Nina Kubota, and I am President and CEO of the New York City School Construction Authority. It's my pleasure to join you today. I'm joined by Karen Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor of the Division of School Planning and Development. We are pleased to be here today to discuss the February 2021 proposed amendment to the current fiscal year 2020 to 2024 five-year capital plan. Since 2014, the SCA has created 51,540 new seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding and increase diversity, including 10,973 seats as part of the mayor's pre-K and 3K for all initiatives. We will continue to create seats in areas of current overcrowded and projected enrollment growth. In fact, we are currently in process on 20,676 of the 57,000 seats in the plan with another 5,500 seats in the pipeline. We are nearly halfway there only two years into the plan. And in spite of the challenges we face during the current COVID-19 pandemic, we will be opening eight new buildings and additions, as well as three 3K centers for the start of the 2021-2022 school year. Our success is due in no small part because of the partnerships we have built across the city, especially with the city council and the tireless dedication of the staff at the School Construction Authority, who work to provide state-of-the-art schools for, the, for New York City's public school students. We are deeply appreciative of your strong support and generous funding of our schools. We are all working towards the same goals to ensure our children have the best environments in which to learn. So far in this plan, we have received over $800 million allocated by the city council, borough presidents and other mayoral council sources. And again, thank you for your ongoing support. The proposed FY 2020 to 2024 five-year capital plan represents the administration's continued commitment to equity and excellence for all students and builds on the foundation that we have developed with the previous fiscal year 2015 to 2019 capital plan. Since the current fiscal year 2020 to 2024 plan was adopted, the plan has grown from 17 billion to 19.3 billion, an increase of 2.3 billion. At 19.3 billion, this is our largest ever capital plan. Here are a few highlights of our February 2021 proposed amendment to the capital plan. $7.8 billion for over 57,000 new seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding. Over 1 billion for technology enhancements. 750 million to make 50% of elementary school buildings partially or fully accessible and one third of all buildings fully accessible. 589 million in support of the 3K and Pre-K for All initiatives, 276 million for electrical work to support air conditioning in all classrooms by the end of 2021, and 84 million for improved ventilation. The February 2021 proposed amendment to the fiscal year 2020 to 2024 plan has funding allocated in three overarching categories. Our capacity program totaling 8.92 billion, the capital investments category with 6.72 uh, billion allocated for work in existing buildings, and finally our mandated programs at 3.63 billion. The proposed amendment for the FY20 to 24 capital plan includes 8.9 billion for the capacity program, which consists of five categories: new capacity, 3K and pre-kindergarten early education 
class size reduction, facility replacement program, and capacity to remove, to remove transportable classroom units. Of the 8.9 billion is allocated to capacity, 7.8 billion will fund over 57,000 new seats in an estimated 93 buildings and will help us alle alleviate uh, existing overcrowding and respond to ongoing pockets of growth in certain neighborhoods. In addition, we have secured opportunities to include new public school facilities across the city within several major predominantly residential developments uh, projects undertaken by private developers in areas of projected or existing overcrowding. Also included in our capacity program is 589 million for the city's 3K and pre-K for all initiatives. In addition, 140 million has been allocated to the class size reduction program. This funding allows us to make significant strides towards reducing class size citywide and further promotes quality and equity in our schools by addressing pockets of overcrowding through targeted investments. 180 million is allocated for the capacity to remove TCU's program, which will allow for the construction of needed capacity where necessary in order to remove the remaining TCUs. Lastly, 217 million will fund the facilities replacement program for schools that must be relocated during this plan. Funds in this category cover the cost to construct a new building or to build out a new leased location. While creating seats is a key component of what we do, the capital investment portion of the plan allows us to upgrade and make repairs to our existing facilities. As a reminder, 200 of our buildings are over 100 years old and the majority of our buildings are over 50 years old. The plan directs a total of 6.72 billion for capital investments in two main categories. 3.11 billion for the capital improvement program which includes building repairs and necessary capital repairs, such as roof and facade work, structural repairs, and safeguarding our buildings against water infiltration. And 2.8 billion for school enhancement projects, which funds the realignment of existing facilities to better suit instructional needs, bathroom upgrades, science labs, the, the mayor's universal physical education initiative, accessibility, and other necessary improvements. Every year we make progress on moving TCUs in use across the five boroughs. This plan dedicates 230 million in both CIP and capacity dollars for the ongoing removal of these units. To date, we have removed 231 of the original 354 TCUs. Of the 123 remaining TCUs, we have plans in process to remove another 74 and we are developing plans to remove the final 49. Other highlights in our capital investment category include 200 million for safety and security, 119 for specialty room upgrades, 100 million for uh, athletic field upgrades, and 50 million for bathroom upgrades. The mandated programs category with 3.63 billion allocated includes approximately 650 million for boiler conversions in buildings currently using number four oil. The remaining funds are assigned to cover other required costs, including code and local law compliance, the SCA's wrap-up insurance, and completion of projects from the prior plan. Since we appeared before the Education Committee in March, the mayor has announced additional and significant investment in our city's youngest learners. $815 million has been added in the recent executive budget, which includes the expansion of 3K for All to every school district in the city, as well as 120 million to support the transfer of early learn to the DOE's portfolio. We are working hand in hand with our, our partners at DOE's Department of Early Childhood Education to bring those seats online over the coming school years. The mayor has committed to adding up to 16,500 more seats for three year olds. And by this fall, the city will provide approximately 40,000 3K seats across all 32 districts. And I speak for the entire SEA in saying we are incredibly excited to play a significant role in this expansion. Investing in and providing an early start to our youngest students is an important down payment in our next generation of leaders. Public feedback plays a crucial role in our capital planning process. Each year we undertake a public review process with the community education councils, the city council and other elected officials and community groups. 
we offer every CEC in the city the opportunity to conduct a public hearing on the plan, and we have attended hearings at every CEC. As you know, we also partner with individual council members and CEC to identify local needs. Thank you again for your partnership and support. I will now turn it over to Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, who will discuss additional aspects of the plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Kubota. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Drum, uh, Chair Traeger, and Chair Rosenthal, uh, and members of the Committees on Finance and Education. My name is Karen Goldmark, and I'm Deputy Chancellor of School Planning and Development at the New York City Department of Education. Uh, before I begin, I would like to first thank Speaker Johnson uh, and the chairs, Drum, Drager, and Rosenthal, um, and the City Council for your continued leadership throughout this pandemic and for all you've done on behalf of New York City during this time. Not only with respect to education, but uh, certainly with respect to education and with respect to everything. You remain fierce advocates for equity in our school communities, and we're so grateful to have you working with the DOE on how best to serve all the students of New York City. Your insights and supports have been crucial in the midst of this crisis as we pivoted to remote learning in our 1,600 school communities across the city last spring and then reopened school buildings this year. The proposed February 2021 plan continues to demonstrate the administration's commitment to creating uh, a safe and positive learning environment for all students and staff. We're proud to say that in a very short period of time, we made huge strides in closing the digital divide, making critical investments in technology and improving ventilation and accessibility in our school buildings. The pandemic exposed existing inequities in the nation and in our city. And we know these resources and upgrades have been central to moving our school communities forward and advancing our equity and excellence for all agenda. As we look forward to a full reopening in fall, our returning students will be welcomed back to noticeably improved buildings. The plan, that's the capital plan, was approved by the Panel for Educational Policy in April and will be considered for adoption by the City Council as part of the city's budget. As you're aware, we testified before this committee uh, regarding the proposed February amendment in March. While there are no changes uh, from the proposed plan we presented in March to now, I welcome the opportunity uh, to revisit some of the highlights of the plan, particularly since uh, members of the Finance Committee actually did not all participate in that hearing. So just a few highlights with respect to technology. The proposed amendment allocates $1.02 billion for technology. This includes funding uh, for emergency remote learning student devices, increasing bandwidth in school buildings and upgrades to classroom connectivity. Since the start of the pandemic, ensuring that all students have access to remote learning devices has been a major priority uh, of the DOEs of the cities and I will say of the council members and we're so grateful for all of your help with all that effort. We've purchased over 500,000 LTE enabled iPads to support students in need. Prioritizing equity, we started distributing centrally purchased internet enabled devices to our most underserved students. We continue to fill device requests as we receive them from schools to ensure that families have what they need to participate in remote learning. We're grateful that the council's longstanding and continuous investment in technology for our schools made it possible for the DOE to distribute devices to students since the onset of this crisis. I'll just say as an aside, I know if each of you went back and added up and thought through all of the devices and laptop carts that you provided to schools over the years, never knowing that it would be in this moment more essential than ever, I just wanna take a moment and thank you for all, each and every one of those devices that you provided to schools helped make it that that gap of 500,000 was that and not a million. Another anchor of the plan is the $750 million allocation towards improving school-based technology. Since 2015, the DOE has increased our overall internet bandwidth to 240 gigabytes across two major data centers where we used to have just one. And this allows schools to access much faster connectivity. Previously, Embarrassing number here, the DOE had only 14 gigabytes to share across all the schools in New York City. This investment will allow us to upgrade critical equipment like routers, switches, firewalls, and wireless access points in schools. Upgrading also ensures that the equipment has the latest security protections and controls in place. With respect to ventilation, health and safety have been at the center of every single decision 
connected to reopening school buildings. And the science shows that our rigorous, multi-layered approach has made our schools the safest places in New York City. As part of this comprehensive effort, last summer we surveyed the ventilation in every building twice and have conducted extensive repairs in spaces that needed attention. And just a brief pause to thank the School Construction Authority. In addition to all of our internal inspections, the SEA conducted external uh, inspections, giving uh, parents that peace of mind that an external expert looked into the ventilation systems in every building in New York City. Following Federal uh, Center for Disease Control guidance for school operations on air ventilation to reduce the spread of COVID-19, every classroom was inspected by school construction authority-led teams of professional engineers. Repairs and remediation efforts were based directly on those assessments, including fixing windows and fan motors and cleaning air ducts. Out of the 64,550 classrooms in our system, over 99% are safely in use. We also identified and prepared alternative spaces for those schools that needed them. And we have made the clear commitment that any space that does not meet our ventilation standards will not be used. In buildings with central HVAC systems, we replaced existing filter elements with new ones rated at MERV 13. The DOE has also purchased indoor air quality monitors for carbon dioxide testing as CO2 is an indicator of adequate ventilation and 137,000 high efficiency particulate air, also called HEPA purifier units. These purifier units uh, are certified to remove virus sized particles from the air and are being used in all our occupied classrooms, nurses offices and isolation rooms. We will continue to order more equipment as needed. Relatedly, custodian engineers have been key contributors in ensuring that our students and school communities remain healthy and safe. Um, DOE's Division of School Facilities reallocated building cleaning staff to ensure continuous daily touch point and whole building overnight disinfection, disinfection of all occupied school buildings. I have witnessed this myself many times of the workers going through the building cleaning throughout the day. All buildings were provided with electrostatic sprayers to increase efficiency of disinfecting uh, labor tasks, meaning uh, these are units that uh, go on the back and the person can then go through the room and spray the room and disinfect the room very efficiently. In addition, all schools have had sufficient PPE and supplies to ensure safe operation for full in-person learning, which our custodian engineers manage for the entire building. A um, little off script here, just a huge shout out to Kevin Moran and his team who have really uh, shown the strength of DOE operations in ensuring that schools have a continuous supply of PPE that the cleaning protocols are clear and in place. Um, it's been uh, one of the responses that we are most proud of uh, in, with respect to this pandemic. Okay, moving on. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about a new program category in the capital plan. It's called Innovative, Diverse, Equitable and Accessible Spaces. Inspired in part by the council's great advocacy for accessibility and the council's calls um, for innovation, we've created a new category in the capital plan. Because if the past year has taught us anything, it's that teaching and learning can blossom even in non-traditional spaces. And as part of the proposed amendment, we're excited to launch the IDEAS initiative, which stands for Innovative, Diverse, Equitable, Accessible Spaces. This new IDEAS undertaking will foster the creation of dynamic and innovative learning spaces in ways that empower communities, respond to students' voices, encourage new partnerships and advance diversity, integration and inclusion. These efforts will further support the DOE's work to promote equity and excellence by providing access to 21st century learning opportunities to more students across New York City. With respect to accessibility, the proposed February amendment continues to recognize the importance of ensuring access for all students and has emphasized accessibility as a major priority. As part of this administration's equity and excellence for all agenda and as a direct result of support from the council and our community partners, the amendment continues to include $750 million towards the critically important work of making our school buildings more accessible. And I'll just remind uh, this group that this $750 million represents a huge increase over the prior capital plan, which had $150 million in it due um, in large, large part due to the advocacy of the council. Um, 
We greatly appreciate the council support in this area. Our teams are meeting with students, families, and community partners to ensure that we truly understand the needs of students and families and can make the necessary changes as quickly as possible. To drive this work forward, we established offices of accessibility planning within the DOE's Division of Space Management and School Facilities, as well as at SCA. Working together, DOE and SCA have planned and approved 41 new accessibility projects in our historically underserved districts. We're committed to making a third of the buildings in every district fully accessible by 2024, and at least 50% of our buildings housing elementary school grades fully or partially accessible by 2024. And I'm pleased to report that we are well on track for that goal. And a quick shout out here to Tom Tarocco, who has um, carried this work through thin times and through thick and is driving uh, really the biggest upgrade in accessibility that the system uh, has ever seen. In a system this big, there will always be more work to be done. We'll continue to update our capital plan in response to changing conditions and needs from our school communities, and we will seek your input in that process, as always. We're thankful again for your collaboration and generous support of capital projects now more than ever. Our students have been able to expand and improve their educational experience because of these efforts, and we look forward to seeing our future students benefit as well. We're proud that we were the only large school district in the country to safely reopen school buildings in the fall for in-person instruction and look forward to welcoming all families back this coming school year. It will be a time of renewal in spaces that will never be the same as they were before last March. The pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges to all of us, but together we have stepped up and responded in extraordinary ways on behalf of our students and families that we can be proud of. Thank you again so much for allowing us to testify today and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. Uh, let me start by talking a little bit about the capital plan. The DOE executive capital plan included no funding uh, for any capacity work from fiscal 25 and beyond. Can you provide an explanation as to why no funding was added for capacity projects and uh, do any of these projects in the SCA capital plan have timelines that go into uh, fiscal 25 or beyond? So I, I think there's um, sort of a two part answer to that. One is that, um, you know, we work in a five year fixed uh, capital plan. So, and we work very well with OMB as we, enter into a new capital plan cycle, uh, very different from the city's kind of rolling plan. Um, so, so, you know, I just want to address the first point, which is we will work with OMB as we get closer to the next capital plan cycle of the FY 25 to 29. Um, that said, yes, there are, there are costs that we anticipate will go into that next capital plan cycle as we have in this plan. Uh, where we tag it under the prior plan completion costs. Um, we don't know what that will, what those costs are right now, since we're just, you know, ending the second year uh, of the capital plan. Um, but as we get further into the capital plan, we will know the costs uh, that will hit the FY 25 to 29 cycle. Uh, but to your point, there are if there are projects that are opening, especially capacity projects that are opening in the 25 or beyond, we certainly will expect that there will be costs associated with that that would uh, affect the next capital plan cycle. So do you now know if there are projects that will go beyond 25? Um, I do believe that there are a few capacity projects that are underway under, you know, in design that will open in, uh, in that later part. So yes, we do know some. And if so I can go in here, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I just am still confused as to why we can't get it included into the 10 year plan. I, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if this, most of the city is on a 10 year plan, why, why we can't get that from SCA? I, I was just going to say our enabling le legislation actually prescribes yeah. that we do it in a five-year fixed cycle. So, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, which is why we, we cannot say we don't have that rolling plan. We don't have a 10-year plan. 
again, just because of our enabling legislation. I will just note, uh, Chair Drum, that each capital plan includes uh, a category called prior plan completion, which essentially includes those projects that roll. Um, so this is how we've addressed this, uh, the difference between the city's 10-year capital plan and, and the SEA's statutorily required five-year capital plan, which by the way, requires your, not you, the person, but your approval as the city council and the panel for educational policy and a presentation to each CEC. So we actually can't have a plan that hasn't gone through each of the public engagement steps. So we are constrained in our ability to uh, have a plan in place beyond um, our process as a uh, detail. Uh, but, you, but you do provide timelines to OMB, right? Beyond 25? Uh, beyond the five years? Florida, feel free to jump in. What we have is we have uh, essentially plans for each project as we move forward. And so we know which projects are slated not to be done by, by uh, 2025. Do you know that now? I don't think that's clear two years into the plan, but please, President Kubota. Uh, correct, that, that is not, it, not uh, definitive in which projects will be awarded uh, and uh, when they will complete. So, and, and that said, I just want to take a step back and, you know, every year we, we do uh, discuss with OMB our plans and every year we, we, we are part of that. We do look at the 10 year uh, funding. And it, just as an example, we published this capital plan, uh, the first draft of this capital plan in November of 2018. Um, and months leading up to that, uh, you know, I think there was very little, maybe a $1.8 billion for each of the, the subsequent years uh, uh, of this plan. And when we published, before we published, we discussed it with OMB. And instead of having a about eight to $10 billion plan, we, with OMB, came up with the $17 billion. So it's, it, it's not to say that what you see in the out years is what's going to be the funding uh, when it becomes a reality uh, in, in fiscal year 25. Get it? I, I, I see that, you know, but, you know, that there has to be some type of an estimate moving forward, but to just see zeros in the out years is concerning to us in the council. I'm going to take it up further with OMB uh, at, the, at the final hearing, the last day of hearings that we'll, when they come in, uh, or, uh, and we'll discuss it further then. Um, let me just go to uh, something on Universal 3K. The executive budget funds 785 million for 6,451 seats at the 3K programs to support the extension of Universal 3K. So what is the SCA's timeline to have all seats online and how many new sites will be built or leased with this new funding? So currently we're going through that site evaluation uh, process, um, you know, working very hard with uh, early childhood to identify uh, the, the, the locations. Um, that said, each site is going to be different in, in its composition. Uh, we do try to have at least uh, eight, about eight classrooms per site. Um, so that said, I guess that, that if we just do the math, it's about 80 sites. But again, that's, that's in theory. Um, I will say that we, you know, since this was announced, we've been working very closely with DOE and have, of the 6,400 seats, have really identified at least about a third uh, that, that we are proceeding into the next steps, meaning into design with. Um, our goal, our internal goal, is to try to get as many seats online for September 2022. There will, will be instances that a project is larger or more complex that would push it to 2023, but internally our goal is September 2022. And so one of my concerns is um, where and how those seats are going to be allocated, uh, which districts, obviously, but also in districts that are overcrowded, will we see push into schools that are already overcrowded or will there be new construction of early childhood sites 
or uh, an agreement with uh, uh, CBOs. Can you explain that a little further to us? Karen, is that okay if we turn it over to yeah. uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, I was just gonna mm -hmm. offer that we can have uh, Ms. Williams from DECE address this question. Sure, thanks, am I, am I off mute? Okay, yes, great, thanks, thanks, Deputy Chair. And Ms. Williams, Morgan. were you sworn in, I'm sorry. I was, thank you, Joe. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> thank, thanks for having me here. Yeah, so, uh, to, to your point, pre-K and 3K are going to be a mixed delivery model. And so we are, we are going to pursue all the avenues that we currently have pre-K and 3K seats. And that really does include a, a strong emphasis on our community-based partners, our NYSEECs. Um, but, but obviously, we, we have places where we know we don't have enough seats. And so that, those are the places that we're really targeting with SCA. Um, to build out more 3K capacity. They already helped us out in, in meeting the promise of universal pre-K. So we are, we are really refining like where those places are with them. And, and as President Kubota said, they've already done a great job in, in looking in those areas. You know, we, we have those areas that we know are top of mind for us, um, but we're also gonna get a lot of information from the family application that's open now in terms of really what parents are excited about 3K, who, who are we, you know, hoping to have a seat for. And as we said, fall of 2023 is still our goal to have a seat for every family who wants one. So let's just take a district like District 24, sure. where I believe in the last plan, most of those seats were taken and redistributed to other districts. Um, are the seats that you're talking about above and beyond those seats? Um, or where, how do you plan on on adding extra seats in 24 or let's say even 30 or even district 20. And sure, and Chair Drum, could you explain a little bit about what you mean by redistributed to other districts? I'm... I believe that in the last plan, the seats that were originally 4,900 and something seats that were originally allocated to district 24 were removed from the, uh, from the plan and, and then redistributed throughout the city. Um, and, and that's what concerns me is that if there's no new seat construction there, where are you going to put these UPKs? And District 24, as you know, is probably still within the top three. I, that's why I mentioned 24, 30 and, uh, and District 20, top three most overcrowded districts. And, and not even just in terms of districts, but the sub districts. And I'm glad that you sure. mentioned a little bit about like, you know, targeting it. it but my concern is in those districts, what are we gonna see there? Yeah, I, I may ask President Kubota to speak to the redistribution, but yeah, I think communities like Corona, East Elmhurst are high on our list and we are, we are trying to get seats in those areas for sure, either in our community-based partners or, or working with SCA. We also have the Hall of Science that we're hoping to be able to add 3K in as well when that opens. So yeah, those, these, are, these are areas that are high on our list for making sure we have enough seats for every family. I'll just, I'd like to add, uh, thank you. So and just, for, just, just for a point of clarification, yep. isn't Hall of Science uh, UPK, not 3K? We're, we are hoping that we'll be able to add 3K there if okay. capacity allows. Correct. Okay. Because uh, we, as you know, you were deeply involved in this, the, the uh, challenge of citing UPK, a pre-K in District 24 was a massive one that took a massive effort on the part of School Construction Authority, lots of partnership with the community-based organizations that provide the NYSEEC uh, seats and developing new options, innovative options like the Hall of Science. Um, that said, we know that with 3K, we will face challenges in some of the same areas where we had uh, challenges with pre-K. However, a couple of things working in our favor. One is that we learned a lot from those experiences. Uh, two is that we actually have some capacity in some of those parts of the city where we had such great challenges because basically we were taking everything we could get. <laughs> we now actually have some options um, and some ways to expand access. So uh, I do not expect that this will be a, an exact repeat of the challenges that we had with finding uh, sites for, for pre-K as we expand. What I will say is that uh, the partnership with mem individual members of the council to find sites, to find community-based providers, to come up with innovative ideas has been uh, an essential way that we have been able to get to the point we have with pre-K. Um, mm. And we expect that partnership will also be necessary to help us get there with 3K. 
and I apologize. There's apparently massive construction going on um, and I'm gonna step away for one moment to get a headset so that I'm not uh, giving everyone the sound of a buzzsaw during this hearing. <laughs> I will still be listening. I just want everyone to know what I'm doing. Okay. I think you may be happier once I have the headset in and you don't hear uh, the buzzsaw behind me. I'm not hearing it too much, but anyway. Oh, okay, perfect. great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, President Capota, um, Capota, can you address the, the loss of the seats in District 24 for me? So I, I think, you know, over, over the past 10, 15 years, we've certainly built many, many seats, uh, thousands of seats in District 24, but it doesn't diminish what you're saying. We still have a seat need there of, I think about 1100 seats. District 30, you also pointed out another 3000 seats there. Um, district 20 is another one, uh, not, not obviously in your district, but 3,500 seats. Uh, and, and of those, we've already started to, to cite and to go into design with a lot. Uh, district 24, I think about 500 are already seated. District 30, 15 of the, of the 3,000. That said, I think with 3K, it's, it, it's, it's, we were afraid initially that it would be competition with new capacity. But we're finding not because, uh, you know, in discussion with early childhood, with this five to 10, C, uh, 10 um, classroom model, we are able to use smaller facilities uh, or smaller, you know, properties than we would for new capacity. So um, that's allowing us, and which is why we have been successful in the past few weeks to cite so many uh, seats because we it's not in direct competition with the new capacity. So uh, in terms of, of, of citing, I don't think we're taking away from new capacity versus 3K. So that's sort of the, the good news. In terms of redistribution, I, I, you know, I will defer to DOE in terms of how they're doing it, but we, we, we in our real estate department are making the distinction between the two different types and we've been successful in both so far. There's so much more to discuss on this, and I don't want to just belabor the point, but I think that in many ways, you've helped me make the argument for reduction in class sizes by arguing that uh, small classes uh, make a difference, and that even with the UPK and the 3K, it helps in terms of citing places to put these classrooms. So I look forward to continuing to work with you on this, and also Deputy Chancellor, for your help in getting the $250 million for class size reduction. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our co-chair, Mark Traeger. Th thank you, Chair Drummond. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmar, uh, President Kubota. Thank you for the entire, uh, I see the, the facilities team. We appreciate uh, everyone's partnership. Uh, just a quick question, Deputy Chancellor, since you oversee planning, uh, you oversee facilities, um, from your vantage point right now, are our are, are schools uh, ready uh, in terms of the maintenance, in terms of everything beyond the instructional piece? Are they ready to fully reopen, to welcome back every single child in light of the guidance that's been revised uh, for uh, both summer and of course the fall, which is with, on, on many, many parents and school communities minds? Uh, thank you so much, Chair Traeger. So I just, I, unfortunately, I need to start by giving credit where credit is due. I would love, love to take a victory lap on uh, managing the facilities because uh, it's been a banner year for that. But to be fair to my wonderful colleagues, that is, that's Kevin Moran, uh, uh, that's John Shea. I wish that I could say uh, I had done all of this, but uh, I just want to be fair. Uh, no, no, I, I said you oversee. Uh, but, I, I yes. know, but I don't oversee it. But that's what I'm trying to be clear about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim Moran and I are uh, co-equal colleagues, and we have a wonderful uh, working uh, partnership. He reports to the chancellor, as do I. I just wanted to make well, sure. I, I, do I appreciate the Kevin. He I, does the actual managing of the buildings day to day along with John Shea. Um, and I, but we are all one team uh, and absolutely we are proud of each other's work as well as uh, of our own. And I'm thrilled with the work that's happened uh, as a parent, as well uh, uh, as a DOE official. So our buildings are all open. Our buildings are, they are actually the safest place to be in New York City. Um, and at this point with the guidance, 
being where it is, we are conducting an analysis. It looks to us like vast, vast, vast majority of schools in New York City can accommodate all their students. Uh, we are working very hard to get that number to be 100% under the current guidance, understanding that that guidance can change at any time. Um, but it will be a very rare exception that a building won't be able to accommodate its students. And with respect to the safety, we are ready to go. Uh, and Kevin or John, if you'd like to add anything, please feel free. Oh, I think John Shea needs to be unmuted. Yep, I, they got me. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the Deputy Chancellor uh, for the intro. Uh, I agree 100% that I think uh, we have discussed this with the council at the last hearing about our plan to get open for this year. So I won't get into that, but uh, I will reiterate the fact that all of our schools are open. They have been open uh, for many months now. We had a winter ventilation plan, which we successfully navigated. And we have a summer ventilation plan, which we are successfully navigating now and will continue to I point out that we've also uh, are using this opportunity to make enhancements to the systems that we already have to continue the conversations of the partnership with the SCA, with this administration, and with the council and with our labor partners to uh, get what we need to continue to make the repairs that we need and uh, also very importantly to provide the information and the public transparency for what we're doing. Uh, the tool that we have for the ventilation status is a public document that we're in the process of updating so that it's still time now. Uh, custodians and our custodian engineers are, are a very valued partner here in this uh, and have been on the front lines and our first line of defense for everything, whether it's cleaning or ventilation that happens in our buildings. Uh, they have the ability to go in and, and update uh, the information that's there so that people can actually see what's going on in their school buildings. So we're very comfortable with what we've done. We're very, very comfortable about where we're going and we're happy that uh, the council has continued to, to focus on this and support us in those efforts. And, and so, I reiterate that we have very, very low positivity rate in schools. 0.22%, it's really, uh, the, again, just the safest place to be in New York City is in New York City school buildings. Right, and, and just to, for clarification, um, and, and yes, I wanna begin by again giving a shout out to our school cleaners, our custodians, facility staff for, for doing really incredible work, being under-resourced quite frankly, historically as well, which we need to, to increase support on that front. But the, the, the issue is, is that when you say the buildings are open now, and I, I understand that, the majority of our school families are still in remote. The question is for fall, are we preparing for everyone to come back and will we be able to be in compliance with guidance, health recommendations from public health experts? Are we preparing for everyone to be in school, in person, in the fall or deputy transfer? Um, can you shed light on the discussions or deliberations with regards to the remote option from, 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 a, from your standpoint, where does our preparation effort stand for every child coming back to work, uh, to school, I'm sorry, in the fall? So if any of us have learned anything over the last 16 months, it's been that unpredictable things will happen. Um, but I will say what we are doing now is we are planning for full in-person return with respect to our building capacity. And again, to your question, almost all the buildings in New York City can accommodate all of the children under the current guidance. And for the small number of buildings where we have a capacity challenge, we're working with each and every one of those buildings to develop a plan that will allow us to bring all of the children back. So I can't tell you exactly what the plan is for each of the schools that have a challenge. I can tell you that the number of schools that have a challenge is in the range of 10% of the schools. It's a very small number of schools that have an actual challenge with bringing all of their children who are enrolled back. Um, so that is not just the families who are currently attending, but also the families who for this year have chosen remote. You'll see many, many states um, are announcing that, ev that they're, everyone is coming back full time. We're working to make sure that we can keep that promise to families for all of the buildings and for the small number of buildings where there's a challenge, we're working through each one, as I've just said. Um, and one of the many learnings we've had this year is that 
there is a whole network of community organizations who can help us with this question. There are, there are all kinds of options we can mobilize, particularly when the numbers are relatively speaking very small. So even for those small number of schools that have a challenge, most of them uh, are very close to being able to accommodate all of their students. And so with some creative problem solving, some uh, ally organizations will be able to figure it out. And that's what we're working through now. But from a so planning goal, perspective, our goal is to, is to have, our goal is for every family to come back in person. But from a planning perspective, are, 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 can you shed light on where the DOE stands with regards to a remote option for the fall? Uh, well, so obviously, the other lesson from the last sixteen months is that you always need to plan for multiple contingencies. Um, so we are in those discussions. That's not only a, a capital question, but we certainly are working on what, uh, you know, if something, currently everything is trending in a positive direction in terms of what we'll be able to do in the fall. If something were to arise, would we have uh, a course back to what I will call the bad old days? Um, Obviously, we've learned a tremendous amount over the last 16 months about the kind of responses that we need to be able to mount. Um, we are very hopeful that the trends will continue in a positive direction and that we won't need to employ emergency measures as we have this year. I mean, I will say um, over the last 16 months, we've done, you know, we, we set up emergency child care in six days. We pivoted to remote learning in four days. We uh, didn't do a lot of planning in many cases. We had little opportunity to do that in some cases. And we are now in a position where we can think through, not on the timeline we'd like, not in the normal time frame for a normal year, but in a time frame that allows us a little bit uh, of room. Um, but we, uh, we are making progress on that. And Lauren Siciliano, if you'd like to jump in, please feel free. Thank you, Karen. Um, I would just uh, add uh, to build on what Karen shared that, um, you know, in, in terms of our planning right now, we wanna give every student the option to come back into school buildings five days a week starting this fall. And that's why from a capacity planning perspective, we're doing everything that Karen outlined. Um, and it just, I can't, I can't say enough about the hard work of, of our, our staff, our students, and all of New Yorkers, quite frankly, to, to be able to um, put us in a place where we are, are, are even planning uh, for this. Um, but we also know that this is uh, an extraordinarily deeply personal decision for families. Uh, the Chancellor talked about in the earlier hearing that she is doing town halls and engaging with families across the city. Um, and so we'll have more information to sh share soon on specific plans for the fall. Um, but just really wanted to um, share a huge thank you to everyone who has made just this, this planning moment possible because it seemed uh, uh, very far a stretch away not too long ago. Right. I, what I would just add um, is that I, I, I get all that. Um, it just I, I'm trying to be mindful of our school administrators who are the ones responsible to operationalize everything that we're talking about right now. And uh, I just continue to hear from them that they're kind of still in the dark about, you know, summer and fall. Um, and they, you know, nor under normal circumstances, principals are planning for summer and fall, even like January, February. They're already thinking ahead. Um, they can't do that. Um, they're still even waiting for their FSF numbers, quite frankly. I just mentioned in the expense budget hearing about waiting to lift the freeze on certain positions. Um, it's hard for them to plan when they don't really have information and guidance. So if, and by the way, I just wanna be clear from my vantage point, um, I do support a remote option. The only difference is it should not be uh, the responsibility of the individual school to deal with it anymore. It should be handled by central because principals need to have full energy and attention and time dedicated to operationalizing plans for in-person in the fall. Deputy Chancellor, is that something under consideration? Can you speak to that? Uh, so the a couple of things to note. One, absolutely, not only am I sympathetic, we recognize the challenge that school principals have been through. And when we talk about uh, what the, the extraordinary achievements of 
uh, staff in the DOE over this year, principals have not only gone above and beyond, which they do in a normal year, it has been incredible what they have done and what they've been through. Um, and uh, they are they are a group, we, candidly, our frequent conversation at the DOE is that we want the principals to have a real break this summer, a real rest, because they have been going nonstop for 16 months and doing whatever they need to do to serve students under the most adverse conditions. Um, with respect to planning, I recognize that we're not on the calendar we like to be on. I think that is still unavoidable this year. Obviously, we've had in the last 10 days several changes, including vaccine availability for uh, children 12 to 15, that really, really changed the landscape. Uh, and so, and the CDC's guidelines uh, have been changing <laughs> frequently uh, over the last 10 days. So part of what makes planning hard this year is that we could plan for the rules as they currently are, and those rules could shift on us tomorrow or in two and a half months. So what our, our job is to tell administrators what we do know, but we can't make up what we don't know. And we don't know exactly what the guidelines are going to be that will be in place for fall. So we're working with the current guidelines. We're working towards every family being able to return to a building in person in the fall. Whether that will be the scenario or not is not something that we know now. What we can do is start giving principals and school teams and SLTs, to your earlier point, the kind of information uh, that we do have and what we do know things will be like. But that's the best we can do. And I understand that it's incredibly frustrating to try to plan in May. Um, I also just have to remind all of us that the <laughs> We, we all want to get back to normal. All of us do. We're still in a transition moment. We're still in a moment where we aren't operating under the normal timelines and we aren't operating yet under the, the prior set of uh, constraints and parameters. And so how we do that has to be as fast as we can for administrators and also as clear as we can. And we hope to be able uh, to give administrators guidance. We also have done uh, a series of planning allocations because we recognize that schools are going to need to do some planning over the summer, which is not the normal time frame, but it is going to be necessary this year. And that's one of the reasons for that allocation that, that we discussed earlier. Um, Deputy Chancellor, last year we were subject to a state executive order that we had to submit reopening plans to the state and get approval. Are we subject to any type of state executive order with regards to reopening plans for the fall? Um, as of now, that is unclear. Okay, uh, so if you can get back to us on that, if you learn more, uh, because last year we were told repeatedly that anything that the, that the city comes up with has to get approval by the state. It's not it's not clear to us if that's still still. I, I know that the the state voted to rescind a lot of the governor's powers. It's not clear to me if this was the one area that is still kind of in a gray area. So if, if NYSID still has, or, or if, if NYSID now has full authority back again, if you can kind of give us clarity on that, it would be much appreciated. Um, and I, I wanna get to uh, just a couple more technical questions on capital and then we'll turn back to, 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 to Chair Rosenthal. Um, with regards to uh, technology, devices, you know, internet bandwidth capacity, um, are we making a commitment that not only, you know, if a school needs to replace devices, that's, that will be provided for them. Also, if there's issues of something re that requires maintenance, usually these maintenance agreements with these companies are very expensive for a school. I know about this because the smart board that was in my school was needed, needed uh, some fixing and it wasn't cheap uh, to get maintenance. Can anyone speak to making sure that the school does not shoulder the burden for, for the replacement of devices and the maintenance agreements. Uh, yes, so I will invite in my colleagues from DIIT. I'll just start by saying, yes, the maintenance agreements are a longstanding point of contention. We were, in the past, we've required schools to purchase maintenance agreements when they purchase devices for precisely the reason you just articulated. We don't want equipment out there that can't be fixed or that then creates an additional hit to the budget. And this, 
leads to some kind of back and forth with schools. Sometimes schools think they can find a cheaper device, but the cheaper device does not have the maintenance contract. Um, broadly speaking, we are engaging in uh, device replacement. So as devices break, we are replacing them. Um, and the overall budget allows for the back end equipment upgrades on a five year cycle. So 20% of the schools will be getting router, firewall, switcher equipment upgrades every year. So I'll stop here and then just invite uh, my colleagues from DIIT if they'd like to add anything to what I've said. Okay, I will take that as a no. Or Scott Strickland, did you want to jump in? Oh, there we go. Uh, okay. No, I think you covered it. And uh, we, we've covered on the, the school-based devices as well as the uh, infrastructure. I think we're good. Okay, uh, just making sure that we're on the same page that if there's any school that has any internet capacity issues, bandwidth issues, that should just, there, there are resources that not from their own budget are available for, for, for that to be addressed. Is that correct? For bandwidth, absolutely. The bandwidth is in that $750 million. Absolutely, that a school should not be paying for its own bandwidth. We have so much more bandwidth than we used to have, more than 10 times uh, the amount we had. I guess oh. that was years ago when I first started this job. Um, absolutely, the bandwidth is covered. With respect to devices, um, you know, schools sometimes have devices and sometimes their own devices. There should be maintenance contracts with each of those devices. And so there should not be a situation where a school has equipment that breaks and they can't get a repair. That's, that is, our system is designed uh, to avoid that problem. And so if a school does have a problem, they should immediately contact DIIT and let us know. Uh, and we'll, it's a matter of getting on the process and fixing it. I, I'll just add again, the equity lens here. Uh, mm -hmm. There are schools with, you know, let's say extra sources of money, private fundraising that uh, get extra bandwidth, extra internet capacity, which allows them to run programs at a faster speed, uh, which does make a difference when you have a certain mm -hmm. amount of time in a class, you can't go, go beyond it. Uh, and then there are schools that have to rely on slower speeds, which really delays and impacts instruction. So uh, bandwidth equity now is, is gonna be an issue for us making sure that they have the bandwidth, but also there's equity in, in the bandwidth. A question about uh, air conditioning ventilation in school kitchens. Can anyone speak to how much money is in the capital plan for uh, air conditioning in school kitchens to really address the working conditions that our school food work, many, many of them are, are subjected to. Can anyone speak to that? President Kubota, I'm gonna invite you back in just because I feel like it's been a long time since I've seen you. Um, and this is something that we have been discussing actually with the council. This has been a consistent point that you have raised. The AC for All initiative did not include common spaces like cafeterias and kitchens and auditoriums. Um, that was a classroom initiative. Um, and we have been discussing the challenge around AC in kitchens. There are obviously numerous challenges with that, including uh, while it's really hot in the kitchens, there's also the challenge of conditioning a space that also has heating elements in it like stoves uh, and range tops. So we do not currently have uh, air conditioning in kitchens as a building uh, upgrade model that we do as a regular matter, um, but we are very aware of the challenges. Uh, and this is definitely something that uh, the unions representing the kitchen workers have been bringing to our attention. We're working through what might some options be, but we don't at this point uh, have a, a building enhancement program that would address that in all of the schools where we have that challenge. Right, that that that's correct. The the, the... 276 million was specifically for classrooms. So again, non um, PA type spaces and not, not kitchens. But uh, we have been hearing uh, for some time, uh, you know, about our food uh, workers and we are continuing to explore sort of longer term uh, 
Chair Traeger, you, you are very aware of the, the complexities with HVAC systems. A lot of these spaces would require a central uh, HVAC system, uh, not just split systems, uh, which is even more complicated than, than a window uh, AC uh, project. That said, we have, and I, and I think John is even shaking his head at, at this point, uh, we have implemented a temporary measure where we are uh, and and it, I don't want to say we because DSF is is doing this and John I see is off mute so he can speak to this but we, where we are uh, installing window ACs uh, in kitchens to at least as a stopgap till we find a long term solution and and John I, I'll turn it to you I think you are aware of this. Uh, sure, thank you, uh, President Kubota. So yes, uh, school facilities in partnership with the Office of Food and Nutritional Services is surveying kitchens to see what kitchens could be good candidates for window installations. We are in the process of doing a number of those now. Uh, we are working with folks to identify funding so that we can expand that uh, and hopefully into the next fiscal year do a whole lot more of those. Uh, so it is in the plan, funding is, is still an issue, but we are actively pursuing that and on working and expanding that program. John, how many school kitchens do you have funding for right now, and how many are needed to get every school kitchen uh, a, a, a air conditioned? Uh, I know that within the past month we've done 10, and I believe we've identified another 10, the number of ones that need it and could use it. Uh, I don't have that in front of me. I, I believe school food was still surveying that information, but we can get that to the council. John, please do, because this is a priority for us. Um, we, we need to do more than just thank school food workers with, with tweets and words. We, we need to deliver. Um, and this has been a longstanding issue. And quite frankly, you know, HVAC systems, I, I know they're complicated, but our schools are worth it. Uh, kids, you know, should not be, and staff should not be subjected to very hot temperatures. Ventilation has been a pre-existing issue, but the, the, the school food workers are subjected to boiling hot temperatures. And what happens is that they have to, you know, open a window. And if a fly flies into, into, the, into the kitchen or to the cafeteria, uh, the health department and others say, oh, there's a fly. Meanwhile, how are they supposed to breathe in there? It's so hot and stifling inside. So it, it, we need to resolve this. So John, if you can get us the data on the number of kitchens that, that need uh, the AC units, let us know because we, we're going to fight hard to get that capital money. Uh, every classroom should be air conditioned, and I'm glad to see that the money has been restored for that initiative. But we need to get our school kitchens, our cafeterias, and our common spaces covered as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to my great colleague, uh, Chair Rosenthal. Great, thank you so much, Chair Traeger. You're amazing and you already covered so much. Um, I really appreciate that. And um, Deputy Chancellors uh, Kabuda and Goldmark, always a pleasure working with you. I'm so glad you guys have stuck it out. I mean, really hearing you over the last hour or so, you're dedicated, obviously, this is really hard stuff. And you, you both stuck with it. Um, uh, New Yorkers don't know how much gratitude they owe you. Um, but I, uh, so let's start with the kitchens. I mean, I, I too am interested in that. We, we have, uh, um, you know, I'm thinking of PS 87, where it's just a tiny little space um, for, for uh, the, the workers and um, boy, the notion that you could, I mean, they are right next to an outside wall. The notion that you could just, you know, put a huge opening there with the screen is, sounds amazing. So I'd love to see the numbers, um, John, when you have those on which schools are in the mix to get them and which schools just are more of a challenge. Um, that would, I think that'd be really helpful information if you could. Will do. Great, thank you. Um, and then, so just as, you know, in my role as chair of the uh, subcommittee on capital budget, there's always this, um, this big delta between the money committed, the money planned to be spent, and then the money actually committed. 
And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about fiscal year 21 and 22 in that regard. Um, as of March in 21, I think DOE committed 1.26 uh, billion, um, which represented only roughly 40% of the planned commitments, um, which means that you have roughly 4 billion more appropriations that you could commit. How, how much do you really think you're gonna be able to commit by, the, by five, six weeks from now? Thank you. I'm only smiling because what a year it's been. And thank you for your kind words, Chair Rosenthal. Um, in terms of, uh, yes, the funds that are allocated and the funds that are committed, right? The agencies have to spend the money. This was obviously a very wild year no for that. Um, and on the SEA side, obviously there was a incredibly long construction pause where no projects were moving even when construction, when private construction resumed, public construction waited even longer. So that was a huge hit in terms of actually spending money because- Yeah, no, it's citywide for sure. I just wondered if you have a sense of what's gonna happen by the end of this year. So I do know that as a SDA board member, we just approved, um, I'm sorry, President Kubota, I'd have to look in my book, which is, on my desk, a tweet, um, not in front of me, uh, but I know we just committed several hundred million dollars in uh, in contracts. I don't know if you have a sense of how much more is going out. And right. just sort of what the total will be for 21. Right, so we have allocated $4.6 billion uh, in FY21. That is 4. what our- 4.6 has been committed? Correct. No, 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 that's- oh, Sorry, that's allocated, right, that's, sorry. Yeah. Right, from the top. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and actually each subsequent year is, is pretty similar. Um, so you're right, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, the, the construction pause, but also the design pause did uh, cause- No question. That, that said, um, yeah. you know, I, I'm not sure how aware you are of, of our structure, but 40% of our designs are done in-house. Um, and so we were able to keep designing despite the, the pause, which was great. Um, and I will say, uh, because of that, and because we were able to unpause at a certain point, we are on track to commit that $4.6 billion. And just by the nature of the way things are, you know, scoped and designed and the time frame in which it's done, typically most of our commitments are done, our obligations are done in that last quarter of the fiscal year. Yeah. Uh, so I will say that we have in the last uh, approximately two weeks turned over four bid, uh, well over $2.2 .2 billion worth of projects. So those are all out on the street. You know, we're receiving bids daily. This is the busiest season for that bid period. Uh, for us. So, you know, and we commit through June 30th. So we are, are actually on track. Uh, believe it or not, we are on track. So to, to commit. God bless you. I, I'm, I, I'm gobsmacked. That's so impressive. Um, and then, so we also noticed for fiscal year 22 that the appropriations, I think, went up um, some. Uh, so, so do you, is that because you're hopeful that you can uh, make the total, I think for next year it's 4.4 .4 billion? Correct, correct. And and we are confident in that also. And I know there's, there's some changes with the executive budget uh, in terms of um, more allocation for 3K. So we, we, we are working very hard. And, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, all of those commitments are, are on track to be committed for FY22. However, we are already in the design process for about so far a third of the 6,500 uh, 3K seats. So, you know, we, we, are, we are moving on this. So that's our goal. And I'll just, um, I'll just jump <sighs> in. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Chair Rosenthal's like, wow. How did you put it up? did not expect, DDC did not give me that answer. So nice. It's pretty awesome. And I'll just remind everyone that 
the, in terms of capital improvement projects in uh, existing DOE buildings, the SCA really tries to get as much work done as possible in the summer. And so while we're opening as many DOE buildings as possible this summer, we are closing some for capital projects. And that's another reason why there's this uh, big right. set of contracts at the end of the year. Right. Contracts go out to bid. The work happens over the summer. We open up on time and style in the fall. And SCA has right. never missed a school opening. I... Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's an amazing track record, and we're a, a happy Great. client. And I'm just going to ask uh, my committee staff to text me. Sorry to do this publicly, but if there's any additional information needed on the commitment plan, if you could just text me about that. <laughs> Second, I want to talk about devices Yay. and tracking devices. And lastly, I'm going to ask about solar panels. I see my colleagues have their hands up, and I really want to be able to get to them. So um, one thing that you just mentioned, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, that I hadn't heard last time is that each school, is it, has their own maintenance plan for the devices? Is that what you said? Uh, no, what I was saying was that uh, for a long time, we've had centralized purchasing contracts where if the school is going to buy a laptop, they're buying it off of a contract that we procured centrally. That includes maintenance. It's not that each school has its own maintenance contracts. It's that we make schools buy devices that come with a warranty with a maintenance contract. But I'm going to ask Lauren Siciliano, our uh, chief administrative officer, to come in and uh, invite her in because essentially anything I say here is something I learned from her. Right, right. No, and that's great. I mean, I. but let me just sort of do big picture. I think big picture, the problem is that we're hearing from principals is that, um, you know, there are a lot of damaged devices. They can't get replacements or we can't get, they can't get them fixed or replaced fast enough for the kids. There aren't like devices that they are, you know, holding back that they could give immediately to a student if a student you know, says their device has been broken. Um, so just sort of big picture, you know, do you have a system citywide for tracking the devices? Do you know how many are out of service at any time? How quickly kids can get a new one? And this is, and I'm asking truly because I'm hearing from principals and others may speak up as well, that it's continued to be a serious problem in their schools. Yeah, essentially we, we did this massive purchase right at the beginning where we said, we realized what was about to happen to us and what was happening to us in that moment. We're yeah. now migrating to a system where we have ongoing replacement of devices. Um, I will let again, my uh, colleagues speak to exactly where we are in that process. I'll just remind everyone that we're uh, obviously by far the largest, and we were the earliest to act on buying the devices, but it did become a bit of a rush on the toilet paper kind of effect, <laughs> things we all remember, um, in that every school district in America, well, every yeah, responsible school district in America, and not just school districts, but other clients like companies, entered this market to start buying devices, and we got a head start but Don't, yes, exactly. I, I know you're not, you're not saying it with prejudice. You're not saying you're saying like, I, I know, understand. And I'm really not throwing shade at yeah, all. Yeah. So it's more that, okay, so just describe where are we now mm -hmm. and are set, like what's in stock for future oh. need to address this? Are you able to stay on top of it? What can we do to make it so it's easier for you to stay on top of it, given that the device is the only thing that's connecting nearly all of our students to their education. Yep. So again, yes. Lauren or Scott, please feel free to jump in with the kind of detailed level of how we're now moving to that steady state of constant replenishment. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, I'll talk about this in a couple of different buckets. And um, first and foremost, I just want to thank you and the council for all of your advocacy in the space around devices, around bandwidth. Um, we would not be where we are right now without all of that. Um, and it just reflects the tremendous amount of investment and work to date. So on the, um, the iPad that we have purchased centrally, for those 500,000 devices that are capitally funded, um, when we rolled out those devices, we also rolled out a new device 
tracking and management approach with that large purchase. Um, and so each device is assigned to an individual student when um, the device is distributed so that we know system-wide where the devices are and can track them. Um, what, we, uh, what is included in our stimulus proposal is taking many of those lessons and applying them, um, those lessons and tools and applying them and expanding them to other devices outside of just the 500,000 iPads. Um, uh, the, the other thing I wanna mention here is um, uh, for the iPads, obviously the cost of the iPad includes warranty. We have, it includes um, Apple Care support for placements. Um, and if any school is struggling with a placement, they should absolutely reach out to the DI to help desk to support. Um, for the capitally funded iPads for um, broken devices, just a reminder that those devices need to be replaced with an expense funded iPad. It's a little bit of a wonkiness tied to just the capital funding, but I just wanted to, to remind folks about that. Um, and then outside of the iPads for uh, the devices that Karen was alluding to that schools purchase, we are seeing schools continue to purchase large numbers of devices. And we do centrally fund um, what we call PCF contracts or um, uh, break fix support contracts um, right. tied to those devices. Okay. Can you separate out the ones, I'm not sure it matters, between the ones that were funded with ResOA council member funding versus, um, you know, centrally funded? And I asked because um, many of my schools said that they couldn't, their kids really couldn't use the iPads. They needed mm -hmm. Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. um, and then we put you know, funding in for that, we're continuing to put funding. I mean, I am, I'm sure my colleagues are as well. And so the, the question specifically on the ResOA devices is can we- Are you tracking make... that expenditure as well? And, and are those devices sort of, how do you, do you integrate that into the total package of how you track all this? Got it, got it. It's a great question. So for the ResOA funded devices, Historically, they have they are tracked, but they have historically been tracked separately. Um, what we are hoping to be able mm. to do as we expand our, our management device platform and our tracking platforms is to be able to integrate that together, both for us from a support perspective, but also quite frankly for the school, so that they're not seeing, they're not tracking devices in multiple ways and seeing them across multiple buckets. Yeah, I think that um, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Uh, agree. I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, <I> just, <laughs> we very much want to do this. I think, you know, one for fiscal, obviously fiscal and managerial responsibility, but also to understand better what the right product is for our students. I mean, I do think it's meaningful. I don't know how many of my colleagues are confronting this, but really almost all my schools are asking me to put money in the budget for Chromebooks. So what is that, given the fact that you had to turn on a dime and you got stuff so fast and you have the biggest school system understanding all that. So again, no shade, just, you know, common sense. Uh, should we be continuing to buy? Like, do you think about which types of students, maybe it's different grades that should use iPads versus laptops, or I'm gonna get off, I'm gonna stop asking about this, but all of which to say, I don't think, I think, I think it, I understand it's a challenge, but I do think it's worth having a good handle on this. I could not agree with you more. Um, we are very excited about the opportunity to create um, device tracking tools for, for our schools that we haven't been able to create before um, and that we've had to stand up in uh, limited instances to support the pandemic. But being able to expand that is just a very exciting prospect. Um, and do you, do you coordinate with this? Like, do you purchase under knowing that council members are allocating funding as well or okay so, i really am going to get off the dime but you're doing your job right 
I'm trying every day. <laughs> I promise. Um, I, I, would just, I would just say quickly on the, the Resaway devices that um, uh, when we purchased the iPads, we purchased one device and we needed to do that because of everything we've talked about before, the volume we needed in the short time frame. Um, our goal would not be to decide a single device for the system. And I think that through the Resaway program and as we move forward, um, our goal would be for schools to be determining which devices best meet the needs of their students and to have much more variety. So completely same page there. I'm happy, of course, to discuss this in more detail. Okay, um, lastly, solar panels. Um, in the council's preliminary budget response, we called for more funding to retrofit the schools for solar. Um, let, let's, let's, I guess, start this way. Which agency budget would reflect the money for a school to get solar roof panels? Would it be in SCAs, DCAS, DDC? So the current solar program is D, uh, DCAS funded and DSF implemented. So it, it actually does flow through uh, DCAS. And, um, I and, and currently I, I believe, and I know John would, would know this, but I believe there are 50 that are complete with another 200 in, in process. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll let uh, DOE speak to that. But in addition, don't forget, we have local law uh, 94 and we are compliant and we have another 10 uh, capacity projects that, that will have PVs uh, as a result of local law 94. So I don't know if John, you want to add uh, anything to that? Uh, sure, I'll just give you the, the numbers that we had as of yesterday. We have 42 projects that are completed for a total of 8.2 megawatts. Uh, we have 20 that are currently Ooh, under construction. Slow down, sorry. 42 projects done, 8.2 megawatts. Okay. All right, we have 20 that are actively in construction, which are 4.5 megawatts. And we have 205 that are, uh, I'm sorry, 206 that are total uh, currently in the pipeline for implementation. But as uh, President Kubota points out, those are all funded through DCAS and they, they give them to us to vote. So first of all, Deputy Chancellor Kubota, your numbers were almost perfect. So, you know, two stars for that. Um, got it. And um, what's the, What's the total universe of buildings? When you say that, total universe, we, so, we identify so I mean, buildings. I, yeah, I mean, I guess you have, I, I guess the question is, what's the total universe of buildings that are solar ready? And then the total use universe of buildings. In other words, the ones that probably we can't put on solar for one reason or another. Right, so the, the 206 is a pretty good number for the ones that have been identified as possibilities that okay. are ready for the pipeline. And DCAS and their contracts have certain standards that the building needs to meet, available yeah. roof area, yeah. the age of, and the warranty of the roof. Uh, so we've, yep, already yep. Done, we've already done that vetting of those 200 buildings. And I'm right. sure as so we go you're along- hitting, that, You're hitting all the low hanging fruit. Correct. Okay, and then, um, so, so in other words, if I fund, wanted to fund a solar roof for my school, the money would not go in SCA's budget, it would go in DCAS? I would say if you or had a DOE's. candidate- DOE's, right. If you had a candidate building, I would share it with my office and, and we would check to see if it's in the DCAS program and uh, make, if not, if it could be in the DCAS program and, and that's how we would do it. So one of the things about DCAS um, is that their most recent report is from, I think, 2018 in terms of solar ready buildings citywide. So do you have your list that you're working from for the 206 and or, or all of them, the roughly 260, that 70 that you could share with us and sort of what the different states are in process done to be done this year, next year, the year after the year after. Sure, we can provide that. And it's the same information that DCAS would have. I'm not sure what they are sharing publicly, but
but okay. just to just to share with the council, we actually have a solar project manager full time that sits in my office to manage these projects that's funded by DCAS, but they work for us. So we have somebody that does this all day long and, and I can share the data. Oh, and that was my last question. Um, so that's great. You have someone doing that from the management of the installation. How about from the perspective, and this is more, I guess, a DOE question, from the perspective of helping the schools ready themselves. Um, and back to your point, Deputy Chancellor um, Goldmark, about what a hell of a year it's been for principals. Um, and, you know, I was talking to a principal the other day about it, and he said, shoot me, um, in, in the most generous way. I mean, I, I love this guy, you know, he's one of the best principals in my district, but sorry, that was flip. I didn't mean okay. to say it that way. Um, don't call 911. He's a great guy. But, um, you know, just sort of feeling totally overwhelmed. So is there staff available who can say, yeah, you know, the DFA has it under control. We central staff are going to work with your science teachers to implement this. Don't worry, we got you. So more broadly than just this question of polar roost with respect to all of the work that principals are doing. <laughs> I wanna be clear, there's like, you know, I think for most of them, this is the least of the things that they're feeling burnt out about. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and the last thing on their, yes. they wanna care about and yet so, so critical in every single way. So yeah, so just a couple of threads of what you raised. First of all, um, look, one of the great advantages of having a chancellor who has been a principal in the New York City school system is that Chancellor Porter regularly starts meetings with, here's what I would have done as a principal. If you sent me this, I would have ignored it. If you, you know, nice. she, if you sent me this, I would have appreciated it. If you know, she has a very good <laughs> you know, principal ear because she was one in this very system for, for a long right. time. Um, and she was also a creative principal, which also means something in the system. So, and then there's just the recognition of what this year has been like for, for anybody who leads a community. So this is really true across New York City of, you know, the pastors and the preachers, like everyone who leads a community has had this responsibility on their shoulders and principals really lead the school community. They lead teachers, staff, everyone in the building, the families. And so that work of leading the community through a crisis, unlike anything we've ever seen, um, in a context where no one's been able to do everything that we know we need to do for kids because of the public health constraints, at least uh, you know when it comes to the learning. So this, this challenge, my heart goes out to principals and that's like not even the relevant part because that's, it's same, really- Same, same. Exactly. I've been in this, really uh, just a crucible all year long. That said, um, we're encouraging principals to take the vacation that they need to take. We're encouraging principals to set up the structures they need to set up so that they're delegating responsibilities. We're not saying to them, delegate this responsibility, not that one, because to the point of how principals feel is that they don't want us to tell them to delegate one piece of work and that we'll manage it centrally versus another. They wanna tell us what they want support with and what they want to do themselves. Um, and so we wanna be respectful of that. So we're not saying like, you never have to do anything about solar roofs. If they want to, okay. If they don't wanna hear about it from us, okay. Um, and with everything we do in our exchanges, interactions with them, we're trying to um, be responsive to that. Um, we're also coming back from just you know, there were real challenges around. You know what? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I, I really do need to turn this over to my yeah, colleagues. Okay. Yeah, well, it's I, sort I, of I just, yes, no. Topic. Do you have a team of people who go in and help principals? Yes. Got it. Yes, <laughs> we can go up. Hey. <laughs> All right. So principals have, have someone they can reach to. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Deputy Chancellor? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I thought you were saying we're moving on and I was getting ready to move on. Yes, principals, we are, we are we're, we're engaging differently with principals and with respect to solar roofs in particular, we have ways of supporting them, but more generally this question of how do we give principals room 
uh, to do what they need to do is a very live one. And then I'll, Great. I know we want to, I see hands up. I will. All right. Thank Bye. you all so much. Thanks for the additional time chairs back to you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. We have two council members with questions. Thank you, chair. Um, if any council member has questions for SCA, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes if you need answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins, and the Sergeant will let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Member Riley, followed by Council Member Adams. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Drum, and Chair Traeger. Uh, thank you, President Kabata, and uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark for your leadership. Um, I'm Council Member Kevin Riley. I'm newly elected in the 12th District. Um, I think I, I really want to stress the emphasis on the kitchens. Uh, within my district, uh, we had an incident on uh, Richard Green uh, with Miss Sylvia uh, during last uh, summer during the pandemic. And as we know, uh, many of our children within our communities rely on the food within our kitchens, but it really wasn't safe uh, for Miss Sylvia, who was an elderly lady who still works um, in the kitchen, very hot. Uh, she almost had a heat stroke. So I really, really want to focus on uh, the kitchens, especially within my district. Um, so if you guys could provide any information, if there's any assistance that we could um, add from the council uh, to assure that we're given a safe environment uh, for the workers there, I would definitely want to uh, do that with you all. Uh, my second uh, question, which is very pressing to me, is uh, the infrastructure within our schools. Um, I'm really interested in gymnasiums and auditoriums within schools. I know a lot of schools within our communities don't have them uh, due to the space, due to the zonings, due to how the schools were built. Um, and I do want to know is if, if there are any uh, funding within this budget uh, to address some of those issues within the Bronx schools to add more gymnasiums and auditoriums. Um, as our children are educating themselves throughout the day, it's always important that they have that time where they can take a break uh, to re-energize, to regain their, their self and, and engage uh, with their you know, peers um, in school, which is social skills or something that we're trying to teach our kids every day. Uh, so gymnasiums and auditoriums are definitely utilized for that, something outside of the classroom. So is there anything uh, within the budget um, addressing that issue, especially with schools within the Bronx? Thank you so much. Uh, if it's okay, President Kubota, I'll start and then pass it to you. Sure. Um, so absolutely uh, share your concern around uh, the school food workers and just want to take this moment to give them a shout out because they worked every day this year before we were told to wear masks, after, during the pandemic, during the regional enrichment centers, the emergency childcare for essential workers feeding a million people in New York City a, a day. I mean, it was uh, just amazing. They stood between hunger and malnutrition and, and New Yorkers like soldiers we've never seen before. So big shout out and definitely deserve to work in conditions that reflect our appreciation of them uh, and working on that moving forward. With respect to your question um, about gymnasiums and outdoor spaces and um, a space for leisure activities and sports and play, um, we do have the PE for All initiative, which is to make sure that every building, every school building where there isn't a gym does actually get a gym or gets a partnership with a local organization where we rent space so that children have a place to run, jump, and play. Um, and I will let President Kubota uh, build on that. We will follow up with you and get you the information for how many of those sites are in the Bronx because I don't think we have that information with us, but sometimes President Kubota knows numbers beyond what my wildest expectations. So I'll just, uh, anything you wanna add, Nina? Um, I, I think uh, of the standalone gyms that we are building or have built, I believe that there are about five in the Bronx. I don't think specifically in council member uh, in your, your district um, in particular. Uh, but that said, that's one, that was only one avenue in which uh, we were trying to provide physical education spaces. So to uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark's point, um, if there are, and, and we can work with you uh, offline about this, if there are ones in your district, we would really like to uh, figure out an alternative uh, source to that. Um, I will say that we are building an addition at PS 87 
uh, in your district, um, and that will have a gymnasium as part of the the addition uh, complex. So you know. The, the UP, the Universal uh, Physical Education Initiative is not the only way, uh, not that we're saying we're going to build an addition for every uh, building that may not have a, a, a gymnasium, but there are alternate uh, means of doing that. Um, in terms of auditoriums, we do provide some auditorium upgrades. Again, while $19 billion is indeed a lot of money, um, it, it, you know, we, we have been, in terms of our um, capital investment program, really focusing on keeping our buildings watertight. So uh, I don't know offhand if there are any in your district or any auditorium upgrades. We can certainly get back to you on that. But, you know, the, the, amount, of, the amount of funding for those other projects uh, is, is pretty limited. So happy to work with you offline. Thank you, President Kamara. I would like Thank to you. Yield. Thank you, Chairs. We will now hear from Councilmember Adams, followed by Gibson. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you again to our chairs, Rosenthal, uh, Traeger, Drum. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of our participants today and your expertise. Um, I do represent District 28. Uh, mm -hmm. For those that don't know me, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to, uh, just to, um, I guess more or less make a statement. Um, it, it's been so hard, you know, for our schools out there. I represent areas of Jamaica, uh, South Ozone Park, Richmond Hill, and Rochdale Village, and it's been so hard. We're talking about devices. Um, and I just remember getting a list from PS 160 uh, in my district this summer, um, it, it was just uh, amazing, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deficiencies um, when it came to getting those devices to our children. So I guess I just wanted to hear again some more reassurance that we flipped, you know, we flipped the coin on that um, and that our students will be taken care of as far as devices are concerned. I also wanted to mention we've got uh, ongoing projects with S SCA. I'm so glad to see that we've loosened them up and are moving things around. Um, I remember, though, having little things, and I just want to hear that the little things are taken care of, like partitions that um, work orders were put in for, partitions for PS48 a long time ago, so that the children from the, the District 75 school would not have any interference from other students when they, when they were in the gym, and just little things like that, um, that I was hearing from the principal that there was really no response back. Um, you know, on, on some little things going on. I think uh, 121 also had some things going on with the gym, no real response. So if I can just get some assurance that some of those little things have been shaken out. Um, and again, thank you so much for working with me um, and uh, working with District 28 um, and just making sure that Southeastern Queens, you know, um, is taken care of equ equitably. And I appreciate that. Absolutely. And uh, yes, we've been working with the Executive Superintendent Diko Vaya, who uh, is, uh, I don't know if you've had the chance to meet with her. She's just a tremendous educator, really excited um, to be working with her. And absolutely, on the partitions, I actually think that may not be uh, an SCA project. That may be uh, a DSF project. So I'm going to check on the DOE and about the PS48 project. Um, and uh, colleagues, if anybody has a specific uh, information right here right now about that let me know um but most likely we'll get back to you uh just because it's a, such a specific question but in general yes um we are moving into this steady state with devices where we'll be able to replenish there are still challenges with that just from supply point of view um and again lauren siciliano uh who's just done amazing work on this if there's anything you want to add on that please feel free Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you, council member, for the question. And um, uh, we know how hard it has been this year to make sure that um, all of our students have devices and how critical that has been. Um, and um, uh, just thank you. I'm thankful for the partnership with the council. As you uh, hear of schools that are still struggling, do please continue to let us know. Um, we have 
uh, of the 500,000 iPads that we've purchased, we still have about 40,000 um, still available for needs that will continue to come up over the course of the year. Um, so we do still have iPads available if there are students that need. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as much as, as we've made progress this year, as we think ahead to next year, we are looking at what pieces of the process worked this year because of the specific need that we needed to meet and the timeline that we needed to make it meet it meet it. And then for next year, um, looking at both um, the 500,000 devices, we're also looking at um, uh, schools have also continued to order a tremendous number of devices through not just through as away, but also through their own school budgets. Um, and we expect that school budgets will, of course, have additional resources next year, particularly with the um, increase of fair student funding. So um, uh, we we are in a good position um, to to be able to make sure that our students have the devices that they need looking ahead to next year. Thank you. I, I just want to throw in before time is out. I heard a couple of instances on the flip side of that as well. Not many, but there, what is the process when students have their own devices and we're giving them devices anyway. I've heard of that too. And parents were going, I'm trying to give it back. They're not letting me give it back. So we had that going on also, not a lot of it, but we did have that going on as well. So are we managing that better or what's going on with that? Yes, uh, fantastic question. Thank you for asking. So um, when students leave DOE, they should return the device. Time expired. They should return the device to their school. If they have a device now that they don't need, um, we have many ways that families can return the device. First, the easiest thing, call the DIAT help desk, 718-935-5100, and we will arrange for pickup. Uh, you can also drop it off at any UPS location um, uh, within the tri-state area, and they will get it back to us free of charge. Um, or of course they can return it back to their school. So all of those are options and um, feel free of course to reach out if there are any families that need support. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Thank sure. you. Thank you. We will now hear from Councilmember Gibson. Time starts. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Chair Drum, Chair, Chair Chagra and Chair Rosenthal, I appreciate all of you and to all my colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President, as well as Deputy Chancellor. Thank you for your work. And I've been listening a lot to the hearing today. And I just had a couple of questions. I don't know if it's been already talked about, but definitely want to also add my voice to Chair Traeger in speaking about the cafeteria workers and lunchroom aides and so many of our critical essential workers that have been on the front lines, a majority of whom are women and women of color. I visited many of my schools during the pandemic and really saw a lot of the great work. So when you talk about capital, when you talk about HVAC systems and upgrades to our cafeterias slash cafes, I also wanna make sure we include our kitchens. We need air conditioning, we need proper ventilation uh, because that's what all of our workers are expecting. So I hope we can continue to have conversations about that. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically about the school-based health centers. I am a huge proponent of working to address our students' social emotional learning needs, students in temporary housing, and really dealing with health and wellness, certainly on behalf of, of my district in the Bronx. So do we have any opportunities in this year's budget to expand on the existing school-based health centers? Is there any money allocated? And are we working with new providers, some of our hospitals and healthcare centers? I'd like to understand where we are with that uh, because you also know that there is a strong correlation between our school-based health centers as well as our guidance counselors bridging the gap and social workers and school nurses. They all work hand in hand together. So I just wanted to understand that. And then speaking to the digital divide issue, uh, like many of my colleagues, we also families struggle with connectivity, particularly those in temporary housing and being discriminated against by some of these internet companies because they were asking for credit cards and deposits. And if you had a delinquent account, they discriminated against you. So we saw a lot in the past year. And I know the mayor's made a series of announcements on addressing internet connectivity, particularly in shelters and other places. And I'm grateful for that. I just wanna make sure that as it relates to our Rezo A funding, we make sure that we can push along a lot of these projects because sometimes they get delayed 
And I do wanna make sure that within the fiscal year, we're able to give our schools the awards that we're providing in our budgets each year. Um, and the last thing I wanna mention, I don't know if council member Rosenthal mentioned it, but I am also a huge fan of scratch kitchens because some of my schools today have ovens. They don't have kitchens where they're preparing meals from scratch. And I think that's another creative way to continue to address our students' needs uh, by not eating processed food and things of that nature that are not healthy for them. So I'd like to see where we are with that. That's all, thank you. <laughs> that's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> I'm trying to summarize, but I think I may have missed a couple. Thank you, but I'm sure you'll remember. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibson. You're always so clear and so passionate and so effective in terms of advocating for schools. So uh, here are you on the kitchens. We've talked a lot about it, so I'll keep going. Okay. Um, you asked about school-based health clinics. Um, and actually I remember visiting a school with you where we yep. uh, built a, a school-based health clinic. I believe that we're currently still at that number 14 of building the school-based health clinics. Um, we have had some challenges with uh, the partnership getting providers because providers want a certain level of foot traffic into the health clinics. Uh, so it uh, is not something that we currently have added funding to in this capital plan. We are not by any means against it. And certainly having health clinics has been totally helpful this year. It was, it, you know, as we were going through, how do we make sure there's a nurse? How do we make sure there's an isolation room? Every building that had a health clinic, we knew exactly that that building would be able to meet the demands of this moment with respect to safety and public health. So that you're totally right. It's an amazing program. Um, we are essentially working on doing the ones that we've already committed to doing at this point, but happy to discuss with you what would be the next phase of that work. Um, can okay. I just jump in there yes. just about school -based. so so since we initiated or the program was initiated about five years ago uh we have completed 45 school-based uh health clinics and and four are in process actually three in, in construction uh in the bronx and one is in design in the bronx ps 67 samuel gompers high school ps uh is uh, 230 229 and also the one in design is P ps uh, so, so we are really excited about this. We do have a little bit of money set aside. Uh, it's kind of, Karen, it's a, it's a little bit off to the side. It's about $10 million that we have left uh, of the funding. And it's it's a great program. So I'd love to, to circle back with you. But I do want to echo what, what Karen said in, in terms of finding providers. Montefiore has been great in the Bronx, but you know we need providers in order to run these centers. Um, oh gosh, so there were so many, there was, um, I was also talking about the cafeterias and <laughs> cafes <you>. and HVAC, <laughs> ventilation. Six topics, I was going to try to impress you by remembering all of them, but I can't, yes. So cafeterias, uh, President Kubota, do you want to talk about cafeterias? So I, I think in, I think you, we covered this at, uh, Great length. Yes, uh, the AC program was funded only for for um, for classrooms. Um, we have so so there isn't funding for cafeterias, but I think more specifically, you were talking about for kitchen workers, which we've talked a lot about. Um, one of the things that we are doing as a stopgap is to install window ACs uh, in for these kitchens while we evaluate a larger uh, HVAC system. Um, and in fact, John uh, Shea, who is on the line, has already uh, done about 10 and has 10 more in process, I believe was, was the number he quoted earlier, um, and, and is going through an evaluation, actually School Foods uh, is going through an evaluation of which uh, kitchens have or need this right now. So that is under, process, uh, under review, and I believe he did commit to sharing the list once it was available. Okay. So Yep. So you also, uh, you mentioned, uh, you kind of added your voice on the laptop and device uh, yep. equity and con you know, continuation and refurbishment. Um, sorry, I may have missed one. You said cafeteria, no <laughs> health clinics. Scratch kitchens. Scra oh, scratch, scratch kitchens. kitchens. Thank you. That was the one that I wanted to talk about because that has a capital and an expense element. And I believe, Lawrence DeSiliano can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in last year's rather devastating budget cuts, the scratch kitchen, the, the expense side of it 
was um, cut, unfortunately. Um, and I do not know if that has been restored yet or not, but certainly uh, would love to work with you on that effort to have freshly cooked food available um, for students uh, in schools, particularly in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with all of you. The final thing I'll say as it relates to the school-based clinics, I know that with many of the providers, there are minimum enrollment numbers that we have to fulfill. But I think in light of COVID-19, we need to realize that a lot of students have been traumatized. So if it's not to the standards, I think we need to reconsider those guidelines so that we can accommodate the needs of all students um, and really making sure that it's viable and it's productive. So I'd like to work with you guys on that because I really think we need to expand in light of the new announcement on the new mayor's office of community mental health. I think that will have a lot of components that are relative to the work that our school-based clinics are doing as well. So I thank you so much, Chairs. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is going to end this portion of the, um, uh, of the hearing now. But before I let you go, I do also want to say thank you, uh, oh. Deputy Chancellor, for all the work that you have done. It has been a pleasure to work with you. I remember marching, I think back when I first became education chair, along uh, with your child. And uh, we were marching for CFB funding. And I don't think we ever thought that it would really come through. And look how far we've come. So our marching wasn't uh, in vain. And I really appreciate your open and honest relationship with us and the committee and our friendship as well. Uh, so thank you for everything you've done. Uh, President uh, Kubota as well, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Um, I got to know you through um, your former president, Lorraine Grillo, of course. Uh, but it is a pleasure to have you on board also. And thank you for your open and honest answers to our questions. Uh, we really deeply appreciate it, of course, to everyone else who's on the call, to my chairs, to uh, Mark Traeger, and to Helen Rosenthal as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we're going to proceed in one minute, I think, to the next portion of this hearing. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. And thanks okay, to this all the staff who've done heroic work, including in this hearing. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for all the support, staff. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, this will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you, SCA, for being here. We will now move on to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for the DOH MH portion of the hearing to remain in this Zoom with your microphone. We're going to go right into DOH MH. So are our chairs ready? Um, we're just waiting for a few of the admin witnesses to from DOH MH to log on. Okay, let, then we'll take a, five minutes until they get here. Okay. But five minutes, and we'll be back. Hi, Dr. Chauci. Uh, let's go ahead and do an audio check for you, sir, while we wait. We'll be on a five minutes recess. Hi there. Are you able to hear me all right? Perfectly well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sergeant.
you And we might as well go ahead and do an audio check for you, Dr. Easterling, while we wait. Good afternoon, Sergeant Hope. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, sir. Ms. Harrison, Dr. Harrison. Good afternoon, Dr. Harrison. Thank you, good afternoon. Ms. Morse. Hi, this is Dr. Morse. Good afternoon, Doc. Thank you. Good afternoon. We have Dr. Stevens on. Yes, Dr. Stevens. Good afternoon. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Doc, Mr. Mr. Jar. Hi, Sergeant Hope. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. We have uh, Ms. Francine on. Oh, okay, thank you.
Chair Lewis and Chair Levine. Uh, are we ready to begin? Yes, I am, Sergeant. Ready to go. Yes. All right. Give us a second or so and we'll start. We will start. Chair Drum. Okay, so you'll be beginning when, when you're ready. I'm ready. Sergeant, did you have to make an announcement? No, we're good to go, sir. We're good to go, okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the city council's sixth day of hearings on the mayor's executive budget for fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We previously heard from the SCA and now we will hear from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We are joined by the Committee on Health, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Mark Levine, and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Farrell Lewis. Uh, we are also joined now by, I'll get the list of council members in a moment. And I'll follow up with that. And just bear with me one minute. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to forego an opening statement, but I'd like to turn it over to Chair Levine and Chair Lewis for their opening statements. Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. Thank you for being an incredible leader for this committee. Uh, really grateful for your leadership. And I, I did get the list of our colleagues who are here. So I'll just read them out if that makes sense. We've been joined by council members Adams, Ampri Samuel, Ayala, Barron, Brooks Powers, Diaz, Denowitz, Feliz, Gibson, Gradenchik, Holden, Koslowitz, Riley, and Rosenthal. And I hope I didn't skip anybody. Of course, I am thrilled to be co-chairing this hearing with Chair Farrah Lewis. And again, I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. During today's hearing, we will review the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's $2.05 billion fiscal 2022 executive budget. And I will specifically be focusing on the $1.25 billion allocation for public health. Uh, this is a real moment of optimism for New York City as we have achieved so much in our vaccination efforts with almost half of the city now receiving its first shot. And as the number of new viral virus cases continues to drop on a regular basis. Uh, and of course we are lifted by the federal stimulus plan, which in part will also be a boost to uh, DOHMH. Uh, but on this day in which we're marking the end of most restric restrictions, on capacity in public places like restaurants and supermarkets. And, and on this day when um, in effect, the mask mandate indoors has been lifted. Um, we also have to take a moment to observe the continuing challenges and risks for the city. And the flip side of our progress on vaccination is that still today, 52% uh, of people in New York City have not gotten yet even their first vaccine dose. And in some neighborhoods, it's even higher. There's tremendous inequality in vaccination still. In some neighborhoods, 70% or more of people have not yet received their first dose. And while we've made incredible progress in re reducing the transmission of the virus, uh, it's just wonderful to see that graph come down uh, so steadily over recent weeks. Still, we're seeing an average over seven days of about 700 new daily cases. And uh, if it hadn't been for the year we've just been through, uh, boy, we'd think that was a very, very high number. Uh, so uh, we're looking at this budget today with an eye to the need to continue to push forward in our fight against this pandemic. But we're also looking at it with the long-term view 
and the imperative of finally tackling the health inequality, which has been revealed and exacerbated over this past year. We just cannot ignore it anymore. And so we need a, a health budget, uh, a DOHMH budget over the next fiscal year and ultimately beyond, which uh, really positions our city to tackle that inequality and does things like expand on the ground public health programming through very successful programs like neighborhood health action centers. Uh, uh, we need to tackle the documented levels of racial discrimination in the way medical care is still delivered in this city, uh, which we see most painfully uh, in racial inequality and maternal health. But we need to dramatically expand the ranks of on the ground, multilingual, culturally competent public health workers who are out in communities on a permanent basis. We need to make sure that everybody in the city, even if they don't have health insurance, even if they're undocumented, that everybody has access to primary care in a clinic in their neighborhood. Uh, th these are some of the things we'll be looking for in our health budget for FY 2022. Um, I do wanna thank uh, the people of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for what they've done, what you've done over the past year. I know so many of you, and I'm really uh, incredibly grateful for the intensity of your effort, your dedication to the city, uh, your relentless fight on behalf of, of public health and taking on this pandemic. I really do feel that the city owes you a debt of gratitude and I'm grateful for your efforts. And I wanna thank you too, um, Commissioner Chakshi, for your work, for your leadership, uh, and for everything that your department has done uh, over these difficult uh, 15 months. And finally, I wanna thank the incredible staff of the city's, uh, city council specifically uh, in these weeks uh, leading up to this hearing has done such great work. Uh, thank you, policy analyst M. Balkan, committee councils, Harbani, Ahuja, and Sara Liss, and finance analyst, Lauren Hunt. Um, and I'm, now I'm gonna pass it, I think I'm gonna pass it on to my co-chair, uh, Chair Lewis. Uh, so uh, please take it away. Thank you so much, Chair Levine. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair Levine and Chair Drum for your leadership. Happy to be joining you both for today's executive budget hearing today. I'm Councilmember Farrah Lewis. I'm the chair of the city's the City Council's Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addictions. During today's hearing, we will review the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's $2.05 billion fiscal 2022 executive budget, specifically the 620, sorry, $647 million allocated for mental health, substance abuse, and disabilities. In the past few months, we've heard the phrase light at the end of the tunnel. To give hope to the pandemic, to give hope that the pandemic is drawing a close that is a resemblance of normally that we'll return to. But we will have to also uncover as we emerge from the tunnel and what we are doing to preemptively address the impact and trauma of the last year and a half. The administration has made strides to address the mental health needs from COVID-19 and the long lasting gaps in services for people experiencing serious mental illness. However, we have a lot of questions around the framework, the timeline, the rollout plan, and the metrics that will be used to measure the new program's success. Millions of dollars were added to the administration in the last five years, and yet New Yorkers are still struggling to locate the mental health support services that they need for themselves or their loved ones. We do not see results on the ground level from the large fiscal investments that have been made to combat the racial disparities in mental health care, ensuring that Black and Brown communities have the tools needed to cope with social emotional challenges. We still believe that the NYPD should not be responding to calls related to mental health crises. Instead, trained mental health professionals from support and connection centers should be able to respond to these calls. Connect and connect with and assist affected individuals and help restore and provide much needed support. Overdose deaths have dramatically increased in the last year. We lost 1,446 New Yorkers through the third quarter of 2020. 
nearly the equivalent of the total lives lost in 2019. We have to address the opioid crisis, expand education and support to save lives in our communities. People with developmental disabilities cannot be overlooked after spending more than a year sheltering in place and unable to meet with their care teams in person to have the ongoing support and integrated uh, support to use technology into their daily routine to keep progressing. We need to learn more about the challenges that they faced and how the city plans to support families who may have experienced a setback. In this fiscal budget, we need to have a new approach to addressing mental health needs and substance abuse in New York City in real time. As our students and working professionals return to their classrooms and office spaces after a year of isolation, we need to support their transition, assess and address any long-term impact of mental health concerns relating or resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Summer is not officially here, and yet our city has been and seen, sorry, has seen a major spike in violence, including hate crimes. When a violent crime or a tragic loss occurs, a team of counselors need to be readily available right away in the community to conduct outreach efforts and lead conversations to help those affected, to begin to cope and process the experience. With the subway system resuming 24 seven service, how will the city address the pre-pandemic homelessness crisis? The mental health amplifiers, mobile crisis teams, neighborhood support program, and other programs will be critical in our city's ongoing efforts to promote universal access to mental health care during the COVID-19 recovery. The emotional and physical toll of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected New Yorkers in different ways, particularly immigrants, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Black and Brown New Yorkers who, work as, who worked as frontline essential workers. By recognizing that there are no one size fits all solutions to this, I truly believe that DOHMH is taking the necessary preliminary steps towards addressing the current and potential mental health crisis in innovative ways. I want to ensure that we continue to work together, that we listen to one another, that we collaborate with the experts in the communities who know which services are needed and how the city needs to invest fiscally in expanding the programs that have been proven to strengthen and uplift our families. I'm looking forward to today's hearing and getting more details about the plans to address these important issues. And I thank DOHMH and the whole team for all the work that you've done. I would also like to thank my committee staff, policy analyst, Christy Dreyer, committee counsel, Sarah Liss, and financial analyst, Lauren Hunt for your support today. Now I'll return to committee counsel, Stephanie Ruiz to go over procedural matters. Thank you. Actually, let me just uh, say that next we'll be hearing testimony from DOHMH. We are joined by health commissioner, Dr. Dave Chotsky. He's my constituent. Uh, before DOHMH begins their testimony, I'm going to turn it over to our committee counsel to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Thank you, chairs. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I am counsel to New York City's Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you'll need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and will be called on to speak. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to administration witnesses, including those available for question and answers. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Commissioner Chosky? I do. Thank you. Dr. Torian Easterling? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Sammy Gerard? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Myla Harrison? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Daniel St Stevens? Yeah. I do. Thank you. Ms. Curtin Schiff? Yes. 
Thank you. Dr. Michelle Morse. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Julie Friesen. Yes. Thank you. And Ms. Maura Kenley. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. And um, good afternoon, Chairs Drum, Levine, and Lewis, and members of the committees. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And as you heard, I'm joined today by Dr. Torian Easterling, First Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer, and Mr. Sammy Jura, Deputy Commissioner for Finance, uh, along with my other wonderful colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's executive budget for fiscal year 2022. Since the preliminary budget hearing, the department has remained focused on our response to the COVID-19 public health emergency, particularly the city's vaccine for all effort. As I've said many times before, the vaccines are safe, effective, and life-saving, and I am thrilled to see the progress that we have made on vaccination. To date, over 7.6 million doses have been administered in New York City, and over 3.2 million New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. We're also seeing the positive impact they're having in preventing serious illness. These trends are promising, and though we remain as cautious and vigilant as ever, we know vaccines will help to restore normalcy to life in New York City and end this devastating pandemic. Today, all New Yorkers 12 and older are eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine. No appointment is necessary at many sites citywide, and New Yorkers can find a site near them at vaccinefinder.nyc.gov or by calling 877-VAX4NYC. Since this is a budget hearing, I would be remiss if I did not point out that every dollar dedicated to our vaccination campaign is an investment in the future of New York City and shows how public health and the economy are inherently intertwined. As vaccine supply has increased, we have doubled down to make it easier for New Yorkers to access them and to share information about the vaccines, keeping our laser focus on equity. We are meeting New Yorkers where they are, through our homebound program, mobile vaccination buses, or at one of the many pop-up vaccination sites at community centers and faith-based organizations. We have located most city-run sites in the 33 Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity Neighborhoods, and we are working in those communities and others to address vaccine confidence in the voices and languages that people need to hear. Now, before I discuss the executive budget, I'd like to provide an update on the state budget and federal activities. During the preliminary budget hearing, I expressed significant concern with the governor's proposed FY22 budget, as it included approximately $50 million in annual cuts to critical public health funding for New York City. I'm very pleased to say that the majority of those cuts were not enacted. Most importantly, New York City's Article 6 rate was not further reduced from 20% to 10%, as Article 6 is a crucial source of funding for public health services, from environmental health to maternal health. However, the rest of the state continues to receive a 36% Article 6 match, almost double that of New York City. The state has a responsibility to fund public health in New York City, and going forward, we must continue to advocate for a full restoration of New York City's Article 6 match and equitable state public health funding. Allow me to repeat, going forward, we must continue to advocate for a full restoration of New York City's Article 6 match and equitable state public health funding. Overall, this year's state budget maintained state investment in public health in New York City we thank the state legislature for their support and advocacy in ensuring the proposed cuts from the executive were rejected in the final budget. And we are grateful for the support of the council and public health partners across the city. Turning now to the federal level, the American Rescue Plan has provided billions of dollars of relief for New York City. The plan also included much needed funding for public health. I'd like to thank President Biden and the New York City Congressional Delegation for their support of the American Rescue Plan, 
and for their commitment to the health and economic recovery of New York City. I would also like to acknowledge the enhancements made by the Biden administration to the Community Mental Health and Substance Abuse Prevention Block Grants, which provide about $151 million in additional funding to New York State for the next two years. As our state partners make allocations of this funding to localities, we encourage them to allocate a reasonable proportion to New York City to address the behavioral health needs of New Yorkers. Funding for public health has been systematically cut over the last decade, and COVID-19 has demonstrated the need for renewed investment in the systems that prepare and respond to public health threats. We look forward to our continued partnership with the Biden administration and urge them to continue to prioritize public health investments, including investments to address mental health and substance use needs related to the COVID-19 pandemic. I will now turn to the FY22 executive budget. The health department currently has approximately 7,000 employees and an operating budget of $2.05 billion for FY22, of which $980 million is city tax levy or CTL. The executive budget added $144 million of CTL to the department's FY22 budget. One-time savings of $3.5 million in CTL was taken from the current FY21 budget only, with no impact to out years. The additional funding for the health department in the executive budget will support several new initiatives and allow us to expand other key areas of work. This includes resources for maternal and child health and an additional $1.4 million in CTL for lead poisoning prevention to support DOHMH's expanded role in inspecting school facilities as part of our elevated blood lead level or EBLL investigations and new staff who will contact families to ensure that children who were previously identified with an EBLL continue to have access to services such as healthcare and developmental monitoring. The executive budget also makes important investments in behavioral health services, including raising awareness of mental health supports at vaccination sites. In FY22, a $6.5 million CTL expansion of Healing NYC will support fentanyl testing and awareness campaigns, increased harm reduction outreach and drop-in services, and expanded access to medications for opioid use disorder. We are seeing troubling trends in the opioid overdose epidemic, and we are focusing this investment in neighborhoods and for the communities that need it most. And there are further investments to support New Yorkers with serious mental illness, including $4 million for clubhouses and $22.6 million for new mobile treatment teams. I'd like to sincerely thank the mayor for the resources dedicated to the department in the executive plan to support public health for all New Yorkers. Now is precisely the time to be investing in public health. I'll say it again, now is precisely the time to be investing in public health. And thank you to the speaker, chairs, and members of the committees for your partnership and continued commitment to public health. I want to again acknowledge my leadership team who are here with me today and all of the health department's employees for their tireless work and dedication to serving the people of New York City. I will close with a reminder that vaccines are our single greatest weapon in the fight against COVID-19. If you've already been vaccinated, please think about a family member, friend, or neighbor who may still be on the fence and share your story with them. We have a chance to not just turn the corner uh, on this pandemic, but to crush the COVID curve. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Choksley. I'm very uh, pleased to see you. Uh, and I wanna thank you and all the members of the Department of Health for everything that you've done during this pandemic. It's uh, been quite remarkable and um, we're very, very grateful for all of your efforts. Um, I also wanna compliment you on your recent commercial with all of the folks of color who are uh, asking everyone to get out and get vaccinated. Um, I think it's a great, uh, a great commercial, and I see. I think I see a few familiar faces here on the screen today as well. So we're all uh, here. I'm sorry, we're all here, Chair Drum. We're all here. Okay, great, great. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about diabetes. The city experienced a 356% increase in diabetes deaths during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. What is DOHMH's plan to address diabetes in the city? And was any additional funding added in fiscal 22 uh, in, the exec in the executive budget for diabetes? Uh, well, thanks for this important question, Chair Drum. Uh, diabetes is uh, something that um, I know both as a public health professional as well as a primary care doctor. Um, it's one of the most insidious diseases um, that we have to uh, take on uh, from both perspectives. And we do it in a range of different ways. Um, you know, first, uh, we focus on prevention, as is our charge, you know, with um, many of our public health activities, including supporting uh, diabetes prevention programs across the city, um, working with primary care doctors to ensure um, that they have the most rigorous quality of care for patients with diabetes, and making changes to our built environments to support uh, physical activity as well as healthier eating. Um, a lot of that work is supported through our Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness, uh, led by Dr. Morse, who is uh, also our first ever chief medical officer, um, to bridge uh, public health and healthcare delivery as well. Um, with respect to whether or not there are any additional um, investments in the FY22 budget, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Mr. Jara, uh, who may have more specific information than I do on that point. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Council Member, for the question. Uh, the fiscal year 22 budget includes investments in public health uh, resources in a few ways. Uh, the Action Health Centers um, have key work where they work with community members and community-based organizations focused on disease, uh, diabetes prevention. Um, and uh, we also have made investments in the fiscal year 22 proposed budget um, for school-based programs that focus on upstream invest, uh, prevention of diabetes. Is there any uh, money in the budget for those who folks who have gained weight uh, in terms of weight reduction programs or anything like that, folks who are dealing with diabetes? Um, thanks for the important question. And, you know, you're absolutely right to point it out. This is a, a phenomenon, um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, the compounding effects of stress, um, you know, lower rates of physical activity, and in some cases, you know, unhealthy eating have led to, um, to weight gain, uh, you know, over the course of the pandemic. Um, I believe I'm accurate in, in stating that there are no uh, new resources specifically, you know, for, um, you know, for, for those uh, phenomena, but that the programs that I have mentioned and that Mr. Giraffe pointed out um, would be particularly well tailored to address the needs of New Yorkers who have gained weight over the pandemic. Well, I ask almost because I have personal concerns with diabetes and weight gain um, and getting folks out to uh, exercise more and eat properly. Um, but I do think that it's a phenomenon that we will see more of due to the pandemic. So I hope that we can focus in on that even more as we move down the road. Uh, in March, the CDC announced a plan to invest $2.25 billion over two years to address COVID-19 related health disparities and advance health equity among underserved communities. Did DOHMH receive any of this funding? And if so, how does the agency plan to use this grant? Um, yes, uh, thank you so much. I'll start briefly. I'll turn to um, Dr. Easterling, uh, as well as Mr. Jura. Um, to fill in uh, a couple of the details here. But uh, just to state briefly, um, yes, we were excited by this announcement. It is very well aligned with the directions of uh, our department um, that uh, you know, started before the pandemic, but have been a real focus in our COVID response as well. And so these resources will fuel uh, the work that has already been started and allow us to enhance it further. Um, but I'll turn to Dr. Easterling and then Mr. Girat to say a bit more. Thank you, Commissioner, um, and thank you so much, uh, Chair Drum. Uh, so, so you're absolutely right. Um, we are looking at ways that we can continue to expand uh, our work to support community-based and faith-based organizations 
to support our outreach engagement uh, uh, in neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, and so we're building on the work that we've been doing during this pandemic. We've already been supporting a number of organizations through uh, the, our, our colleagues uh, at Health and Health and Health and Hospital uh, through Test and Trace to really support and have CBOs on the ground. We are now bringing on hundreds of more organizations to really support our vaccine outreach and engagement uh, through a mix of funding, both from the American Rescue Plan and from uh, foundations as well. And so we really look forward to uh, really getting this work off the ground, uh, particularly over the summer, as we're really pushing out our message to get folks vaccinated. And finally, I'll just add to Dr. Easterling's point. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum, for the question. Uh, this is very late breaking news. We just uh, received uh, the beginnings of the information on Friday afternoon and are look, for, uh, look forward to learning more um, over the coming weeks as we start to get more details about what this funding looks like and what's permissible. Um, we're really looking forward to the federal government's investment in these public health workforce. Okay, hey, thank you very much for that as well. Uh, let me talk a little bit about ending the pandemic, uh, excuse me, ending the epidemic uh, or ETE. The state's ETE initiative is an action plan to end the HIV epidemic with targets of reducing in, uh, the estimated number of annual new HIV infections from 3,000 to 750. Uh, was the city on target to meeting this metric in 2020? Uh, yes, uh, we were on target um, for meeting that metric in 2020, and um, we'll, we'll be happy to follow up on the specific numbers of how that trajectory um, has changed in recent years. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, critically important part of our um, of our planning around uh, taking care of of people who are living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that the health department has done over the last several years um, in collaboration with our state colleagues on the ETE plan. Did COVID affect the, um, uh, you know, the work that um, was going on around ETE? Yes, you know, as you're well aware, COVID uh, has affected, you know, all of our work. Um, very little was spared from uh, the effects of the pandemic. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'll also say um, for uh, our work in taking care of HIV patients, tuberculosis patients, our sexual health clinics, um, almost all of those programs were able uh, to pivot, um, in many cases, very rapidly uh, to be able to continue serving um, the patients and the public, you know, whom we serve. Uh, for example, shifting to telehealth modalities for care when it was needed um, and ensuring that uh, we were um, uh, delivering medications in alternative ways uh, and, uh, and using, you know, virtual modes of care uh, to be able to um, continue the services that we have been offering. Okay, and uh, are there any programs in place to increase, I just want to, okay, are there any programs in place to increase access to contraceptives, uh, PEP and FREP as we go into the summer with less restrictions? Um, yes, there are, uh, you know, the, the focus on PEP and PrEP uh, as, uh, you know, sort of the broader approach to taking care of, of patients with um, HIV or people who are at risk of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, that is a cornerstone of it. Uh, I don't have details at my fingertips with respect to um, the amount of resources dedicated to that, but our team will be happy to follow up with you on it. Thanks for, okay. for asking about these very important health issues that are emblematic of what we'll have to uh, do as we emerge from COVID response. Okay, now a little bit about mental health for all. DOHMH has made significant investments in fiscal 21 and the out years to increase access to mental health. This includes launching the Connect Initiative, which will serve clients with serious mental issues and mental health, mental health issues, uh, including using uh, integrated mobile and brick and mortar um, and treatment. What brick and mortar, um, what metrics will be used to determine the success of Connect, of the Connect Initiative and the Mental Health for All program? Thank you so much for the question. I'll start and turn to Dr. Harrison um, to elaborate for us. 
Uh, but briefly, you know, I'll say, um, allow me to just put it into the perspective of all of the programs that we have uh, to take care of, of patients with serious mental illness. Um, we have built a, a continuum over the last several years, um, ranging from, you know, services like NYC Well that uh, are a front door, um, you know, for more intensive services, all the way to our intensive mobile treatment teams, um, which offer very high touch, uh, very um, dedicated uh, linkages of health and social services to take care of some of the most marginalized um, people uh, whom we care for. Um, part of the task of building out that spectrum has been making sure that we are right-sizing interventions uh, in terms of the intensity of services to the needs of the patients that we're serving. And Connect um, was conceptualized really to fill a gap in that respect where uh, perhaps someone didn't need such intensive services as what we would provide in the IMTs, the intensive mobile treatment teams, but needed a little bit more than what they would be able to get um, at one of the behavioral health clinics. Uh, so with that introduction, I'll turn it to Dr. Harrison with respect to the metric, the performance metrics. Great, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Chair Drum, for that question about additional services that we are creating to meet the needs of New Yorkers who have more extensive mental health needs. Um, and you asked specifically about the program that we're calling CONNECT, which stands for Continuous Engagement Between Community and Clinic Treatment. And we are still in the process of um, formulating the, what the program will look like and talking with providers who will be able to do this service. It will be both a step up from clinic services for folks, as well as a step down from more intensive mobile treatment services. So we are in the midst of deciding what, what the service will look like, as well as the metrics that we will want to monitor. And again, it's about connections and engagement. So it's likely we're going to be following those types of um, measures as we go along. Um, we are also, we have other programs we're adding. And again, we really are hoping to engage and connect people with serious mental illness to the services um, and more services than we've had before. Uh, Chair, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, why is it necessary to have Connect when we already have Thrive? Um, thanks. That's an important question. Well, this is, you know, this is all being um, coordinated uh, in that continuum, you know, that spectrum of services that I described. Uh, and, you know, as with so much that we're doing in the sphere of behavioral health more generally, uh, we coordinate with, um, with Thrive, now the Mayor's Office of, of Community Mental Health, uh, on, on this initiative and many others. And I will just add to, to Dr. Harrison's good answer on the, the metrics. It's a, the Connect in particular is an opportunity for us to ensure that we're engaging with the people that we serve, but also the providers who are most experienced in uh, caring for those patients in building you know, that experience into uh, what are meaningful metrics for the program. Okay, let me go on to uh, LGBTQ youth. There are studies that have indicated that COVID-19 impacts the mental health and well-being of youth, particularly among the LGBTQ and transgender or non-binary youths. Has DOHMH seen an increase in the need for mental health services among this population? And if so, in what ways is the city supporting this community? Thanks for the important question. Um, I, I don't have any uh, data on that at my fingertips. Um, so I'll turn to Dr. Harrison to see if she does. But, um, but what I will say is that, uh, you know, this is a, a particular area where we have to, again, think about the reverberating effects of the pandemic. Um, not just, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, that many kids have not been uh, going to in-person school with the services, you know, that that entails, um, but also the fact that, um, you know, social isolation has worsened uh, pre-existing problems. So, uh, so you're certainly right to, um, to ask the question, and I know that it's been an, uh, an area of focus for us, but we'll see if Dr. Harrison has more data. Dr. Chakshi, just before we go on to Dr. Harrison, you mentioned data. 
Are you collecting data on LGBT folks in general and youth specifically? Uh, I believe so. Uh, let me see if, if Dr. Harrison has more on that. Great, thank you so much for the question. From the perspective of youth um, and LGBTQ, we have an RFP out right now for a service model for uh, youth uh, prevention for suicide, as well as for youth with LGBTQ, as you are pointing to a very high risk uh, group of individuals with uh, information that we have from youth risk YRBS, Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Surveys. Um, I don't have data um, at my fingertips for now or specifically related to COVID, but it is something that we are you know, absolutely concerned about and are working with providers as well on these really important issues. So Dr. Harrison, one of the um, main reasons I ran for office was to um, really push agencies into collecting that data and, and Dr. Chakshi as well. Are you actually collecting data for those people who you come in contact with about their um, gender identity or their sexual orientation? Um, you know, you're both scientists and you know the importance of data. And, um, you know, I just wanna be sure that you're actually collecting that in a voluntary way um, so that we can begin to really know who that population is. Thank you, I very much appreciate that question. And the answer is yes, um, we are collecting data on sexual orientation and gender identity systematically you know, uh, across programs, which is I think the point of your question, um, not just uh, talking about mental health needs, but, um, you know, but for essentially any programmatic service that we offer as well as our um, broader health surveillance and disease surveillance activities. So. Um, so that uh, the, the acronym is SOGI, you know, the SOGI um, uh, approach is something that has been refined over the last several years at the health department. And we continue to figure out the best ways to uh, collect that data um, on a voluntary basis and incorporate it into all of our systematic survey tools. And uh, that data has, has been collected. And is that something you can share with us? I mean, we don't uh, want to say specific names, drum. but we certainly would like to see numbers. Absolutely. If I may ask, um, could you give us a, a little bit more in terms of what it is that you are looking for? Sexual orientation and gender identity data can be associated with a number of, of different um, areas, data sets, programs. So please guide us a bit more and we can speak to what we can hear and follow up on the rest. Sure, I mean, you know, one of the things that I've learned uh, having been an activist in the LGBT community for many years is how important it is to be out to your doctor and to uh, be able to have confidence that the doctor will treat you appropriately and with respect as well. So, you know, upon entry into some hospitals, I, specifically I went to a hospital in, 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 um, Eastern Na in Western Nassau county and they hand you a sheet that says how do you describe yourself Asian you know Latino black etc so forth and so on and included in that list is sexual orientation gender identity and an opportunity to say and the whole form is voluntary by the way to say yeah this is how I identify this is how I want to be treated and even at NYU Langone uh, questions about do you have sex with men or do you have sex with women things that I think doctors should know confidentially, but also data that would give us information about specifically which parts of the community or who in the community it is that we're targeting or providing programming for. So that's basically what it is that I'm looking for, even within the Department of Education. And I actually passed legislation requiring the social service agencies to begin to collect that data. It hasn't been as successful as I'd like to have seen it be, and I'm pushing the Department of Operations on that, but certainly for our health concerns, it should be definitely part of the data that you're collecting. I, I agree, and thank you for clarifying and for your advocacy on these efforts. Um, I, I'm going to turn to Dr. Easterling, who may be able to say a bit more about, um, about our data collection in this domain. Thank you again, Commissioner, and, and thank you so much for raising this critical issue, Chair Drum. Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, the way that I would sort of uh, lay this out 
Um, we certainly are looking at all of the ways in which we capture our information through our clinical services. And so, as you've already outlined, those are certainly ways, particularly through our sexual health clinic, because it does inform the way that we're caring for our patients. And so we know that our physicians are really thinking intentionally making sure that we're not only looking at race, ethnicity, but also gender orientation, as the commissioner had mentioned. Um, we have begun to in institutionalize this into some of our other programmatic ways, place-based work and more systematically citywide. But I think what you're also getting at is how are we informing and influencing sort of the systems more broadly, our healthcare systems, the partners that we work with. And we have certainly developed guidance uh, over the last couple of years to really expand the ways that we capture race and ethnicity, including ancestry and gender orientation. And we're gonna to continue to do this work going forward and thinking about ways that we can make sure that the standard minimum, minimum is raised to make sure that we're capturing these important metrics. And I just would like to, before I turn it over to my colleagues, point to Health and Hospitals, which has also um, been doing that partially because of our advocacy in that direction, but uh, has been making strides in, in that direction as well. Okay, thank you. I'm going to now turn it over to um, Council, uh, to Mark Levine, to Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. Thank you for that excellent line of questioning. I want to note that we have been joined by some additional colleagues, Council Members Van Bramer, Diaz Sr., Jonai, Minchaka, Powers, and Majority Leader Kumbo. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Chachki, uh, we, are, we are really grateful that the federal government has provided additional money through the stimulus package. And of course, some of this will meet really compelling public health needs, uh, we certainly hope. Uh, I hope it will be a way to shore up our staffing for critical public health functions that I know are essential as we are at the, the latter stage of this pandemic and preparing for the longer term fights that I mentioned in my opening statement, but staffing needs in, in our public health lab and epidemiology, community health workers. Um, you know, the, the context is that not unique to New York City, but uh, this country has been underfunding public health for a really long time. And uh, unfortunately that was all too clear uh, over the past year. And I hope that the stimulus money and I think the broader commitment is a way to correct that and to to build out amazing public health systems for the long term, can you talk about um, what your needs are, uh, what you what you might hope that that uh, uh, extra federal money might might be able to uh, help support within the, the department? Thank you so much, Chair Levine, and uh, you said it very well with respect to um, the why uh, of why we need additional investment in public health at this critical time. It's both to meet the needs of the here and now, um, but also to prepare for the next pandemic and also for us to be able to address all of the slower moving health disasters uh, between now and then. Um, and this is our opportunity to do it because public health is in the spotlight in, is a, in a way that is uh, unique um, and unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, relatively rare you know, in this country. And so it's a chance for us to leverage it. With respect to um, you know, where uh, that funding should be channeled, uh, I think there are some, uh, some very good steps that have been taken by the federal administration already. Um, and many of them uh, augment uh, the fundamental investments that uh, Mayor de Blasio and his administration uh, have made over the last several years in public health. Um, but you know, the core areas that we do need to shore up include uh, investments in addressing behavioral health needs, uh, as we've discussed briefly, um, and making sure that our uh, epidemiology services, that includes um, disease surveillance, uh, as well as um, the ways that we respond to emerging disease threats. Uh, you mentioned the public health laboratory, which I very much agree with um, as well. Um, and then thinking about a community-based workforce, which we have seen time and again over the past year uh, has been uh, so needed and so turned to, uh, whether it was improving access to uh, COVID-19 testing or for all of the efforts um, that we've had with our COVID vaccination campaign. 
So those are the key domains that, um, that I hope there will be uh, even more investment in in the coming months. Well, we hope so too. Please keep us posted on all of that. And along those lines, uh, the mayor mentioned uh, when, uh, I guess when he rolled out the executive budget that the, the test and trace core, which has now grown to be a large and really important workforce would be transitioned into um, uh, a public health core, which could really be engaged in some of the long-term fights that, that, that you and I have both been mentioning here, which, which strikes me as an, an excellent uh, plan because we, we have this core of people who have now gotten uh, real experience in public health and we want, we want to keep their talents on this task. Uh, I guess there are, is 50 million in the budget uh, for that workforce uh, for FY 2022, if I have that number right. And I just want to get a sense whether that's enough to at least extend this workforce through the end of, of FY 2022, uh, or whether uh, that amount might, might force uh, cutbacks in that workforce. Thanks. This is an important question as well. And first, let me just say, I'm also very excited about um, you know, the prospects of a public health core uh, is something that is neighborhood based that addresses all of the needs that um, you know that we've just talked about, uh, and it will require coordination you know across city government just as we've done over the course of the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, and we'll have to continue doing that you know across uh, healthcare partners uh, as well as leveraging you know the resources and the strengths that the health department um, brings to bear. Uh, for all of those things. So the money that was included in the executive budget is uh, a strong start. Um, and we're looking to what I think of as, you know, braid and blend uh, additional sources of funding, again, particularly from uh, the federal government as it becomes available uh, to ensure that the resources are matched to the needs that, um, uh, that we have to respond to for New Yorkers. So just to clarify, uh, until now, test and trace, uh, for reasons that we don't have to litigate it here, uh, uh, was, was managed under health and hospitals. But I got to imagine that a public health core as a long-term permanent fixture of our, of our public health strategy for the city would be under the Department of Health and mental hygiene. Is that clearly established? And uh, if so, when, when might that transition happen? Um, there are active discussions about uh, how a public health core, you know, sort of the future state for uh, this neighborhood-based approach that I've been um, describing, uh, exactly how it will be organized. Um, but I do want to point out, you know, sort of from the perspective of a community member, from someone who lives in a neighborhood who has health needs, uh, they are looking for, as you well know, you know, coordination across not just all aspects of city government, but also the institutions, you know, that they trust and who have roots in their communities, um, particularly community-based organizations and faith-based organizations. So um, that's all to say, you know, I think the, the future state of this remains uh, to be worked out in more granular detail. But I, the operating principles will be, yes, the health department plays uh, an extremely important role, given the expertise that we have, given uh, what we're already doing in communities, but it will have to span uh, many different aspects and, and get even further into uh, neighborhoods and in partnership with community-based organizations. And look, you, you've worked in both uh, health and hospitals and obviously now DOHMH. Uh, you love both uh, agencies. I love both agencies. They have critical roles. The New York City Department of Health was built to do exactly the kind of work that I imagine a public health board would do. It's, it's built to do prevention, to do education, to have deep cultural sensitivity, uh, to work with uh, the, the diverse uh, communities of the city uh, I mean, that that's kind of the essence of public health work. And, and, and that, that is uh, uh, quite clearly a core competency of the OHMH. So it doesn't sound like there's any imminent action on this. So I, I guess we don't have to decide it now, but, but just, just putting on the record um, uh, uh, that, that I really believe that falls squarely in the wheelhouse, wheelhouse of, of the DOHMH. Um, just want to ask you about the Neighborhood well, Health Act. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, in terms of the, the neighborhood health action centers, uh, which 
I really believe, and for those who don't know, th this is, um, these are three wonderful uh, on the ground physical facilities the Department of Health has. Uh, there's one in East Harlem, one in the Central Bronx, and one in Brownsville. I don't know if Councilmember Amphrey Samuel is still on, but uh, I know she knows it well in her district. And um, this is actually doing everything that I just mentioned, the, the education, community partnerships, tons of cultural competency, prevention, and it was necessary pre-pandemic, but now, I mean, this has to be the kind of thing we go big on. Uh, and in my opinion is that it needs to be in a lot more than three neighborhoods because there are a lot more than three neighborhoods that were hit very, very hard by this pandemic. And we have a lot of um, work to close equity gaps. Um, could you just tell us whether the, the, the three centers uh, that already exist are now up and running again in, in, in their traditional work, obviously in the pandemics that got disrupted for understandable reasons, and whether there's any plan to grow this network, uh, particularly in light of the, the recent uh, uh, exposure of the terrible inequity in health in the city. Um, thank you so much for this important question as well. And we certainly agree on the fundamental importance of uh, neighborhood-based approaches to public health and the neighborhood health action centers are emblematic of that. Um, they are in so many ways, you know, the backbone of public health infrastructure in the, the communities that they're located in. Uh, at this time, um, there are no plans to, uh, to expand, you know, beyond those, those three sites at this moment, but I think you're absolutely right to point out that um, we have to, as we think about the broader based neighborhood uh, uh, oriented approach, um, how the model that is encapsulated in neighborhood health action centers can be further expanded. And with respect to the current operations, um, and I'll, I'll um, ask my colleague, Dr. Morse, if she wants to elaborate on this, but um, the way that I would frame it is, is maybe just slightly differently than you did, um, Chair Levine, which is that the operations were were not so much disrupted, but they did have to adjust to the reality of uh, the pandemic. And you know what that meant is that, uh, for example, uh, we worked with community-based organizations um, to improve access to testing around uh, one of our neighborhood health action centers. Another one uh, in East Harlem was, uh, you know, home base for our vaccination efforts in the neighborhood. And so, time and again, they were able to step up. Uh, to take on those pressing needs, which is what we should rely upon them to do during a public health emergency. Um, and yes, we're, we're looking forward to the day when we can uh, get back to doing some of the other things that those action centers are responsible for. Yes, as well. and they played a critical role over the past year plus. And, and also, I, I, I think Councilman Rayala was on or still is on. Of course, she has the wonderful East Harlem Center there. And uh, I believe the heart, the, the, the Bronx site is located in the district of Councilmember Feliz. So uh, we have people here who can testify to the power of it. F finally, just, just very quick, wh wh while I have you here, uh, Commissioner, a couple questions on, on our, our current uh, urgent fight on vaccination. Um, could you give us uh, approximately the, an, an estimate on how many first dose vaccines we're giving weekly now? And, and what that would compare to from our peak a month or so ago? Um, good question, Chair Levine. I don't have those numbers at my fingertips. You know, perhaps our staff can, uh, I can quickly um, get them so that we can uh, turn them around to you and, and the rest of the council members. Uh, they are significantly lower than they were a month ago, um, which, uh, which is in some ways not a surprise. You know, we're, we have... Uh, fewer people who, um, uh, you know, who are eligible for vaccination as the campaign has proceeded, uh, but in other ways, uh, sort of lays bare the task that we have ahead of us. Uh, many of the uh, people who are early adopters or who are most eager to get vaccinated have been, um, and so the next phase of our vaccination campaign uh, has to focus on all of the other uh, people and communities who will most benefit from the protection of vaccination. And we've been um, thinking about this uh, around two major pillars, convenience and conversations, where convenience is about doing everything we possibly can to even further lower access barriers uh, to vaccination. 
Uh, that's why we were um, so quick to expand access to uh, vaccination sites as walk-ins um, and are doing uh, a huge number of mobile efforts and pop-up sites. Uh, and we'll look for other ways to continue to make it as convenient as possible for people to get vaccinated. And then with respect to conversations, this has really been about partnering with others, um, clinicians and non-traditional healers in communities so that they have conversations with their own patients um, and then with community-based organizations and faith leaders uh, who are also critically important voices um, to engender trust in the vaccine and vaccination. Yes. Uh, look, I just don't want in, in our exuberance at how far we've come on vaccination for us to forget that still uh, citywide 52% of New Yorkers have not been vaccinated and we can't leave them behind. And I know you know that and I know you're not leaving them behind, but uh, I, I feel this has dropped out of the public consciousness to some extent. And in some of our districts, it's a lot more than 50% who haven't been vaccinated. And the era of waiting for people to come into massive hubs, I mean, that's over, that's done. It's, it's got to be all about getting to people where they live, where they worship, where they work, uh, on their block, in their homes, all of that. Uh, and, and you articulated some of the ways that, that, that the city is trying to do that. Uh, I would argue we need to do much more on all those fronts, but, um, but the, it's a big pivot. It's just this one specific question on a piece of that, one kind of mobile uh, vaccination is actually literally mobile on a bus or like a minivan. And you know that's helpful because you can park in front of a big building complex where the vaccination rates been really low, but also it, it almost like creates an event. It's like, wow, the pink bus is here. It's gonna be here for the next three days. We're gonna knock all the doors in this big nitro development or whatever. And it almost like creates excitement. Uh, it's not the only solution. There's a lot of others that we need, but how many, uh, how many of those pink buses do we have at this point? Um, that's a good question, Chair Levine. I believe we have three of the buses themselves, but we have over 20 mobile vans uh, that, that are also branded, you know, that can create some of that same buzz uh, that you're talking about. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree. You know, it's both about the, the convenience and the narrative of it. If you, if you see it, you know, if we place them in areas where there's high foot traffic, uh, it just makes it easy to, to get vaccinated rather than having to, you know, formulate a plan when someone is very busy between multiple jobs and taking care of their family. Uh, so there's the convenience aspect of it. But then there's also the, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the snowball effect. One person gets vaccinated there, they go back to their apartment building and they tell their neighbors. Um, and so we've been leveraging that as well. Thank so you. I believe I have the numbers right, but our team can follow up if I'm if anything, I may be underestimating the number, but I believe we're at about 23, it may be more. Look, I, I can think of three housing developments in my district alone where I'd love to have one of those things parked today. So I think like citywide, we could really use more of them. Uh, but but I'm, I'm, I, th I thank you for, for uh, all, all, all your answers and for everything you're doing. Uh, and I, I thank Sh Chair Drum for giving me a little bit of extra time. Um, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up here, but... Um, Thank, thank you so much. And, and I guess I'll pass it off to my colleague, uh, Chair Farrah Lewis. Thank you so much, Chair Levine. Good afternoon. Uh, the city recently launched a comprehensive effort to promote universe, universal access to mental health care during the COVID-19 recovery. So just have some quick questions and then I'll uh, pass it over to my colleagues. Wanted to talk really quickly about the mobile treatment teams. Um, I wanted to know, have the locations of where the new mobile treatment teams been determined? Um, I'll start on this and I'll turn to, to Dr. Harrison. Um, there are you know, a number of, of providers uh, whom we work with uh, in terms of um, contracting for those mobile treatment teams. And so I think that um, you know, the brief answer is that we will continue to partner with those existing providers who are able to expand capacity. Um, but then, as you're well aware, uh, Chair Lewis, you know, the, the physical location of the teams is, is mobile. We go to where patients are. Um, and so, you know, we will go to where the need is in that respect. But Dr. Harrison can perhaps elaborate on that. 
Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So um, we have many kinds of mobile treatment teams already existing uh, in the city, over 70 at this point. They are throughout the city. Um, the newer intensive mobile treatment teams are also citywide. So an agency might be in the Bronx, their programs might predominantly serve people in the Bronx, but if an individual that is on their team happens to move to Brooklyn, uh, they will continue to serve that individual wherever that person is. So the teams are not um, necessarily neighborhood specific. We, so we already have 11 teams. Again, they, they are citywide services. We will be expanding uh, 25 more intensive mobile treatment teams. They will be where we need them to be most. And if you have neighborhoods of concern that you would wanna make sure we are focusing on that we are not already aware of, we're happy to hear from you about that. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. So just a quick question, just to piggy off, piggyback off of that. Has DOH image thought about uh, deploying them to high needs neighborhoods for the increase that the mayor just made for these mobile teams, particularly targeted teams in targeted neighborhoods around the city. So oh, do you wanna take that commissioner? No, please go ahead, Dr. Harrison. Uh, so I think we have lots of services that are, that are also targeted. So intensive mobile treatment is for somebody who's disconnected from care with serious mm -hmm. mental illness or substance use disorders, and they're coming to us for a higher level of specialty care. Uh, and that's what those intensive mobile treatment teams are for. We have other services. We have our health engagement and assessment teams, for instance, that are able to focus more at a neighborhood level where they can do outreach and engagement within communities. And we are, we are doing that right now. We have them focused uh, in communities of highest need, uh, whether it's East and Central Harlem, whether it's Washington Heights, whether it is Midtown, those are some of the neighborhoods that we go. We are in neighborhoods in Brooklyn as well. And so we have other means uh, to do some of the outreach. Uh, we have uh, support and connection centers up in uh, Harlem at this point. We have syringe service programs, for instance, in a lot of the same neighborhoods who have outreach that we are expanding in some of these neighborhoods as well. I think if that information is communicated um, to the diverse communities, they'll know that they don't need particularly the mobile intensive teams as opposed to these programs that you guys have. So thank you for sharing that. And I hope we can all work together collaboratively to make sure that information goes out. So I just wanna quickly shift to the mental health amplifiers. Um, how many mental health amplifiers will be hired in the new fiscal budget? Um, thank you for that uh, for that important question. And if you'll allow me, I'll start uh, just by by saying a little bit about the mental health amplifiers, um, which uh, which you're probably aware of. But um, this is a you know a really exciting initiative that that leverages both the um, the physical infrastructure that we have you know through our vaccination sites with this really unique moment that we're in uh, in terms of people um, you know emerging. Uh, from the grief and stress and trauma of the past year uh, and, and giving us an opportunity to really, you know, connect people with services. So the goal of the Mental Health Amplifier program is to, to leverage that moment. You know, I can just tell you my own personal experience at um, the vaccination sites where, uh, where I have done clinical shifts, getting to sit next to someone during their 15-minute uh, observation window, you know, after um, they've gotten their vaccination, it is a time of reflection, you know, a time uh, where they're more receptive to a conversation than they might be otherwise. And so we've really wanted to, um, to leverage that. Uh, so with respect to your question um, about uh, the number of staff, that is not uh, something that I have at my fingertips, but let me see if Dr. Harrison does. Great. Thank you so much for um, elaborating on the program. Again, the mental health amplifier program is having staff resources like community health workers in the city run vaccine sites. And um, it's a very recently launched program um, and we'll be uh, expanding uh, further to some of the health and hospital sites. At this point, I don't have staffing numbers, but I can tell you that in the couple of weeks of operations 
We've had over 20,000 encounters with individuals so far. Um, and we are handing out information about NYC Well, our call, text, and chat line, uh, which is a 24 seven crisis line as well. We are giving information about New York Project Hope, which is a crisis counseling line. And I can uh, offer that phone number if folks want it. It's 844-863-9314. Again, for anybody to access crisis counseling in New York City. And we're also giving information out about access to healthcare through NYC Care. Folks need uh, help with, because uh, they have trouble with insurance and need help there. Uh, so that's what the teams have been doing so far. Thank you for that, Dr. Harrison. I just wanted to know who's training the mental health amplifiers. What does the training comprise of and how are we measuring success? Go ahead, Dr. Harrison. So we have folks from uh, the Division of Mental Hygiene that are uh, training the, the, the team members uh, in what they need to know in terms of encountering folks. And we have supervisors for uh, backup, if anything, if they have questions along the way. The vaccine sites are responsible for the operations. Got it. Thank you for that. DOHMH supports programs in our local DOE schools. I wanted to know if you all can share what these programs are called and what services they provide and how much funding is in the FY22 executive budget for those programs? Um, thanks, Chair Lewis, for the important question. Do you mean specifically what DOHMH supports in schools related to mental health? Yes, sorry about that. Okay, Th thank you for clarifying, no problem. Um, yes, there are a range of different uh, you know, services and supports uh, for um, for students, uh, everything from uh, some of the ways that we support mental health of students through the school nurses um, that DOHMH uh, provides to, uh, you know, more specifically dedicated um, mental health services. So to say a little bit more, I will turn to Dr. Stevens, uh, our Deputy Commissioner of Family and Child Health. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chair, um, for that important question. Um, yes, um, as, as, as you've alluded to, um, we are excited about our schools and the return to schools, but there are some unprecedented challenges that our students have experienced in this past year. So uh, to the Commissioner's good point, we support the school community overall, be that from our partners um, through nursing, capacity building with professionals, engagement with parents, because it takes all of that to try to support the school community. Specifically, we have um, a school uh, mental health specialist program. Um, these are folks in school communities um, who support work in the school in both capacity building, um, running some direct groups, um, the engagement we talked about as well, as well as making sure that we connect expertise um, and make sure that folks uh, get higher levels of care um, and connected to those things. Um, but that's you know, one piece of an overall offering to the student community and the overall school community. We also coordinate very closely with our colleagues at DOE to make sure that our programs align with and support their efforts as well. Um, because as you mentioned, it takes a lot to support school communities. Literally takes a village. A village. Um, <laughs> right? Does the mental health specialist, is that particular individual responsible to track um, the screenings of these students and the referral process? So um, we, we do track some of the supports that we offer in terms of the numbers that, that are engaged in groups, but for some of the data um, and the tracking, we rely on our colleagues at DOE um, to make sure we're tracking um, connections and referrals out, outside. But we are building out um, our metrics and our data systems in partnership with DOE. Got it, thank you so much for that. Um, as, and just to add on, um, as we continue our efforts to address the opioid crisis um, and overdose deaths, particularly um, during this pandemic, in the FY22 preliminary budget, DOHMH increased funding for the number of naloxone kits. So we just wanted to know how has the additional funding impacted the rate of overdose deaths? 
Um, well, thanks for, for this important question as well. And, um, and look, you know, we have to be very sober and serious about uh, the fact that um, the opioid epidemic uh, is of grave concern um, with respect to how it's affecting New Yorkers. And um, the overdose data uh, from 2020, as you pointed out in your uh, opening remarks um, in the first three quarters, uh, is significantly increased compared to uh, in prior years. Uh, this is, um, you know, paralleling uh, the national trend with respect to opioid overdose deaths increasing, uh, and much of it is driven by um, by the fact that fentanyl is more prevalent in the drug supply, uh, and that means uh, that um, that overdoses are unfortunately more likely to occur. Um, the, the positive news and what we have to continue to be dedicated to is uh, we do have treatments that work. Um, so we're uh, further expanding um, our access to medication assisted treatment, particularly buprenorphine programs and lowering access barriers to those programs. Um, we're making sure that people are aware of the presence of fentanyl in the drug supply. So we have a public awareness campaign uh, around fentanyl, and we're um, expanding the distribution of fentanyl test strips as well. Uh, and then the final piece is what you're mentioning, which is uh, which is further expanding um, the ways in which we have uh, distributed naloxone. And this is really a uh, you know something that has to be pervasive. So we've partnered with pharmacies, with healthcare providers. Um, we've done naloxone kit distribution through our our heat teams that you heard about earlier, uh, the syringe service providers that we partner with also focus on naloxone kit distribution as well. So we're going to lever leverage every single channel that we have to, um, you know, to further uh, ensure that people have ready access to naloxone. Thank you, Commissioner. And you mentioned that there were initiatives um, that's happening right now and in the works to combat um, overdose and deaths for the rest of the fiscal year. And how, I wanted to know if you could share some of those initiatives um, that will be implemented in fiscal year 22. Um, certainly, I, I alluded to some of them, uh, you know, particularly around uh, what we're doing with uh, fentanyl, um, you know, some of the investments that you've asked about uh, with respect to uh, more intensive treatment options. So both Connect and the intensive mobile treatment teams Will, uh, will address substance use disorders in addition to uh, other behavioral health issues. Uh, so we've covered, um, we've covered those major domains. Uh, and beyond that, we've talked about naloxone as well. I, those are the major things that are coming to mind for me, but let me see if Dr. Harrison wants to elaborate on any others. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I would add that we are, working with lots of other city agencies as well. We are not doing this effort alone. Um, it is such a um, intensive effort that alone we will not be successful. So in addition to working with the providers in the community, such as syringe service providers, where we're increasing outreach um, for them in the community, we're increasing their drop-in center hours for people to go. Um, if they need. Um, and so there's other ways we're doing it. We are working with our colleagues in um, the police department, in parks, in homeless services, um, and others that, that are escaping me at the moment. But again, it is a really concerted effort um, that we're engaged in to work on the issue of the overdose death rates. Thank you for that, Dr. Harrison. I'm gonna switch over to clubhouses really quickly and ask, um, how were the locations of the 16 clubhouses determined? Um, and is there any plans for expansion in the next fiscal cycle? I certainly, love, I'll just start very briefly and then Dr. Harrison, you know more about this. Um, the, so we're, we're working with existing uh, providers of the clubhouse model um, who, uh, who have been just you know extraordinary partners in um, in ensuring that uh, they're serving uh, again you know patients with serious mental illness. So 
the expansion, the funded expansion for FY22 um, will be uh, at, at those same providers. I do think that maybe some of them will be expanding to some additional locations, but the bulk of the additional people that are served will be through um, the same locations, but just increasing the volume at those locations. Uh, Dr. Harrison, if you wanna say more, please do. Yeah, so um, just to add that these are, as, as you heard, these are 16 existing clubhouse locations, and we are having them expand their membership um, within their programs, and they are, we are working with them closely to find out how they are planning to do that as we enter into this uh, conversation with them. So we will be able to serve, we have about 3,000 people with serious mental illness that use clubhouses at this point in time. We're going to expand that um, to about 3,750. And again, clubhouses are places uh, for people with serious mental illness to go to have a work order day, it's activities, it helps people um, with employment, um, resumes, uh, finding jobs, connections to work, and there's work at the clubhouses as well. Um, and it's a, an evidence-based model uh, mm -hmm. that we have here in New York City amongst these providers at this point in time. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. All right, I'll yield back to, I believe, Chair Drum or Committee Council. Thank you. Thank you. If any council members have questions for DOHMH, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The, the Sergeant will let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Just one moment, we're trying to unmute. Thank you very much. Um, chairs, thank you for an amazing hearing. Uh, Commissioner Chatsky, uh, thank you for the amazing job you've done through this horrendous crisis. You've really um, led, uh, you've risen to the occasion. So it's a hell of a thing to have to do, but thank you for that. Um, I have two very specific questions. First of all, I had the experience of um, noticing a bus. I think Chair Levine was talking about buses being located. And I'm pretty sure it was a, ba a bus to give the vaccine. I'm not positive. It was a week or so ago. It was in my district. And it was absolutely in the wrong spot. And um, so I asked the guy who was there sort of what's up with that. And you know, without getting him into trouble. So don't get him into trouble. He works for a contracted agency and uh, he had no say, and he actually used to work in the area. So he knows exactly where it should be. And before I could finish my sentence, he said, I know we should be at Broadway in 77th. I don't know what we're doing here. So I'm wondering um, just, you know, and I, I noticed Council Member Levine saying, you know, I know the three buildings in my district where that bus should go in front of. So if, is there, could you just commit to working with local electeds or somehow engaging people uh, in where these buses go? Yes, I mean, of course. In the center of my district. So I could see how someone said, oh, let's just put it in the center of our district. Like, Yes, yeah, so I'll just very briefly. So the answer to your question is yes, of course. You know, we we um, we will uh, do that. We have been doing that, but we will uh, you know seek uh, as much input as possible um, with respect to the locations. And it's it's really important for the mobile vaccination options, as you're yeah, well yeah. aware. This bus was, he said, ten percent. It was totally underutilized. And meanwhile, you're paying all this money. We're paying, taxpayers are paying. And he got, you know, just a couple a day. Um, that's really disheartening yes. given that, you know, you've said 52% of the city is not yet vaccinated. 
And so my second question about that is, um, um, you talked about identifying people in communities who can meet the constituents where they are, which all the national public health experts are talking about, so amazing. Um, I was wondering about your public health education budget and whether or not you could use money to more aggressively answer the specific questions that specific but universal questions that people seem to have. Um, you know, whenever we talk, I always bring up NPR or a New Yorker. So recently on, I think it was Radio Lab, I think I could get you the thing, I'll send it to you. They had a, a doctor who was, you know, the main dude in his small community who had a hor was on his deathbed with COVID. All the community came out to help him. Now he's recovered and he's giving out the shots and only half his patients are taking them. And so when patients come in, he sits, everything you're describing, listens, you know, picks out each flaw in what they're saying and responds to it. And it strikes me that you could be doing, you know, there are five misconceptions out there. And you could, if you had more money in your public health education budget, you could be flooding the city with these answers. And it could be in PSAs, it could be bus shelter posters, it could be flyers left in NYCHA buildings or any other building, you know, flyers, great flyers that, you know, all of us could put up in our, you know, the all buildings that, and with a heat map, you could tell us which the buildings are that are not getting vaccinated. We could really just flood communities with that information. Um, you know, especially you could see a little cartoon booklet or page. I mean, and I don't mean cartoon to minimize. I just mean simplistic drawings. Time expired. Thank you, council member. I'll, I'll just make three points in response. Um, first, uh, thank you for always sending me New Yorker and NPR articles because I wouldn't read them otherwise since I don't have that as much time these days. So you're uh, you're helping to educate me, which I very much appreciate. Um, second to your question, uh, so absolutely, you know, I'll just point out um, that uh, our uh, our wonderful communications team, led by um, Maura Kennelly, uh, has done um, really terrific work uh, to get it the the intelligence, you know, behind what you're referring to, meaning. What are those key questions that remain on people's minds? How do we take a data-driven approach to craft our messages? And so just in recent days, uh, Dr. Um, Daniel Stevens, who is a pediatrician and is with us um, for the hearing, uh, answered some of the most common questions from parents now that uh, adolescents are eligible to be vaccinated. And Dr. Michelle Morris, our chief medical officer, um, also did a PSA uh, specifically around questions for fertility and pregnancy and breastfeeding, you know, which we've also heard quite a bit about. So it's we really welcome not my question. I, it's not a question of competence. It's a question of should we double your funding for public health education? I mean, it's often these really small things on the edges that actually fix the problem. I and, hear you. And, and I will, I will never you know, turn I away. went back and read the article that I probably already sent you from the New Yorker back from January, where they explain exactly why this uh, vaccine came about within six days of it coming to, to America, the US. And, you know, a one pager that shows here's the guy, here's what he did boom, you're done. I mean, this has been in the works for 20, 30 years. Scientists have been studying for this moment. Thanks, council member. And, and yes, we'll have to share with you our, our This Is How campaign, um, which, which addresses, I think, some of the, you know, some of the questions that you're alluding so to as I don't well. have a question that you are doing it. My question is, 
how much more money do you need to flood the airwaves? Because if you have to share it with me, my district, then I, I, I don't watch TV, but I listen to, I mean, you know, how are you getting, I, I would like a full detail of how you're getting this messaging out, how, what your total budget is, and I'd love to double it. Well, we, know we, have budget we have budget for it now? resources and we can, we can share that with you. Um, you know, I'm grateful to, uh, to the mayor and to this administration who have really invested uh, quite a bit in our communications, but, uh, but certainly there's always more that can be done. And uh, I have no doubt that this team in particular will be able to put those resources to good use. The last point that I wanted to make is just that um, as much as we are being thoughtful about the messages, uh, we also, you know, to your point from your story, we have to be thoughtful about the messenger as well. And, uh, you know, it's about um, arming uh, the family doctor, uh, but also, um, you know, the uh, the pastor, you know, the and leader. To that leader point, you the, sit down right with a group of pastors. Yeah, I think I'm on yeah. But I mean, so you sit down with them, show them a draft, and they revise it, and then you make a thousand copies. Do you know, is the public health campaign coming out of the Department of Health budget or someone else's budget, another agency budget? No, it's coming out of our budget. How big is that budget? Uh, let me turn to Mr. Jura, who can say more. I think he needs to be unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, for the question. Our budget for media is somewhere north of $140 million. Um, and the vast majority of that funding has been focused on the vaccination campaign. Um, and it's been you know, targeted towards uh, dozens of languages, um, all sorts of that, media. Can I just ask you, is that since 140 million, give me proportionality, is that a one, what's your, is that a one-time flush of money that ends this fiscal year? Uh, is that over the past 18 months? Is that over the past year? Is that a lot of money sure. or a little money? I mean, it's a big city, can, so hearing millions doesn't isn't impressive. What would you do with 114 million more? Sure, I can say a few words. Um, this is by far dramatically uh, the biggest media campaign we've ever done. Well, um, of by course. An order. <laughs> it's a national right. crisis. That's not the question. I'm so sorry, the right. vast majority of the funding has been spent in the last three to four months on the vaccination campaign. How much do you have in 20, FY22? Uh, that will take me a bit, minute to find. Um, we can follow up with that for you, though. Do you think it's 114 million? I'll need to follow up. I'm sure it's not uh, that much, but no, do you think it's um, but we can follow up. Do you think it's 50? We, we can follow up with you on that council I'm member. I'm trying to get a sense of proportionality. I mean, if it if it's 50 or less, it's just not enough. You've got 52% of the city population that's not vaccinated. Thank you chairs for the extra time and your willingness to let me bring out the importance of this. I appreciate you. And yeah, I'd be interested in hearing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chakshi and everybody else from the Department of Health. We appreciate you coming in and giving testimony today. Uh, is, does Chair Levine have a follow-up or uh, Chair Lewis? No, I don't. Thank you so much, Chair. Okay, thank you. And then I guess with that, I'm gonna read this statement and uh, again, just say thank you for all that you've done. Uh, this will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you, DOHMH, for being here. We'll now move on to the New York City Housing Authority. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for NYCHA, uh, a portion of the hearing to remain in the Zoom with your microphone muted until we're ready to begin, and we should be ready to begin shortly.
I'm just waiting for everyone to log on. That's contagious. Uh. <laughs> Chair, while we wait, and I'll just go ahead and test uh, um, Chairman Russell's uh, audio. There we go. All right, how about now? Sounds, sounds, sounds good, sir. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, Piro, uh, Mr. Mastero. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Scott. I'm ready. Great. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. All right. Okay, Chair, you may begin. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's sixth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We previously heard from the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene, and now we will hear from the New York City Housing Authority. We are joined by the Committee on Public Housing, chaired by my colleague, Council member Alika Amphrey Samuel. We are also joined by the following council members. Uh, just bear with me. Uh, council members Adams, Ayala, Brooks Powers, Dinowitz, Gibson, Holden, Lewis, Riley, Rosenthal.
In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but I would like to turn it over to Chair Amphrey Samuel for her statement. Thank you, Chair Drum. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Alika Amphrey Samuel, Chair of the Committee on Public Housing, and we are here to conduct the executive budget hearing on NYCHA's fiscal 2022 executive budget, which includes its fiscal 2021 through 2025 city capital commitment plan and 2022 through 2031 10-year capital strategy. Additionally, members of the committees on finance and public housing will address components of NYCHA's adopted five-year operating and capital plans for year 2021 to 2025. I would like to first thank my co-chair for this hearing, council member finance chair, Danny Drum, and the members of the public housing committee. While chair of the public housing committee, I represent the 41st council district, which is home to the most densely populated public housing developments than any other district in New York City. I am also a proud former NYCHA resident. NYCHA has operated the largest public housing program in the nation for over 75 years, providing affordable housing to over 400,000 low and moderate income city residents and serving nearly 200,000 additional New Yorkers through its Section 8 program. I reviewed the video of the budget hearings from May 16th of 2018, May 7th of 2019, and the preliminary budget of 2020 because there wasn't an executive budget hearing in 2020. At that time, dating back to 2018, there were 328 developments and now, it's down to 302. In recent years, the budgetary challenges and funding short holes, shortfalls facing NYCHA have been front and center as NYCHA attempts to address the very physical needs across its aging buildings and pursue strategies to address structural funding deficits. These efforts have fallen short of providing real improvements that NYCHA residents can see and feel. NYCHA's total revenues for 2021 are approximately 4.1 billion and about 1 billion or 25% of NYCHA's fiscal 2021 budget is comprised of tenant revenue. And revenue from federal sources account for approximately 2.4 billion or 58% of NYCHA's total revenue. Total other revenue, which includes 248 million in city funds is projected to be about 684 million in 2021. While the long-term funding challenges confronting NYCHA cannot be resolved immediately, the city continues to contribute towards addressing NYCHA's numerous programmatic and fiscal needs. The administration has allocated 2.9 billion in capital funds between fiscal year 2021 and 2025 for roofs and other critical building system improvements. And at the state level, another 200 million is expected to supplement this work. The council will continue to build our partnerships with NYCHA throughout these changes. And we will seek new opportunities to strengthen these partnerships and secure additional funding resources for NYCHA operations and repairs. I would like to thank NYCHA staff for joining us today. And I look forward to, the, to today's hearing and discussion. And as a reminder, during the executive budget hearing cycle, all public testimony is given during one hearing at the conclusion of the cycle. So this year, public testimony will be heard on Tuesday, May 25th, starting at 10 a.m. I would also like to thank the council's finance team members, Chima, Luke, and Nate. And I would also like to acknowledge Audrey Sun, Jose Condi, Ricky, and Chowler from the Public Housing Committee, and my own staff, Naomi and Everton. Now I turn it back to finance chair, Danny Drum. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member and chair. Uh, now we're going to hear testimony from NYCHA. We are joined by Greg Ross, the chair and chief executive officer of the New York City Housing Authority. Before NYCHA begins uh, their testimony, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural uh, items and to swear in the witnesses. Thank you, chair. My name is Stephanie Louise and I'm counsel to the New York City's Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you'll need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Mm -hmm. 
During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use mm. the Zoom chatting function and you'll be called on to speak. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to administration witnesses, including those available for Q&A. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? NYCHA Chair and CEO, Greg Russ? I do. Thank you. Mr. Vito Masatulio? Uh, I do. Thank you. Ms. Anika Leska? I do. Thank you. Mr. Ross, you may begin when ready. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to address the council today. And uh, chairs, uh, Alika Amprey Samuel and Daniel Drum, members of the Committee on Public Housing and Finance, other distinguished members of the city council, NYCHA residents, members of the public, uh, good afternoon. My name is Greg Russ. I am NYCHA chair and CEO, and I'm joined today by our chief operating officer, Vito Mastachulo, and our executive vice president of finance and chief financial officer, Anika Lescott, and other members of the NYCHA team. Thank you again for the opportunity to present this update on the authority's financial outlook and improve uh, uh, and our work to transform uh, the housing authority and improve our residents' quality of life. But first, I want to acknowledge the efforts and dedication of our finance department. NYCHA was recently recognized for excellence in financial reporting by the Government Financial Officers Association of the United States and Canada. This is a, a very uh, important award for the finance people, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, folks had a chance to hear about it, uh, and we were very pleased to be recipients. So during our preliminary budget testimony before the council in March, we presented information about the financial impact of the COVID pandemic, details on our adopted budget and our funding landscape, the status of our transformation plan, the progress we've made to deliver better services uh, for residents through the HUD agreement and our efforts to comprehensively rehabilitate and upgrade our residents' homes. So today I'd like to follow up uh, in those areas. On uh, the pandemic, to date, we've spent about $121 million in response to the pandemic. This is on safety measures such as additional sanitation and personal protective equipment. As of the end of April, NYCHA has also experienced uh, rent decreases for about 57,000 households in public housing and 5,600 in Section 8 who have lost work or income due to the pandemic. This results in about a $70 million reduction in rent collection and together with the increased expenses, adds about 192 million in cost uh, for the housing authority. Based on our preliminary information we have this year with respect to federal operating funds, we think we may receive more operating subsidy from the federal government. When we presented our budget uh, earlier, we were carrying about a $25 million operating deficit for 2021, and we believe the additional subsidy will help us address uh, that deficit and some of our losses in rent collection. We are grateful to representatives in Washington who have been advocating for more public housing funded funding, both operating and capital. As part of the most recent federal stimulus bill, we are receiving an additional $81 million, but this is all in the voucher program, about 5,700 Section 8 vouchers. These are very specific vouchers targeted to uh, individuals or families who are at risk of homeless uh, are homeless, victims of domestic violence or human trafficking. HUD has established and through the congressional requirements uh, specific rules around these vouchers and we'll be working with um, some of our other agencies in the city uh, to figure out how to get this money out into the community. Uh, we're also incredibly grateful to the city for their support. We expect to receive about 257 million in operating funds this year, including 7 million uh, towards the 1,000 seasonal workers that we're going to try and hire through Mayor de Blasio's City Cleanup Corps initiative. The state has already has provided an additional 200 million in funding this year. We just got that uh, through the legislature, so we'll be working with them and the governor's office on preparing a plan on how we would use these uh, funds to upgrade our properties. Our outlook on expenses has not changed. We are hiring to meet our budgeted staffing levels and to help address the massive demands of our aging buildings. We continue to implement elements of our transformation plan. This envisions potential operational and organizational changes, some of which are underway already, uh, 
that will improve customer Ooh. service and responsiveness to conditions at our developments. Ensure that our large construction projects are completed in a timely manner and promote accountability through property management performance metrics. The plan's initiatives will enable us to better manage our properties, better use our limited funding, and improve service to our residents. Our neighborhood model, which creates smaller property management portfolios, brings decision-making and resources to the developments. It's a critical piece of our reform efforts. As part of our work to strengthen property-based budgeting, this month we are rolling out a new training for property managers and some resident leaders on budget concepts and process. Last month, NYCHA's board approved changes outlined in the transformation plan that strengthened the management of our organization by promoting a more effective and accountable leadership team. This involves the creation of new board committees, which empowers board members to guide the development of policy and provide oversights in the areas of audit and finance, operating compliance and capital, resident and community affairs, and governance. The changes also established the title of Chief Operating Officer, formerly General Manager. As part of our work to streamline executive leadership, we're also creating a position called Chief Asset and Capital Management Officer, who will oversee both real estate and capital projects. This position is posted and we are actively recruiting. We're also doing uh, streamlining in our business processes. We are revamping the annual review process for residents and we're on the threshold of initiating our pilot to improve the alternative work schedule program. We recently established a resident roundtable to provide residents with ongoing opportunities to give input into the transformation plan. Our progress is driven in part by 18 working groups formed as part of the transformation plan. This includes taking on such uh, issues like work order reform, uh, I mentioned AWS, closing work tickets, lease enforcement, property-based budgeting, procurement, and more. Residents will participate in several of those working groups, and all those groups include representatives from HUD, the Southern District, and the Monitor team. We will continue to engage our stakeholders and partners to incorporate feedback as we bring the transformation strategies to life. The next steps are to develop the first part of our implementation uh, by September 21st and a second part by June of 22. This does not mean that we're waiting till those times to start the reforms. This is the times that we are reporting uh, the implementation plan back to HUD in the Southern District. These are major changes that will dramatic, dramatically strengthen the organization. They build on some of the other advancements we've made to better serve our residents. We made the transformation plan uh, public. We opened it for public comment last December, and we received concurrence from HUD in the Southern District in March. We are trying to launch the Blueprint for Change proposal to enable NYCHA to overcome its complex capital funding challenges and renovate every building and every apartment in the portfolio. We continue to work to upgrade our residents' homes using PACT and RAD. And we're making progress in critical and impactful work to achieve compliance with the HUD agreement bringing down the time it takes to resolve elevator and heat outages, as well as a number of uh, heat outages, installing roof fans at our developments to help combat mold, completing over 90,000 XRF lead paint inspections at our apartments, and establishing a new program, Tempo, to bring faster repairs and abatement to the homes where children under six live or visit. While we transform our organization, we also need to transform our buildings. Our buildings have over 40 billion in major repair needs, and the needs grow at the rate of about a billion dollars a year. It is impossible to keep up with the demands of the deteriorating properties through government funding alone. Addressing the issues driven by the condition of our buildings, leaks, mold, and failing systems is costly, and we're already spending more than we receive for basic operation and maintenance of our developments. Instead, we want to invest in our properties with sustainable, realistic models that bring them total renovations and the upgrades they desperately need instead of helter-skelter or stopgap repair solutions. With our PAC preservation initiative, we are bringing comprehensive repairs and upgrades to at least 62,000 apartments while safeguarding resident rights and protections. To date, over 9,500 apartments uh, are currently in construction or have been renovated through PACT at 50 developments across the city. This represents nearly 1.8 billion in capital improvements, like brand new kitchens and baths, 
upgraded building systems, including elevators and boilers, improved grounds and common areas, that's playgrounds and security systems. Another 6,500 apartments at 11 sites are slated to begin comprehensive repairs and upgrades by the end of this year. And we are meeting with an additional 38 sites looking to raise in another 2.1 billion in major repair needs. Together with PACT and the Blueprint, the Preservation Trust, these proposals will ensure that all our residents have the buildings and apartments they deserve, regardless of the funding we receive from DC. These preservation initiatives will enable us to transform half century old buildings that have suffered from decades of disinvestment. The need for a new direction is clear. We owe it to our current residents and to our future generations to invest in our properties now. The HUD agreement and the transformation plan are critical to the success of our organization and our residents' quality of life. But they come with a price tag, and this stretches our already limited financial resources. And these, these commitments did not come with any additional or dedicated federal funding. To address the more than 40 billion in capital needs and deliver to residents the homes they deserve, we must continue pursuing innovative solutions like the Blueprint. The Blueprint Trust model, for example, can access additional federal subsidy that is currently not available to NYCHA and through procurement enhancements can deliver high quality repairs and improvements faster. Even if NYCHA receives some or all the capital funding we need from the Biden administration, the trust can be used to more effectively deploy that funding and access additional federal subsidies to more fully rehabilitate every single one of our properties. We believe we cannot wait for the federal budget to improve. With your support, we can take actions now that will enable the authority to better serve residents today and for generations to come. That includes the creation of the public trust as a partner with NYCHA to serve as an affected steward of our properties. Thank you so much. We are happy to answer questions you may have. I look forward to keeping you updated on our work to create a stronger NYCHA for our residents. That concludes my statement. Thank you, Chair Russ. Let me just say that we have been joined by Council Member Diaz, Senior Jonai Salamanca and Van Bremer. Um, very good. Let me just go to my questions now. Um, new needs in the executive budget. Federal funds of $20 million were added in the fiscal 2022 executive budget and labeled as disaster relief out year balance in the documents uh, provided by OMB. Could you please elaborate on the purpose of this funding and describe the programs that will be funded? Uh, sure, thank you so much. This funding is for site restoration that was not covered by the FEMA uh, Sandy recovery and it's at those construction sites. These funds will be used to replace trees that were removed, restore the sites after our work to build things like mm -hmm. new boiler plants, plants or uh, to uh, 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 raise critical equipment off the ground. So we have um, 35 NYCHA developments damaged by Sandy that are now receiving FEMA money. Um, 20 of them are gonna be receiving heat and hot water systems and 210 buildings will also receive uh, full load emergency backup. So the funding that uh, uh, you mentioned in your question would be used at these properties to finish off that, that work. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, federal funds of $7 million in fiscal 21 and $16.7 million in fiscal 22 were added into the executive budget to fund NYCHA's cleanup core. This is part of the largest citywide program to hire 10,000 New Yorkers to conduct sanitation work. Will these workers be employed by NYCHA and how many have been hired to date and how many will be hired in total? So uh, we are shooting to hire about 1,072 uh, individuals. We have just started that process. In fact, I think this week it's just uh, gotten off the ground. And they will be uh, six-month assignment temporary workers. Um, uh, they'll assist with uh, outdoor green space, playground maintenance. Um, they'll support some of the tenant association work. They'll be in the buildings cleaning, among other activities. And will they be paid or employed directly by NYCHA? That's my understanding. I, uh, if uh, Vito, is, uh, is that correct? They would be six months temporary workers? That's correct, Rick. The uh, Clean Corps program is a six month program. 
they are being processed by NYCHA, um, so they'll they will be on our payroll, uh, but we are receiving funds for that uh, for that program. Okay, thank you. And how, what's the process for prioritizing the developments, and how will staff be allocated across the, the developments? I'm going to start, and then I'm going to let uh, 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 Vito finish up. But we're looking, as I said, for various roles across uh, everything from grounds to uh, uh, playground maintenance. But I'll uh, I'll let Vito address uh, what we're thinking about in terms of deployment. Sure. So for our developments, uh, we're looking to deploy about 880 um, of the total number. And, and as the chair indicated, that would be for um, upkeep and and, um, and support of the grounds. Um, so they would be working side by side with our caretakers, um, as well as doing interior work, uh, such as floor maintenance. Um, there are 50 assigned for the playground um, unit, 100 for, for pest and waste management, um, 100 for resident engagement, uh, so what we did was we basically took the same formula that we use for assigning caretakers, and we use that formula to uh, to equalize and divide up the the staff from the clean core, so they're dispersed accordingly. So not one development gets uh, more of their share. Okay, thank you. Um, let me talk a little bit about the um, smoke-free program. Can you provide us with an update on the smoke-free initiative and the amount of funding dedicated uh, to this program? Sure. Um, we started a smoke-free policy in July of 2018. Um, this was part of uh, uh, just uh, kind of doing the right thing uh, health-wise, but also because um, HUD had begun to uh, really uh, uh, facilitate this kind of thing. And the policy was implemented in con consultation with an advisory group on smoking and health. And in 2020, NYCHA has also recruited and hired a smoke-free NYCHA liaisons to provide uh, support to the developments uh, and begin to get the message out. Um, we have um, approximately a uh, million five committed from uh, the tobacco tax revenue that uh, goes to this program. And it also involves us partnering with other organizations to get the word out, uh, get the signage and get folks uh, awareness raised about the issues around smoking and where it's prohibited under the new policy. And Director, what measures are being used to um, evaluate or the progress of the initiative? So we have several, I mean, some of them are pretty basic, uh, making sure there's signage at each of the properties to remind people about the policy. Uh, the volume of reported violations or informal conferences required, we'd be looking at that and any additional enforcement actions that might be subsequent to that. We've had um, uh, uh, fairly good support on the policy and uh, would likely in the future try to measure the resident awareness of, of this. And uh, we also now can uh, look at the outreach from the, the smoke-free liaison team as a uh, measurable uh, interaction with, with our communities. Okay, thank you. Uh, NYCHA received a rollover of, of unspent federal funding in fiscal 21, totaling 2.6 million. This funding comes from the Lower Manhattan Development Corps to fund security and safety upgrades at developments in Lower Manhattan. Could you please provide an update on the work being done at these locations and a timeline on when the work will be completed? Sure. So. Um, as of now, we have uh, 45 Allen, Baruch Edition, Gompers, Hernandez, Stewart Park Extension, Lower East Side, Vladik 1 and 2, and also a separate item for Vladik 2. These are local law 11 restoration work, as well as exterior lighting uh, and some uh, new exterior compactors at some locations and some grounds improvements and play areas. Uh, the physical work, uh, for these funds was completed for the most part prior to December 2019, with the exception of Vladik 1 and 2. Um, and that was completed in January of 2020. Of uh, the 2.6 million we received, we spent about 1.6. So it came in under budget and unspent funds are gonna be reallocated to new properties in a new scope uh, that would include Smith, Rutgers, uh, LaGuardia and LaGuardia Edition and two bridges to finish off uh, the funding that we received through that. Thank you. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about capital. 
The uh, executive 10 year capital strategy provides $2.9 billion for NYCHA in support of its capital program goals from 22 to 31. When compared to the preliminary 10 year capital strategy, uh, there is an $850,000 increase in fiscal 22 for housing upgrades. Can you please explain what upgrades the 850,000 will fund? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask um, uh, our CFO if she could um, kind of address where that 850,000 would be spent. Oh, here we go. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for that question. So the 850,000 will support four projects, Marcy Community Center tech upgrades, Lincoln Community Center ADA bathroom upgrades, Jefferson Child Education Playground Renovation and White Houses Playground Renovation. Okay, thank you. Uh, as part of the borough-based jails initiative and associated budget re uh, reallocation, 25.9 million was transferred to NYCHA for community center reconstruction, new lighting, security cameras and upgraded accessible play equipment at Millbrook, Mitchell, Mott Haven and Patterson houses. How much of this funding has been committed? So uh, for those sites and locations, um, uh, design is scheduled uh, uh, to begin this year. And the timeline for completion of the projects is May of 2024. That's, um, so we're, we're at the beginning of this. And, and when you say that we're at the beginning of it, are those funds actually committed? Um, uh, Anika, would they type, would we consider them committed at this point? I don't believe so. Yeah, we're still in design. They won't be committed till we get a contract. Okay. And, and you said you think you're going to get a contract when? Well, we'll do design this year and then we would go out uh, for the vendors. Um, I don't have a date, but we could provide one after I talk to the design people. I could give you a better answer. Okay. Um, according to the 10 year capital strategy, NYCHA has committed 930 million for weatherproofing buildings against water damage to prevent mold growth, and the executive capital commitment plan committed 740 million to roof related work. How much of this funding has been committed to remediation projects? So, um, this is a really important uh, source of funding for us because it addresses the roofs. Uh, we have received about uh, uh, 583 million and have obligated about 428 million towards uh, roof replacements and continue to obligate uh, uh, every fiscal year. Uh, we've prioritized locations based on the physical needs assessment and the number of work order tickets, for example, from leaks. Uh, generally speaking, these projects uh, take about uh, a design time of about 12 months, construction three to four months, and for each building, it's somewhere between 1.8 to 2.4 million. So we're, uh, 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 we've been spending against that and continue to roll those tranches out uh, every year. So does this funding include uh, mold, mold remediation? Um, it includes weatherproofing uh, to prevent water from penetrating. Um, Vito, does it include other items besides the roof or is it roofs only? Uh, Chair, I'm going to have to double check. I believe it only includes roofs, but as you indicated, that is a major source of, of uh, water penetration. So indirectly, it will address both conditions, but so, we'll check to see if it goes further than roofs. Yeah, I just was curious because once the roof is done, of course, obviously, then the mold needs to be remediated. Uh, it's, it's definitely one of the contributing factors. Yes. yes. Yeah. But is there money to do the mold rem uh, remediation? Well, that's coming through a variety of sources. Uh, we have the, the larger capital action plan includes some of that. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of federal money uh, on the mold uh, remediation that we're spending. And we have uh, the mold teams uh, set up as well, the mold busters. So I would say that this funding um, uh, addresses one cause of mold and we have other sources of funds to uh, uh, address um, uh, the actual remediation. So, uh, Director, 
for me, like I live in a, in a private residence when uh, we have a, a roof leak or something like that, they have to fix the roof first and then they go and they do the mold remediation. Is that what we can expect to see here as well? The roof will be fixed and then a short time after that, mold remediation would be addressed in that same building? Uh, it is possible. But I would, I would caution with NYCHA, the one thing that often happens for us is in addition to the roofs, we have the piping and riser issues. So we can go in and remediate, and we do, but that isn't going to be a guarantee because of the leaks in the waistline and the supply lines that we're going to have a, um, a building that's going to be um, uh, mold-free. Uh, a lot of times, we can see tickets right up the stack. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why uh, some of this work is beginning to push us into the capital repairs that we need. But we will remediate where we can, yes. And uh, on the roof repairs, um, is there a guarantee on those, a timeline uh, in terms of how long that roof repair is expected to last? Um, I believe there is, but I, I would be, uh, defer to Vito if he, he knows exactly uh, what the warranty issues are or information. Yeah, I, I, my apologies. I don't know the uh, number of years that the warranty covers, uh, but we do capture that information or just put it into our database. Uh, so we do know when a roof is still covered under warranty. Uh, because what we don't want is for staff to go um, up to the roof and, and make a repair um, or to do any work that might breach the warranty. So we do capture that information. It, it's tracked in our database and we can certainly get back to you with um, the duration of the warranties. Okay, I mean, I just purchased a small little house and uh, I got a 15 year warranty on it. So hopefully yeah. it'll be it. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're hopefully hoping it's at least. I know NYCHA gets the same warranty or more. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh, sorry. Uh, Chair, yeah. uh, it's a 30 year warranty. Oh boy, I should have done yeah. better than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, what's the average amount of time and funding it takes to waterproof a, uh, a single location? Um, I think uh, it, it does vary depending on the um, uh, location and building height. Uh, we see a range from about 1.8 to 2.4 million per, per building. Okay, and time? Um, about three to four months um, in terms of work. Um, I don't know, Vito, I, uh, did, did you want to add anything to that uh, from no, your no. side? No, no, Chair. Okay. okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Amphrey Samuel, and she has questions, and then we'll do council other questions. Thank you again. Thank right. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to jump back to federal funding. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, known as the CARES Act, signed into law in March 2020 provided approximately $12 billion nationally to HUD for community development and housing programs. Can NYCHA provide details on how much federal stimulus money it has received to date through which programs and how the funding is being utilized? Sure, um, I'm gonna ask um, our CFO if, if she could just give us a summary in those areas. Great, thank you. Thank you for the question. So NYCHA received 150 million in CARES Act public housing operating funds and 37 million in CARES Act Section 8 administrative fees. This flexible funding source can be used to support COVID response effort as well as our normal programmatic expenses. The deadline has been updated, so all funds must be spent by December 31st of 2021. In terms of expenditures through April 2021, NYCHA spent 121 million in CARES Act public housing funds and close to 3 million in CARES Act Section 8 funds. And we anticipate that we will meet all of the expenditure deadlines. Okay, and that's the 120, that's 121 million out of the 150. That's correct. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. And um, it might be worth mentioning because you were talking about stimulus, um, the chair mentioned in his testimony, but we also received an allocation of emergency housing choice vouchers from the American Rescue Plan. Um, and that award is worth $81.3 million. And how will you utilize that? So those funds are for, for specific populations. So those that are homeless, at risk of homelessness, um, domestic violence, and, and Chair Russ, I don't know if you want to give some more context to that. Yeah, the uh, 
uh, council member, the, the way that uh, Congress passed this um, is really uh, very targeted. So we have at-risk families described. These have to be tenant-based vouchers, for example. Uh, we have to work with uh, continuum of care and other providers around this. So um, we're still, we just got the um, uh, award letter uh, from HUD in this week, in fact. So we'll be developing plans to, uh, to you know, focus on how we get those vouchers out into the community. Okay, and is that related to at all um, the disbursement of the five billion in the American Recovery Act funding for the temporary voucher, the temporary housing vouchers, or is this something different? I think this is separate to. I think there's two separate pots: one in the okay. first bill, one in the second. Okay, all right. That's so correct. I'll to my next question for Clark. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. Know, so we mentioned um, in the preliminary budget that um, NYCHA stated that HUD had 60 days to develop a formula that would determine how to disperse $5 billion in the American Recovery Act funded for temporary housing vouchers. So I just wanted to get an update on how much of this funding will be allocated to NYCHA and what are the conditions for this funding. And this came out during the preliminary budget hearing. And so I just wanted to get yeah. an update on that. And if you can clarify the two different ones. Sure. And Nika, I'm, I um, do you have do you have anything you we could we can get to to the question with this on? I'm not. So the bill that included the five billion is the American yeah. Rescue Plan, and that's the bill for which we received the eighty one point three million in emergency vouchers. But so there's but, two pots of money. But the first pot, the one that was passed, is that the one for the the sort of emergency housing vouchers? Do you know? And council member, there is a separate um, path for these emergency housing vouchers that's being developed in conjunction with the state. But rather than give you, let me let me check on that because I believe um, we had hoped that we would be direct recipients, but we we may not. And I can send you a clarification on both these. So so you're you know, but let uh, let me check on that first pot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, sorry that, but we're still um, threading some of this uh, through ourselves as it uh, as it unfolds. Okay, and just understand that there's you know funding coming from so many different pots. Right. And, right. And, and, yeah. And, 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 and that some of it goes through the, from from the federal government to the state, and how do you do that? Which is a separate formula from you getting money. Yes. Back. Yes. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> it gets quite confusing. Um, NYCHA reported that as of the close of the 2020 calendar year, it spent almost 70% of its total 3.2 billion earmarked for Sandy recovery projects. Additionally, the authority would finish all Hurricane Sandy related capital projects by 2023. What is the total federal investment in NYCHA for Hurricane Sandy recovery? And well, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the CFO if she can give us a number. Just a total federal investment. I'm going to look for that. I, I will get back to you shortly. I'm sorry. I know that we have that here. Okay. And so while you're looking for that, um, you cited that 25 projects that are nearing completion projected to be completed by the end of 2021. Does NYCHA still think that these projects will be completed by the end of this year? And what is what work remains to be done on those sites? As far as I know, we're still on, on schedule. Um, and uh, uh, I would like, because it's such a large number of properties, I'd like to give you um, a site-by-site -site response uh, to that question, which I, I do not have uh, for you today, but we can follow it up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Have we, you had it, that has been completed already? So like out of the 25 have, since we are- uh, I know we're actively yeah. working at most of those properties, council member. I, I don't want to say that we've got, we have substantial work completed at a number of sites, but I would actually need to talk to the project managers to give you a good answer. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna um, jump into some questions related to state funding. 
The 2022 state enacted budget passed last month includes 200 million for NYCHA. However, this funding is only offered to NYCHA on a reimbursement basis and to be done jointly with the state dormitory authority, making it possibly very difficult for NYCHA to access these funds. How is NYCHA engaging with the state to best access this funding stream? And have any projects been identified for this year's $200 million? So uh, we just, um, uh, uh, this legislative session got word on the 200. So the process will be, we'll have to propose a plan uh, to the governor's office and the state department of budget. And we hope to have that plan completed uh, uh, sometime next month and submit it. Uh, we're thinking, we don't have it nailed down yet. We're thinking we would spend it on one of the compliance areas. But once we have the uh, a plan completed, we would like to share it with you and we can uh, show you where that 200 million is going. Of course, it's still subject to uh, state review, but uh, uh, we could provide more information once we uh, fix on which compliance area we intend to work on. Can I just jump in here, uh, Chair Amphrey Samuel, if you don't mind yeah. for a moment. This is something that's been a, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is that the state, you know, the governor's fancy is, you know, they say, oh, we're putting 200 million into NYCHA. It never really materializes. Uh, and oftentimes they point the finger at NYCHA to say that they've never been able to draw it down. Are we confident that we're gonna be able to draw this down? Um, can you just go a little bit further on that for me? Um, yes, I think we are. I think, um, I think some of the issues in some of the past allocations have been coming up with a plan and negotiating that. I think that's been difficult at times. And I'm not saying that the state, the state has the right to ask their questions. Um, and I think we just uh, went through a longer process though with the 450 million that was approved for elevators and heat plants. And that took uh, on a more complicated set of issues because it also involved, we had to have the federal monitor involved. We had to come up with the uh, kind of an action plan for that. And I think we, uh, we are in design build for that. We're really hopeful that by the end of this year, we'll be awarding some contracts, but that took longer to navigate, I think, than typically. We're, we believe that what was approved uh, this year uh, is, um, uh, is going to be a little easier to access. Um, we're likely going to propose maybe just one compliance area. So, you know, it's going to be spent this way or over here, and then that might make it a little cleaner for us. So um, uh, that's our thought now. We, th we think we'll be able to access it uh, more readily than perhaps some of the more complicated grants we've received. Okay, thank you, Chair and, and for Samuel, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can you just clarify what you mean by compliance areas for those that do not Oh, know? sure, uh, we would be putting it into lead, mold, uh, pest waste, elevators, heat, uh, uh, one of those areas that's defined in the HUD agreement. And council member to your other question on the Sandy. Uh, 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 Capital's telling me we are, or, uh, we are on schedule. Um, uh, and that there are uh, uh, three sites that are going to go into 22 and four sites the work is going to go into 23. And uh, what we can give you is uh, kind of the laundry list of, of that. And um, So that means that there would be about 18 projects that will be mm -hmm. completed by the end mm -hmm. of the year? Just doing That's, some quick math? Yep, okay. doing the quick math. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to jump to my last set of questions before I um, turn it over to our colleagues. Rad Pack Conversions, another major program that NYCHA is pursuing in order to stabilize and improve fiscal conditions within its portfolio is the Rental Assistance Demonstration or Permanent Affordability Commitment Together Pact, so Rad Pact. The program aims to convert the funding stream of an estimated 62,000 NYCHA units from public housing operating funds known as Section 9 to Section 8 funding. As part of the Department of Housing and Preservation's 10-year capital plan, 300 million is allocated to NYCHA in fiscal 2022 
for RAD transactions. Can you please provide us with an update on the transaction for the upcoming new bundles of units scheduled for 2021? And what is the timeline for the transaction? And to date, how many units have been converted under NYCHA's administration of the RAD program um, across the bundles and developments? Sure. So um, under the RAD, we have converted about 9,517 units. That's eight bundles, 50 developments. Uh, to date, those conversions have raised uh, 1.76 billion in capital improvements based on the 20 year need across those uh, developments. Um, and uh, we're planning to convert another 6,500 units in 2021 and working with um, those properties uh, to keep to keep that on schedule for this year. And um, uh, there'll be uh, additional rounds, probably uh, requests for expression of interest later in this year. Uh, we'll put another one of those uh, uh, documents out, but that would be uh, for conversions that would likely occur next year. So with, with everything you just said, um, how just can you explain how that 1.76 billion that came in, how was that actually utilized to bring down your total estimated capital need? Because we hear that, you know, $40 billion, you know, a few years ago was 17 billion, but with these conversions, the capital repair needs continue to increase. Yes. But you've made um, these conversions and you receive yeah. funding. Can you explain why that need is not decreasing as opposed to increasing? So um, first, these properties have received substantial improvement. Let's let's be clear about that. These these are new kitchens and baths, new systems, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, but one of the things is uh, every property that's not converted is um, uh, uh, waiting uh, and still uh, counting, of course. Uh, this does eat into the 40, but keep in mind the 40 is also increasing at about a billion dollars a year. So as the properties deteriorate and the needs are recalculated, um, we're, we're eating into some of them. We're not taking a big enough bite, I guess, maybe is the easiest way to say that. So it does have an impact. It certainly benefits each property. But because, uh, for example, when we think about the other 110,000 properties, um, those needs are significant, and obviously we have planned to try to address that. But those rates of of increase uh, PNA, um, in my view, kind of uh, as long as we're uh, we we are decreasing the physical needs, but that doesn't stop the other properties from ma making higher demand. So there's offset. Um, I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't help. It does help tremendously. It eats into that 40 billion, but maybe not at fast enough rate that we'd like to see. Uh, obviously, we're confined by uh, the process to do the resident engagement, get the thing set up, and do it correctly. Um, uh, so it makes a dent, but not perhaps a, as big a one as we would wish. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Chair Drum, I'm going to stop there because I know that you know our colleagues had their hands raised. If any council member has questions for NYCHA, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Also, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Hey, Chair, how are you doing? Good, Council Member. Good. I'm double Zooming, so sorry if <laughs> I unmute the wrong thing at the wrong I'm time. I'm filled with admiration that you could even yeah, consider no, I that. I do it all the time. I really am curious about the, I'm, I'm, I'm now the chair of the committee, the subcommittee on the capital budget. And I'd like to have a better understanding of what you have in your commitment plan for this fiscal year and how much you plan to spend in this fiscal year and what your commitment plan is for next year. For, for capital spending? Yes. Okay, um, I'm going to ask um, uh, Anika if she could uh, go ahead and give us the numbers that we have proposed there.
Sorry, I had a hard time getting off mute. Um, So in terms of the OMB executive plan, um, there is 1.6 billion in total city capital committed to NYCHA. Um, and that is both um, borough president, council and mayoral. And that's for the upcoming year. Sorry, Mike, I, it just to be, let's just, um, so let me just uh, be clear. So I want to know what's the capital for this fiscal year and how much have you spent this year? FY21. So okay, so for FY21, our capital commitment rate is 5%. Of no, that's the not what I asked. What's your total capital plan? What's the dollar amount? For city capital? So uh, I, I guess all, I'm trying to understand. Uh, yeah. Put them the all together. No, no need to separate. Don't make it more okay. complicated. Um, I say the capital project budget estimated this year for 21 is $2.2 billion. Okay. Uh, and how much uh, have you spent or projected um, to spend by the end of the year? So um, I don't have, um, I know we're spending uh, somewhere around. Well, it's, uh, no, no. Well, the, because the capital comes from three different sources. Um, uh, so the federal capital, we always spend in terms of the two years to obligate, four years to expend. And we burn through about um, um, I mean, that's million. a good first question. Do you spend all the capital money you get each year? Not all of it, no. We carry, no, you're not. allowed, well, the federal capital allows two years just to sign a contract. Do you spend all of it within the two years you're allowed? Yes. Yes. Is there we, ever we, any remaining? Um, uh, we we have a really good track record on two years okay. to, ca to contract. So let's set aside the capital. Yeah, yeah. Let's set aside federal. Sure. What's the so now we're left with what city and state? Yes, um, city funding. Uh, of course, we have the four hundred and fifty million that we're be going to be spending towards uh, boilers and uh, elevators. That's been in design build, and we'll probably. Uh, we've been. Uh, uh, if you could just do so, the so how, uh, what's the commit? What's the spend rate on your capital commitment plan for FY twenty one, excluding federal? About sixty million to seventy million a month. Each what's month. The universe. Against uh, some of the numbers I was just describing, so we're. Right. I don't mean I. Maybe I'm not paying attention because I really am double zooming. So fiscal year 21. Your total non-federal is how much? Um, we have all the state funding that uh, has been obligated in in future years, and that's in design. So it's in design. And we have been drawing down for design funds, but we haven't spent the capital portions of that. So we plan to uh, hope to have that under contract Ms. by the end of I, the year. I don't, this should be such a simple answer. I don't know how to ask the question to make it simple. Uh, uh, well, part of the so complex. Let's exclude state, let's exclude federal and just talk about city. Is that, maybe that's faster and easier. Okay. Um, uh, you know, city funding this year, uh, Anika, do you have a number for our city funds this year? Yes, that's, so the number that I quoted previously, 1.6 billion. 1.6 um, billion that, that is in the commitment City plan. capital. Right, Correct. and then FY22? Sorry, one second. 1.6 billion in FY 2021 and the FY 2022 number is, sorry, I don't wanna misspeak here. Second, sorry, I'm sorry. And the FY 2022 number is 402.8 million. And that is city capital. On the expense uh -huh. side- So with FY 21, how much have you spent of the 1.6 billion. So we have only committed 5% of that amount. Got it. And by the end of this year, how much will you have committed? Is that gonna I think stay at five? 
I think the commitment rate will stay at five. So in that 1.6 billion that I mentioned, there's mm -hmm. 750 yep. million dollars that was for the HUD SDNY agreement, and we were not allowed to spend those funds without an approved city capital action plan. That plan was recently approved, and so now we can begin to spend on those funds. So of the 1.6 billion in FY 2021, there's 750 million that could not be spent prior to the action plan. So and our the commitment rate is five percent. billion left. What what was your spend rate for that? I think we'll 80 have to get million dollars. Go ahead. Sorry? Great. 80 million dollars. 80 million of roughly 900 million. That's correct. Got it. And then are you planning and I don't know when you would reflect this. I just don't really know the NYCHA budget so well. So when are you planning on reflecting that? When would you move the I guess 750 over to 22? So the funds would roll into the next fiscal year if we don't spend them. Um, and so we anticipate that the majority of those funds will roll into the next city fiscal year, 2022, um, at which point we'll begin to spend in accordance with the capital action plan. Well, you also have the 900, which is now 800 million. So you'll have 800 and then plus the 750, 2, 5, 12, 19, so 1.9 billion. What's your expectation for spend of next year's capital plan now that all the pauses have been lifted? So I think we can get back to you on a firm answer. Um, capital projects, as you know, are on longer time horizons and the city doesn't allow us to outlay in accordance with how we actually think we're gonna spend. So every year, whatever you don't spend just rolls with you to the very next Sarah year. Rust, is that something you've, it sounds like there are some hiccups with the city. I'm not gonna spend the time now delving into it, but have you been able to figure those out? Um, I mean, these sound like management hurdles that you could, this is why you're here, you know? <laughs> so um, uh, in 20, uh, we are working on it. And here, I'll just say this, uh, the easiest money that we get to spend is federal money. The benchmarks are clear. The requirements for the spend are clear. The definitions are clear. When we combine with other sources, there are particular things. And some of this has to do with just how the money is provided. The state has its requirements, the city has it. So Are what I would what what I, about the city requirements, like yeah, what can we do to help you learn the city requirements well, and get over them? Well, one of the things I'd like to do is come back to you with uh, the exact numbers and the burn rate that we talked about, because um, and then we can show you some of the things that we do encounter. And I think that's a longer conversation I can give you today. I'm happy to meet about it. And I, no, I, I would like to as well. Yeah, there's yeah. times. No, no, it's no, been, it's, it's I mean, fine. you've been here for a really long time now. And I just am surprised to hear that you still that there would still be hurdles. I mean, my expectation with NYCHA always is a big eye roll, right? This hurdle, that hurdle, that hurdle. But given your role, you know, to help us get over all those hurdles. I'm just wondering when you expect to be able to get a commitment, a spend rate that's higher than 5% for city money. Do you think next year you'll be able to get spend the whole 1.9 billion? I, 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 I can't answer that we would do that. Do you need more staff? Do you need better systems? Do you need clarity from OMB? Uh, I think we're spending as money as fast as we can. I think we're spending it. No, no, no. You're, you're spending 5%. So spending as fast as you can gets us. But council, mem but council members, some of the design time on this alone is 12 months. I, so you're, I can't, you're, you're, I'm not, I'm not in your job. I don't know what the right answer is. I just spoke to the SCA about a project in our district where design time is uh, two weeks to a month. Then they're going to put it out to bid. That'll take six weeks by law and then they can start construction so design takes 12 months well wow. it can take longer 
Do These you want very... to talk about, I mean, I guess in our meeting, I'd like you to come back with your analysis oh, yeah. sure. of why it takes 12 months and what you've been doing with the city's help or the federal help to expedite. I mean, before you came, was it 24 months and now it's down to 12? And let me tell you, I, I have all empathy for you. You know, when I started seven years ago, Mitch Silver said there were 70, seven zero steps in order to get a project from money in the budget to, to ribbon cutting, seven zero, 70 steps, years. And upon his departure, I think he saved, you know, two months. Um, so I get it. These, this is thorny, but he had a dedicated team who specialized in cutting through red tape and bureaucracy to fix this. Do you have one of those teams? Yes. How big is it? And uh, it includes finance, so capital. But, but if we want to do something that's really uh, revolutionary, then we should let the city funds be spent in accordance with the federal rules. Okay, city... you're, you're above my pay grade. No, no I no, mean, no, I don't no, know no. details. And, you know, you talk I'm just saying that it, I'm just saying that each time we get a source of funding, there's a different set of rules. That's I, a you know, welcome to government. <laughs> no, you know, I, I that. Understand. you know yeah, that already. I, I deal with nonprofits all the time who get a different amount of money to pay their social workers that they have. No, to deal I, with. I understand that. But territory. if you're if you're asking a question, what can we do to expedite capital? So I asked, what have you done? Since you and that we can expedite, and that I can give you when we have our chance to talk. I can give you the specific things that we're looking at, the specific things that we tried. You've got to remember too that the bulk of the capital projects that we're dealing with now were moratoriumed. I mean, they were not able to spend. That only explain. I mean, the whole city so, had that again. I, SGA, again, but this but morning, that but. Weeks. But okay, I'm going to move on. Thank you very much. By the way, Vito, thank you so much for your help the other day. Um, you know how much the tenant leaders love you. I got to see that. I didn't realize how much they appreciate you. Um, but, you know, the fact that you're there for them like that, I, I've never seen that doesn't happen on my NYCHA walkthroughs. And so I, I know I'm a broken record, but Thank goodness you agreed to stay at NYCHA and uh, thank you, thank you on behalf of the tenants in my district for all this amazing work. You're, you're really a breath. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say a breath of fresh air, but you've been there, so I can't say it's fresh air, but you're extraordinary. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, chairs. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Chair Russ, thank you very much for coming in. We have no further questions. Uh, Chair Amber Samuel, did you want to ask any further questions? I actually have several more questions. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm so sorry. Okay. Council member, I that's good. I didn't see Keep, any Keep. council members raise their hands. I apologize to you. <laughs> I was I, I, I didn't want to go through all my questions. And I see that some of the other council members logged off who had their hands raised. Um, so just jumping right into it. The administration and, and I this construction clearly. Ah, uh, that's all right. We've <laughs> we've been there. Over it. Yeah, yeah. The the Blasio administration announced several recent initiatives that attempt to close the digital divide and connect more NYCHA residents to broadband internet access. The pandemic underscored the fact that broadband internet access is not a luxury but essential. And as we are moving towards this budget negotiations, I have to ask about fiscal 2021 20, budget adoption. As part of last year's budget adoption, there was a reallocation or they redirected $537 million from the NYPD capital budget to NYCHA to expand broadband and to community centers. Fiscal 2021 adopted budget redirected 87 million in those capital funds to do it to extend new internet service to 200,000 NYCHA residents that was supposed to extend to service in 84 NYCHA developments. And so since that was a commitment from last year's adopted budget, I would like to know 
what is happening or you know can you provide us with an update of that funding for 84 NYCHA developments that were supposed to receive internet access? So we have um, uh, kind of two rounds of uh, broadband. And the first is um, uh, last year we had an RFP that was released uh, um, uh, uh, last summer and there was no funding attached to that one, but we are working with six vendors who came through that pipeline to get licensing agreements in place. We have five of the six have a licensing agreement and these five are now actually working towards deploying the technology at the developments. And um, um, we have uh, both public area Wi-Fi and in-unit Wi-Fi at uh, 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 select developments. We, uh, I can share those names with you, but one would impact 6,400 residents on the public area Wi-Fi and the other is 24,000 residents on the in-unit Wi-Fi. So from, uh, from last year, that has started. This year, we had the city's uh, broadband RFP, which had the funding attached to it that you described. And um, that just came out in April. And under that plan, there's a, uh, once the uh, proposals are received, uh, there'll be a screening on the city side. And then um, there'll be vendors uh, 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 coming to over to the NYCHA side. And we would begin to identify which uh, projects, properties, and activities. There's three areas of activity in the city RFP and um, uh, some of that is infrastructure and then uh, once they pass those projects along to us we'll enter into the license agreement and start implementation What's so timeline on that well council member we expect to start getting uh, referrals through the RFP process um, you know maybe in the next couple of months after they're evaluated so over summer we would begin, I hope, to begin to get contractors in place. Okay. Um, that's okay. that's our that's our you know that's our best estimate. Uh, we got to get the licensing agreements, uh, scope of work, and that kind of thing, so we understand exactly what we're getting. But it will take us a little time to uh, both get through the selection process and get the uh, vendor in place. Okay, another piece of the five hundred and thirty-seven million that was removed from NYPD. Um, for NYCHA residents was 22 million in capital funds um, for the renovation of Monroe houses, Seachset Bay houses, Wagner, and um, a community center at Ocean Bay. And this is for NYCHA community centers. So can you speak to uh, what's happening in the update related to that funding that was removed from NYPD budget to NYCHA for these community centers? Um. Uh, do either Vita or Nika have an update that we can share? I think that, are they in design? I think they're in design, but I just want to confirm. Uh, I'm waiting for... There we go. Thank okay. you. Um, the projects are in the planning phase and we can provide an update as they move along to let you know the timeline for completion. What does that mean, the planning phase? Like, so, so they're, when did you so start? They're, I'm sorry? When did you start planning and what does planning- This fiscal year. So for NYCHA's fiscal year, so in January you started planning or? We started in the city fiscal year 2021, planning the projects. Okay, all right, moving on. Uh, the, can you speak briefly on a revenue coming in for Build to Preserve? Under the Build to Preserve, NYCHA 2.0, the city will replace the existing um, half market, half rate, half market rate, half affordable 50-50 program at NYCHA sites um, to 70-30. Um, what is the status of the Build to Preserve initiative at your largest site, Chelsea Houses? And what is the estimated time frame for, for the release of the RFP? And will NYCHA adopt the working group model to the other potential sites under this initiative for Wyckoff Gardens, Homes, and LaGuardia House? 
So we um, issued uh, uh, a substantially revised RFP based on the working group. Um, the uh, RFP took the working group recommendations and for the first time actually includes um, uh, a resident evaluation component for selection. So we're very, uh, very encouraged uh, that we're able to offer this uh, as a result of, of the process that went on there. Um, the, um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that RFP is, is uh, I think, still open. So I don't have, uh, um, haven't gotten proposals yet uh, to give a sense of what uh, will happen there at Chelsea, but it does include, uh, obviously, the kinds of uh, uh, potential infill uh, uh, that, that we talked about with the working group. They, um, of course, opted to do uh, infill on selected locations. Um, they opted not to do any kind of uh, demolition to any public housing. So we're going to be interested to see what the development community says about that. The parts of the working group, I think, that are significant um, are making sure that the resident rights are protected. Uh, we delved into that quite a bit, uh, right down to the house rules, in fact. So we took a lot of material out of that and are bringing that into the RAD pack that we're doing um, uh, uh, going forward. So um, I just think that um, some of that has been tremendously helpful in terms of resident engagement, making sure that the rights are buttoned up and so forth. I wouldn't represent that we can use the entire working group process exactly as we did in the, in the Chelsea model, but we're going to take a lot of that forward to do resident engagement with PACT and RAD. Um, I would have to uh, uh, I don't have a number on the largest uh, uh, bill to preserve, uh, so I'm not sure I can I can give you that today. But I, I could give you those numbers for uh, anything that we have done, and any of the air rights that we might have sold. To my knowledge, we really haven't um, uh, been in a situation where we've had a substantial uh, impact uh, yet uh, uh, on on those elements. So. Uh, but I can share it with you. I could get it from real estate and provide it to you. Okay, so my next question was related to the transfer to preserve. So you haven't received any- um... We have, on transfer to preserve, we have. We've done two or three, but I don't want to misspeak on the total revenue raised, but I could provide that for you. Okay. So you, yeah. Most of those were development rights or small parcel transfers, um, uh, but, but we do have some income from that. Um. But, so you so you do have some income for that. Um, can you share that with us now? Like I I, I uh, if some if if one of the staff can give me a number, I'd be glad to. But I don't I don't want to recall. Uh, I know there's two or three transactions, and I don't have the total at my fingertips. Okay, so which developments? Let's just start there. Um, I would I would need to check on which developments. Okay. Um, is Ingersoll one of them? Um, uh, yes. Ben Ingersoll. Yeah, Ingersoll is one. And uh, what what we've completed two air right transfers. Ingersoll in Brooklyn and Hobbs Court in Manhattan. They've generated about twenty seven million. Thank you, staff. Twenty seven million each, or twenty seven. Total. Million? Total. Okay. 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 Uh, so. Moving on to pest and waste management. In January 2021, the NYCHA Monitor approved a corrective action plan outlining requirements and milestones that NYCHA must meet related to West, um, waste management and pest control. Under the plan, NYCHA will better coordinate and handle pest and waste incidents by targeting the root causes of infestations and waste incidents. Has NYCHA been responding to work order requests related to pests during the pandemic? And has there been major changes in response times? And how many work orders are currently open for pest remediation across the NYCHA portfolio? And what is the time it takes to remediate these conditions? Um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, if, if Vito could uh, give us an update on what we're doing with the pest and waste. And if you can also just um, speak to the cost associated, um, the capital cost and operating cost associated. Okay, okay. 
Sure, and I will ask Anika to assist me with the, the dollars. Uh, with respect to um, during the pandemic, we were still responding to severe uh, cases of infestation um, and conditions such as rats. Um, we did suspend temporarily some of the, the minor um, um, responses to, uh, to rodents and, and pests. Uh, we have since rescinded the work order guidance and it's back to business as usual as of May 1st. Um, we um, have received a number of funding streams uh, to deal with pest and waste management. Um, and so if I could just talk briefly ab about um, you know, the, the $47 million um, that we um, have spent um, in, in dealing with infrastructure issues, um, such as replacement of interior exterior compactors, bulk crushers, rat slabs, um, that, that project is about 75% complete. Um, we, in fact, just met this week with the monitor and his team. Uh, they, they're making a number of, of suggestions um, you, with their outside um, experts uh, as to how we can improve. Right? We're going to continue to work on that, such as door sweeps. Um, we've installed um, 8,000 door sweeps um, as a preventative measure. Uh, they've pointed out some of the deficiencies, um, and, and so we're correcting. Um, uh, we, even with respect to integrated pest management, uh, we need to improve. Um, all of that, that work is underway. Um, it's a major undertaking, uh, but we're working closely again with the monitor, with the outside experts that the monitor has on their staff, and we're going to continue to make improvements. You mentioned $47 million. You said that's the cost or... That's no, that's the, how much. So we had spent forty-seven million, uh, or actually, I should say, seventy-five percent of that has already been spent. I, I believe, and and Nika, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that was the money provided um, by the mayor's office uh, through the neighborhood rat reduction program. So you received so forty-seven million was the allocated um, the allocation. That's to one of the allocations that we received, and you, and you spent seventy-five percent of the forty-seven. 75% of the work has been completed. Anika, is that correct? On the dollars? You're correct on I the total made. dollars. You're correct on the total dollars of the 47 million. We'd have to get back to you on exactly how much has been spent as of today. Okay. Now, in addition to that, we've also gone out and purchased um, items such as uh, two electric rear loader garbage trucks, uh, which we paid for out of our budget. Um, and, and through some of uh, uh, allocations that we received from elected officials, we also purchased uh, six small electric vehicles to help move some of the uh, waste um, around some of our uh, smaller developments. Okay, um, and as of the 2021 adopted budget, what is the contract value for third party vendors to do this particular work? Uh, we're gonna have okay. to do you have yes, that, do you have that I do. Okay. Oh. So the right. third party um, vendors to complete all the work with regard to the pillars um, is $138 million. Um, that's $52 million in the specific departmental budgets, in addition to $86 million that really just covers heating and elevator repairs. So that's for all, uh, so you're talking about the agreement now, all of the total funds. All of the pillar areas, oh. the third party vendors for all of the pillar areas. Okay, I was just talking about the pest and waste management. Well, I think we'd have to break that down for you, but we could. We do, yes, we would. Um, yeah. I have the total for pests and waste. Um, there's 36 million in operating dollars and there's 16 million in capital dollars for a total of $52 million for 2021, NYCHA fiscal 2021. So calendar year, the way that our budget is adopted, but we could get you the specific amount that's just for contracts for pests and waste. Okay, and I'm gonna have the same question related to lead-based paint. Okay. As well, so um, I'll need to know that. Um, how many, so in January, 2021, the NYCHA monitor approved the initial um, action plan for improving benchmarks for lead compliance and abatement. Um, NYCHA has completed more than 60,000 XRF inspections and has attempted to inspect an additional 10,000 apartments um, presumed to have lead paint hazards. How many NYCHA units to date have tested positive for lead? 
um, how many visual assessments have been conducted, and again, how much funding is allocated to address the lead paint hazards in the NYCHA's five-year operating and capital plans. And I had the same question about the vendors. Sure. Uh, uh, Vito, can you start? Sure, I can start on, on the XRF initiative. Uh, so the total universe was approximately 134,000 apartments that we expected uh, to have to test. Uh, to date, we have attempted um, a little over 104,000. Right. We have uh, completed or accessed 91,887. Now, when you look at the results um, that have come back, uh, to date, we have received 66,000 results, uh, actually 66,600. Uh, what we are seeing as of today is encouraging. We're seeing 32% of those are testing positive and 68% are testing negative. Right. And that's the encouragement that, that we're seeing 68% of the units that have tested negative. Obviously, with the positives, we're putting them into uh, different buckets um, uh, because we, what we want to do is to abate the positives. Right? So we're looking to see where we can do abatement work um, it, when there's only one or two components that test positive uh, for uh, apartments where you might have multiple components that test positive. We have to look at, at a better approach. Uh, abatement might not be um, feasible in the short term. That might require additional work. Um, as for the visuals, um, we completed um, our our visuals um, in 2020. Right? Uh, we uh, there were 38,000 attempts, um, and we actually completed 33,000. Uh, we did have some access issues, uh, but we had about an 86% completion rate. Okay, thank you. And it's just always helpful to know, um, you, to, to have an idea as to what's happening with the third party contracts. Sure. Uh, yeah. To, yeah, to we, we can get you that council member. We just didn't, we had totals, but didn't break it by contract versus labor. So. Okay. Um, and my last question. Um, so, you know, we're always talking about rent revenue, what's coming in, and we know that there's been a struggle um, with the pandemic and families being able to pay their rent. Um, what is NYCHA plan for ten tenant assistance for when the statewide eviction moratorium is lifted in August? So I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll just start with a, a little bit. So we have been, as I said in the testimony, reducing rents uh, at a pretty significant rate. Um, the last time I checked with staff, they told me that we were processing interims starting last March through this year at about double the rate we we normally do. So we have been reducing uh, uh, the uh, the rent charged, and that has helped um, a significant number of households. Uh, in addition to those, we're also processing annual recertifications that would be uh, have the potential to reduce rent as well. So having said that, we do have arrears, however, and. Um, are thinking, um, Anika, do you have uh, the numbers on the rent just to give a sense of what we're looking at? Absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned um, in the testimony, our rent loss from the beginning of the crisis through April is around $70 million. Um, of course, much of that was born in the last fiscal year, um, 66 million in the prior fiscal year and 4 million um, in this current year. We are seeing some signs that it's rebounding, but it continues to be a challenge for us. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Chair Drum. That is the end of my question. Thank you, uh, thank Chair Amphrey Samuel. I uh, just want to apologize again to you. I, I misread my text message and uh, I thought it said that we were ending. But anyway, I do see one last council member, uh, Carlos Menchaca, who's here. So, uh, council member Menchaca. Time starts now. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Chair Drum and Emperor Samuel. I'm just trying to get my notes here. Um, I. If this was already asked, please let, just let me know. But sure. uh, NYCHA still receives significant funding from Section 9 federal subsidy. Yes. Um, what is the authority doing to maximize the Section 9 federal subsidy? So um, 
Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question, council member, because the section nine subsidy comes to all housing authorities under a formula. Congress, uh, there've been two formulas, one that goes all the way back to 1976, which Congress replaced with an updated formula in the early uh, 2000s. So that formula has a couple of key indicators. For example, Anika gave the number on our, our, our rental decline. Well, HUD can adjust sort of what they think the rent collections are going to be based on extraordinary circumstances. So that's one factor. So most of it, I would say, though, we have a formula amount and um, that's what we get. Um, we can um, uh, we can do some things inside that amount to bring more resources to us. For example, an energy performance contract where uh, we cut down on our utility expenses, HUD will let us share some of that savings, I think up to 75%, but the other 25 goes back to the feds, but we, we can keep that. So there are some initiatives inside this budget, and I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds, but it is weedy. Uh, there are some things inside there that we can do. Um, uh, we can also occasionally get in appropriations bills, additional money that comes to us through section nine, uh, sometimes on an emergency basis, Sometimes it's part of the capital program. I think we got uh, a lead grant uh, recently that would give us a little extra money towards lead abatement. So um, uh, it, is, it is possible to work with it, but I would not re never represent to you that we have a lot of room in that formula. Um, okay. You know, um, that, that's kind of, uh, we can kind of work around the margins, but the, mm -hmm. the base amount calculations do kind of run through the, the, the numbers. Okay, there might I might want to just follow up with you and or your staff after that. Uh, yeah, we'd be glad to. Okay, then um, th there is an alarmingly high rate of public housing tenants without an up to date lease uh, in Red Hook West, for example. Uh, in November of 2020, 24 percent of the household had a pass through lease recertification. Is NYCHA losing out on that Section 9 federal subsidy when tenants are without a lease? Uh, and what steps are what, what steps are you taking at NYCHA to take uh, this, well, just to bring improvements to the compliance and support to tenants so that they can recertify? So uh, we are revamping the entire recertification process. Um, we just uh, have been testing it. We tested it at a couple sites. We're trying to make it as um, simple as possible to your point um, uh, about how the process works. We're, we're not actually losing subsidy at this point. Uh, HUD does give you some time to recover from a lapsed research. We don't get a penalty right away. Not 100%. Uh, um, um, I, you know, I'd have to go back and look. I don't think, okay. um, uh, I don't think it's, um, uh, we are, that is an index that HUD looks at, but mm -hmm. I don't think we've been uh, penalized in the way we're talking about here to a significant degree. So we have a chance to rebound. And um, we're hopeful that this summer, we're going to have a completely redone uh, business model for the research, much simpler, much more straightforward. And we think that's going to really contribute to us um, getting um, more of them done timely. And to, one of the things that happened, HUD did waive a number of requirements because of COVID. And we think mm -hmm. we have a good chance of getting them to make it permanent. So for example, if you said, well, I have a change of something, you know, and we said, well, you're going to need a birth certificate. We could, you could photograph and set like, you know, like we do yeah. in other right. ways. So um, uh, we've got, um, we've got some options to make this easier to do so we don't uh, get so far behind uh, at some of the locations. Yeah. Uh, is there time for one more question, chairs? Or I can I can stop. Very quick. Okay, very quick. Um, the state is pushing a NYCHA Utility Accountability Act, Generis, and I don't know if you're tracking that in the state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are proposing a resolution to support that, uh, which would essentially allow for us to rethink how repair tickets connect to um, 
uh, rebate. And so can you, can you just, I have a lot of questions on this, but this is the quick version. Um, how are you thinking about that? Uh, are you preparing for that to, to kind of move through? How will that impact NYCHA? Uh, we, um, we met with a sponsor yesterday, but I, I okay. have not, yeah. So we are talking. And okay. I don't have a debrief from staff yet, but we could give that, give you a sense of that. But that we are great. meeting and we are following it. Um, we are starting to estimate the cost impacts of something like that and are beginning to share that information. But uh, I could have Brian Hone and circle back and uh, we, we could give you an update uh, uh, as a follow-up to this question. Thank you. So so, Greg, oh. just to follow up on your point about the cost impact, mm. so far as it's written, we think the bill could cost NYCHA upwards of $22 million per year um, in terms of the, you know, the tenants of the bill. And so that's something that, as um, the chair mentioned, we've met with the sponsor about. Um, and that has a significant impact for us. So, you know, I know $22 million doesn't seem like a very large number when we're talking about a budget of $4 billion. But you know that when you look at it, that could be um, something like a loss of 25% of our monthly public housing rental revenue. So you know so when you take that number, I'm sorry. Uh, just to, to clarify, that 22 million would essentially go back go back to tenants who have been in apartments with no utility, uh, a, a down but, utility. like a gas outage. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. It covers gas, water. electricity, um, and heat, hot water. You're correct. People who are having to buy, uh, maybe the electricity's down, their food rots, and they're, you know, so, so it's, it's back into yes. the hands of tenants. Okay. Happy to talk more about this later. Thank no, you. No, we, we, we could, because um, yeah. the, the one thing about rental, the rental income is um, important because we spend it in that, literally in that month. HUD is estimating its payments on it. They give us a payment each month and the combined amount, rental income plus subsidies, what we get to spend. So it has a very immediate impact, which is why uh, we're so sensitive to it, but we'll talk about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I think we're good. Am I right, Council? Uh, yes, that's correct, Chair. There's no more Council members that have raised their hands. For the okay. A whole bunch of uh, texts are coming in. <laughs> anyway, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, this will conclude today's hearing. Thank you to all the agencies for being here today. Before we close, I'd like to remind the Finance Committee members that we will be meeting remotely again tomorrow at 10 a.m. and we will hear from the Department of Finance, the Department of Information Technology, and telecommunications and the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Corrections. Very busy day tomorrow and Friday and Monday as well. As a reminder to the public, the committee will be holding a remote hearing for public testimony on the executive budget on Tuesday, May 25th at 10 a.m. If you would like to testify at that hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov slash testify and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may also submit written testimony through the registration website or by emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Russ, thank you again for being here. I, and well, I just wanted to, wait, real quick. Um, sure. Council member Barron actually has her hand raised. And so oh. I didn't want to close out because I looked over and I see her oh. hand is raised. Oh, I, I see so much. Much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I came in, I was out all day, but I did, uh, coming at the end of this hearing, and I just had to ask this question uh, of the chairman, and it's about RAD and PAC. We feel that our housing developments, one of which was just added to this package about six months ago without any prior notice, we feel that this is being forced on the residents that are there. They have indicated to us that people are coming in unannounced, that they don't know why people are coming. People are coming representing NYCHA, but in fact, are working on behalf of the, uh, working on behalf of l &M. And we want to represent our uh, residents. We did send you a letter and we expressed what they said to us in terms of their concerns about COVID and having perhaps unnecessary exposure. And you said you would suspend those kinds of interactions 
but our residents have told us that they have resumed. So we're very much concerned about that. And we're very much concerned about this apparent rush to push these folks who are still very much confused about what may and may not be a part of the RAD PAC program. So we're asking again that you let these uh, private persons know that they are not to come. We had a meeting earlier this week also because it's a continuing problem. We're asking that you again have them know that this is suspended and they're not to come uh, enforcing, enforcing themselves onto people during this time. And the other question that we have is, uh, do you understand that there's this great possibility that we can get a sizable contribution uh, allocation from the federal government, which could help alleviate this uh, economic crisis that we're in, and in fact, keep public housing public. Um, uh, I do understand that, we do. Uh, in fact, uh, even with RAD, uh, NYCHA is the owner. Uh, NYCHA is not out of the picture, even in the RAD deal. Well, does that um, mean you're going to remove the lead in the paint since you're still the owner? Because you went to court to avoid that. No, so, no, actually, council member, we did not uh, go to court to avoid it. Um, but we will, yes, we will. We are fully bound to comply with the requirements of the HUD agreement and with the bias consent decree under these properties. No one is trying to use RAD as a way to sort of get out of uh, 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 school or something like that. Um, and um, uh, I would say that we're, this is the first time uh, there's actually been discussions in Congress about any kind of money that reflects the actual capital need for the public housing program. So I, th I think um, thinking about it sort of uh, together, if I could, that's a great thing. But we don't have a number yet. We don't know the formula. We don't know which of the competing bills will prevail. We're hopeful that we will get something out of this administration because the stars seem to be lining up in a good way. But I, I would represent that we feel we want to continue to act to raise this capital in case what we get from Washington doesn't meet our expectations or we need to supplement it. So um, I don't want to be, I'm not, um, I'm not trying to downplay it, but I'm just trying to maybe be realistic. We, we have potential, but we're not sure when that potential is going to be realized. And um, we'd like to be in a position where we're starting to plan for it. Uh, we're starting to think about, well, if we did get a slug of money, whether it's through the blueprint or from Washington, um, what are the, how would we queue up uh, substantial capital work? And then to your concerns about uh, the properties uh, that you mentioned, we did suspend those interactions. And uh, as the, the COVID restrictions are being uh, uh, changed, uh, we are uh, looking at uh, resuming, but I will ask staff what what's going on at that that property, and then we could circle back if we need to have, uh, follow up with you. I'd be glad to do that. You're on mute, council member. Good, thank you so much. And we do want to say that um, we do want to acknowledge that we are finally getting the community center renovated at Unity Plaza after about 10 years of waiting. So we are appreciative of that. And I'm looking forward to move forward with that expeditiously and get that resolved. Uh, Great. Thank you. thank you to the chairs. Thank you so much for allowing me to get my question in. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you, council member. Again, thank you uh, to Chair Russ for coming in. Thank you, uh, my co-chair, Chair Amper Samuel as well, and to all the members who have joined us. I've already read the uh, closing statement, and I'll say that this uh, hearing is adjourned at uh, 5.03 p.m. in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff.